Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to narcotics detail. For more than two months, doctor's offices have been burglarized, hospital pharmacies pillaged, drug stores robbed, medical supply firms ransacked, with one purpose in mind, the theft of narcotics. The criminals are expert, cunning, vicious. Your job, get them. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, transcribed in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, March 23rd. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of narcotics. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from the record bureau, and it was 10.35 p.m. when I got to room 24. A narcotics detail. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, we'll be right over. Thank you. Get anything, Joe? Nothing we don't know already. How about you? That was a county hospital on the phone. Doc Welch. Pretty fair lead. I told him we'd be right over. What's he got? One of our informants. Benny Trounsel. Ready? Let's go. What's with Benny? It's bad shape. Somebody worked him over. They found him in an alley off of South Main. Yeah? Doc says Trounsel talked before he passed out. Anything good? He claimed he knows who's running the new dope racket in town. Says they got him. No, let's take the stairs here. Why should they bother with small fry like Benny? That's what I'm wondering. Blackmail, maybe. Benny's still on the needle? Maybe that accounts for his story. Doc says his skull is fractured. Morphine doesn't do that to him. Yeah. Benny mentioned any names? I don't know. Doc didn't say. Here's the garage. Come on. When did they pick up Benny? About an hour ago. He had a pocket full of bindles on him. Heroin. Trounsel small fry. He never had that much dope on him in his life. That's what makes it interesting. Let's go. County Hospital? Yes, sir. The line is busy. Will you wait? Thank you. Can I help you, gentlemen? We'd like to see Dr. Welsh. She's expecting us. Your names, please? This is Sergeant Romero. My name's Friday, police officer. Oh, yes. Around the corner to your left, room 127. The doctor's waiting for you. Thank you. Come on, Ben. I hope Benny's still talking. We could sure use a lead. Yeah. Here it is. 127. Hiya, Ben. Joe? How are you, Doc? Anything new? Just left Trounsel upstairs. You think we can talk to him now? Won't do much good. He died about six minutes ago. For almost two years, Benny Trounsel, an addict himself, had been one of the most valuable informants Ben and I had in the narcotic gangs. More than once, he had helped us solve a case, but this time, if Benny Trounsel had any direct leads to the nerve center of the newest narcotic ring, he took them with him. Besides his dying accusation that the ring had gotten to him, he left behind only two small scraps of information. First, when he arrived at the county hospital, Dr. Welsh reported that Trounsel repeatedly muttered the name Patterson. Secondly, among the few personal effects found in his pockets was a good amount of heroin and a small piece of white paper with two words scrawled on it. Tucker Building. Benny Trounsel's body was taken to the county morgue, and the next morning it was posted. At the coroner's inquest, the cause of death was listed as a brain hemorrhage induced by severe blows by a blunt instrument on the sides and base of the skull inflicted by a person or persons unknown. Besides Ben and myself, the only identification witness at the inquest was a woman who managed a rooming house in Benedict Alley, 
where Charles used to stay periodically. After the inquest, we questioned her briefly in our office. Miss Strutz, you say you can't remember any friends Trounsel had while he stayed at your room and house? No, I can't. Besides, if I knew that man used dope, I never would have rented him a room. How long did he rent from you, Miss Strutz? Oh, about six months. I run a respectable house. I don't mind if my people drink a little now and then, but those dope users, no, sir. Did you know anything about Trounsel, Miss Strutz? Where he spent his time, where he had his meals? Well, I don't serve at my place. Too much trouble. Most of the people eat at the Ace Lunchroom. Down the corner. Where's that, Miss Strutz? Um, Grant and South Main, right on the corner. And you think Trounsel might have spent some time there? He might have, I don't know. Miss Strait, did Trounsel ever mention anyone by the name of Patterson? No. Patterson? No. And you can't recall any friends he might have had? He had any friends and never set foot in my house, that's all I know. All right, Miss Strait, thank you. Here's a card, ma'am. If you come across any information about Trounsel, we'd appreciate it if you'd call us. All right. That all? That's all, ma'am, thank you. Well... Bye. Goodbye, ma'am. Big help. Yeah, not even a good identification witness. You got those listings we made on the Tucker building? Yeah. Yeah, let's see. Here it is. Okay, let me have it, huh? Mm. Tucker building, 7310 South Wilshire. I wonder what Benny Charlesle could have been doing out there. Shouldn't be too hard to check. It's a small building. Yeah, six listings for the whole place. A couple of law officers, real estate guy, dentists, architect, and a doctor. One dentist, one doctor could be a lead. Maybe. Pretty thin. Friday, Romero. You got a minute? Yes, Skipper. Come on, Joe. Yeah. What do you got, Ed? Letters. Here's a sample. Now listen to this. Chief of Detectives, Ed Backstrand, City Hall, Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. In view of mounting wave of narcotic robberies, strongly recommend that your efforts to curb this lawlessness be redoubled. They all like that? All of them. They're mad. Can you blame them? Not a bit. Well, we haven't got much to go on, Chief. The gang's pretty smart. All right, then let's be smarter. There's no law against it. Doing our best, Giver. Then make it better. I'm sick of that bunch, and I'm tired of these letters. And look at that record. In two months, 15 drugstore robs, eight medical offices, two supply houses, two hospital pharmacies... Narcotics missing every time. Now, who's behind it? None of the old-timers. We've checked them out. Gone over every hype and mainliner we know of. All right, then get on the transients. New faces. Climb on every one of them that shoots the stuff. Until you get to that gang and break it. If you need help, holler. But get to that gang and break it. Do you understand? Okay, Skipper, we'll try. You dig up anything on that Trounsel case yet? Still checking out one lead. What? Slip of paper we found in Trounsel's pocket, Ed. Said Tucker building on it, that's all. Just going to check it out when you call. All right, hop on it. Fast. We got a lot of pressure on us. Keep in touch with the office. It was almost noon when Ben and I got out to the Tucker building. It was a two-story affair, comparatively small, very modern. We checked with the dentist in the building first, but he'd never heard of anyone by the name of Benny Trousel. His records and appointment books proved it out. Well, that's one down, Joe. Yeah. Let's try that doctor's office now. What's his name? Let me see. Uh, oh, Springer. Dr. Fred Springer. He's on the second floor. Okay. There's a stairway down there. Come on. Pretty close to lunchtime. Might not be in. Maybe. Somebody should be there. We haven't got much time to play with. Yeah. Chief sure was up in there this morning. Here's the office. Fred Springer, M.D. We'd like to see Dr. Springer, please. Do you have an appointment? No, we don't. Well, the doctor's not in at present. Would you like to make an appointment for later in the day? No, ma'am. We're police officers. This is Sergeant Friday. I'm Sergeant Romero. How do you do? I'm uh, Miss Turner. I'm the doctor's nurse. Then you must take care of the appointment and record books for the doctor. Yes, I do. Well, maybe you can give us the information we're looking for, Miss Turner. Did the doctor ever have a patient by the name of Trounsel? Benny Trounsel? Trounsel? Mm-hmm. No, I, I don't think so. Just a moment, I'll check. Thank you. No. T-R-O-U-N-S-E-L, is that the way you spell it? Yes, ma'am. No. The name's not listed here. Uh, let me check the account book. No. Wait. It's funny. What's that, Miss Turner? Uh, here in the back of the book in the doctor's handwriting. Look. Hmm. Trounsel. The Black Parrot. Certainly funny. I can't remember seeing that notation before. It must be fairly recent. Miss Turner, what kind of a clientele would you say Dr. Springer has? 
Oh, it's quite exclusive. Beverly Hills, Bel Air. That's where most of the bills are mailed. Can you recall seeing Trounsel in the office here, Miss Turner? Small man, thin, walked with a kind of a limp, not very well dressed? No, I don't think so. It doesn't sound like any of our patients. Would you show us the doctor's prescription list for the last two months? We'd like to check them. Well, I'm afraid I can't. Dr. Springer keeps him in the safe. He's the only one who has the combination. How long you been with Dr. Springer? About ten months. Ever since he started his practice out here. Where was he before that? Philadelphia. I don't understand all these questions. Is anything the matter? Just a routine check, Miss Turner. When do you expect the doctor back? About four this afternoon. He's out making home calls. All right. Here's our card. Would you ask him to call us as soon as he comes in? I'll do that. Thank you, Miss Turner. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Oh, say, Miss Turner, one more question. Yes? Does Dr. Springer have a patient by the name of Patterson? Oh, yes. One of the doctor's first patients, John Patterson. He lives out on East Beverly Drive. When we left Dr. Springer's office, we called R&I. There was no make on John Patterson. Ben and I drove over to see him just on a hunch. It didn't pay off right then, but it showed a little promise. When the maid came to the door of the Swank apartment, she told us Patterson was out for the day. We asked her about Patterson's occupation. She didn't know. We asked her about his friends, his business acquaintances. She could remember only two people visiting the apartment. One of them was Dr. Springer, apparently a constant visitor. The other, a tall, dark man who spoke bad English. We asked the maid how long she had worked for Patterson. She said ever since he moved to Los Angeles, about six months before. A few things started to fall into place, but it was strictly a guesswork operation. Ben and I got in the car and headed for the south end of the city to check out some of the places Benny Trounsel was supposed to have frequented. We met a stone wall, from the Ace lunchroom near Benny's former rooming house to the Black Parrot. No one was willing to talk. Threats didn't work and neither did promises. Ben and I gave up for the moment and headed back to the office. Pacific Ambulance 1, call to Alhambra is now code 3. Seems like Skid Row doesn't want any part of this one. Yeah, there's a bad feeling. Something's got him scared. Sure would like to know what it is. Or who it is. Yeah, I'd like Control to know the answer one, to that, Control 1, Unit 80K. Control 1, Unit 80K. Bust, Joe. Get it, will you? I got it. 80K to Control 1. 80K to Control 1. Go ahead. 80K. Call Station 2511. Code 3. 80K to Control 1. Roger. KMA 367. I wonder what that's all about. Well, let's find out. There's a drugstore. They ought to have a phone. Pull over, huh? Got a nickel? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks. I'll be back in a minute. Hannon. This is Friday, Mike. The chief there? Oh, yeah. Just a minute. Back strand talking. This is Friday, Ed. What do you got? You tied up? Nothing big. Then check in as soon as you can. Got something good. What? You remember the stick-up at St. Agnes Hospital about a month ago? Pharmacy there? What about it? Two patrolmen picked up a user down near Union Station about an hour and a half ago. Yeah? Guy was way back in his heels. He had two vials of morphine on him. Files had serial numbers. Good. Did they match out? Perfectly. Thanks, Ed. We'll be right in. When Ben and I got back to the office at 3.52 p.m., we picked up Chief Ed Backstrand and went directly to the crime lab where Lieutenant Lee Jones analyzed the contents of the two vials taken from the suspect. Jones told us it was high-grade morphine. We went back to the office and double-checked the serial numbers on the vials with a crime report on the St. Agnes Hospital robbery. They matched. And there's a good break. These vials were in the loot when the gang knocked over the hospital 28 days ago. I stay on the trail and we'll crack that gang wide open. This the arrest report on the guy, Ed? Yeah. Picked him up in a bar off South Main. Who is the guy? A transient? Yeah, here it is, Ben. James Steiner, Phoenix, Arizona, age 37, transient laborer. Anybody talk this guy yet, Ed? Not yet. He shouldn't be too hard. You better get on it. Right, Skipper. Come on, Joe. Check you later, Ed. What time you got, Ben? Let me see here. Uh... 25 past four. A phone call for you, Ben. Yeah, who was it? Your wife. Wants you to pick up some aspirin and a bottle of nose drops for your kid on your way home. Oh, yeah, almost forgot. Is that the only call we had, Mike? That's right. Thanks. Well, you got that Dr. Springer's number, Ben? Yeah. Uh...
Uh, here it is. Uh, Crestview 55284. Five, Thanks. Nurse said he'd call us around four, didn't he? Yeah. Dr. Springer's office. This is Sergeant Friday down at the police department. Dr. Springer there? Well, no, he isn't, Sergeant. He called in about 20 minutes ago when I gave him your message. He said he'd call you. All right, Miss Turner. When he comes in, tell him to call us. Impress on him it's urgent. All right, Sergeant. I'll do that. Goodbye. Goodbye. No luck. I don't know. Just a hunch. He may be ducking us. Who are you calling now? State Medical Board. Maybe they can check us out on Dr. Springer. I put the call through to the State Medical Board and asked for a check on Dr. Fred Springer. They said they'd call back within the hour. In the meantime, we had James Steiner brought to one of the interrogation rooms for questioning. It was all talk. It's like I told the sergeant when they booked me. I don't know anything about this hospital job. Sit down, Steiner. Uh, Oh, all right, thanks. How long you been in the city, Steiner? L.A.? Oh, about a month. I came from Phoenix, looking for work. Things are pretty slow in Phoenix. Where'd you get the morphine? Huh? I said, where'd you get the morphine? The stuff? Uh, I bought it. Just for a pop now and then, I just play around with it. Just for kicks. Who'd you buy the vials from? Who? I don't know, a guy in a bar gave me a price. Which bar was that? Which bar? Uh, Black Parrot. I, I'm not hooked. I, I just play around with it just for kicks. What did the guy look like, Stoner? What did he look like? I don't know. Tall, I guess. Would you remember him if you saw him again? Remember? Sure. I talked to him a couple of nights at the bar. Was he on the stuff? Was he a hype? A hype? Yeah. Maybe. Tall fella, dark. You shooting the stuff? Shooting the stuff? No. No, I, I'm no mainliner. I never took in the veins in my life. I, I told you I'd do it just for kicks. Just a pop now and then. Take off your shirt. Let's see your arms. Huh? My arms? Come on, take it off. Well, Who are you kidding, Stanley? Your arm looks like a pin cushion. I, I, I told you just once in a while, just for the kicks. I'm not hooked on it. They found two vials of stolen morphine on you, Steiner. You can go two ways, hard or easy. Hard or easy? I, I told you I ain't done nothing. I, I bought the stuff. I, I use a cap or a bindle once in a while for kicks, but I'm not hooked. I bought the stuff, I tell you. Who was he, Steiner? Who sold it to you? Who? I told you I met him in a bar, the Black Parrot. Who was he? He was tall. Dark, he gave me a good price. Come on, let's have it, Steiner. His name. I'm feeling sick. You got something for me? I'm sick. All right. Mike. Yeah, Joe. Get some milk. A couple of quarts right away. Okay, Joe. You ready to tell us, Steiner? Who was it? I'm sick. I'm sick. We're getting some milk for you now. Come on, you better talk. Max. That, that, that's all he said. Name was Max. He gave me a good price. I, I only take a pop now and then just for kicks. You think you could point him out for us? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I, I'm sick. I'm sick. Narcotics, Romero. Hello. This is Dr. Springer calling. You wanted to talk to me. Yes, we did, Doctor. And we've got a few questions we'd like to ask you. Oh, hold on just a minute, will you? It's Dr. Springer, Joe. All right, tell him we got to see him tonight. We'll call him back later. Dr. Springer? Yes? Sorry, Doctor. We'll have to see you later on tonight. You be at home? Well, I have an appointment this evening. Uh, would you mind telling me what this is all about? Sure, Doctor. It's about a man named Benny Trounsel. Oh. I see. And if you don't mind, we'd like to check over your prescription list with you. Yes. I'll cancel my appointment. You can contact me here at home. 1538 South Road. I'll be here all night. All right, Doctor. Thank you. We'll see you later, then. Uh, yes. Goodbye. Goodbye. What'd he say? All right? Yeah, it's all right. I'll buy that hunch of yours now, Joe. Hmm? Dr. Springer, he knows who killed Benny Tronzel. I bet he knows why. When Mike Hannon came back with the milk, we fed it to Steiner, and then we put him back in his cell. We put in another call to John Patterson out on East Beverly Drive, but there was no answer. We left word with Hannon where we were going, and then Ben and I headed out for Dr. Springer's home. It was 7.35 when we pulled up into the driveway at 1538 South Road, a low, rambling, ranch-type home. 
We got out of the car and made our way down the path to the front door. A gray Persian cat followed us. The door was half open. We knocked, but there was no answer. Through the window, we could see the living room was dimly lighted. We went in. We found Dr. Springer sitting in a large carved mahogany chair in the dining room. The room was hung with draperies. He was slumped forward, face down on the dining table. There was a bullet hole in his right temple. On the floor near his right hand was a 32 automatic pistol. In the center of the dining table was a piece of white paper. Looks like he beat us. Yeah. Any names on that confession? One. Says he killed Trump. No, wait a minute. It says, uh, John Patterson, he forced me to this. What? I don't know. What's it look like to you? Here's another one. Norberg. That's all it says. And then he signed his name, Dr. Fred Springer. Ben, come over here. Look at these. Mm, hypodermic needle. It works. Is this morphine? White powder. Could be. And he was on it himself. Looks like it. We'll find out when they post him. I'll get it. Yeah. Sergeant Friday there, please. This is Joe, Mike. What do you got? Can you talk all right there? Yeah, go ahead. Just got a kickback on your call to the state medical board on this Dr. Fred Springer. Mm -hmm. He's not a registered physician in the state of California. Besides that, his license was revoked in Pennsylvania two years ago. Illegal operations. That explains it. Notify homicide. Get the crime lab in the corner out here, will you? Looks like Springer shot himself. Okay, Joe, right away. We'll wait for him, but hurry him up, Mike. We got a couple more places to check out tonight. Okay, Joe, see you later. Right. What's next, Patterson Place? I don't know. Maybe we ought to try Steiner first. Sounds good to me. Feels like we're getting close. Yeah, Ben. Real close. 12 minutes later, Homicide and the crime lab men checked in at the Springer house and Ben and I checked out. We went back to the office and found Ed Backstrand waiting for us. We told him our story and he sent two men out to keep an eye on the Patterson Place. Two other men went to work to try and track down the other name in Springer's confession note. Norberg. Ben and I went up to the county jail and picked up Steiner. The three of us started out to look for the man who sold Steiner the two vials of morphine stolen from the hospital pharmacy a month before. The man's name was Max. He was tall and dark. That was all we knew. The rest of it was up to Steiner. Two other men from the detail, Davis and Emerson, came along with us to take care of Steiner if anything went wrong. Our first stop was the Black Parrot Tavern. Davis parked the car in an alley down the street. Steiner, Ben, and I got out and walked the rest of the way. You understand what you're supposed to do, Steiner? Me? Yeah. I go in first and sit at the bar. You two will follow me. I sit at the bar, and if I see Max, I give you the sign. That's that's okay, huh? That's right. And you don't try to break for it. Break for it? Me? I, I told you, I'm squaring with you guys. All right, Steiner. Go ahead. Let's hope it works, Joe. Yeah. There he goes inside. Come on. Now, look, try to grab one of the booths along the wall if you can, huh? Right. Here we are. The first booth, Ben, it's empty. Yeah. Oh, it's left to order at the bar. Waitress got a night off. Make it a couple of beers, will you? A couple of beers? Okay. Joe, hmm? so look at Steiner. Yeah, he's signaling. Must mean the guy putting on his coat over there. No, no, hold it, Ben. Wait till he gets past us. Get Steiner back to the car. I'll tail the guy. You come after me. I didn't know how right Steiner was or how much we could trust him. All I knew was that the man I was following was tall and he was in a hurry. I followed him three quarters of a block before he turned in at a motel. He went to a cottage at the rear of the lot, let himself in, and closed the door quickly behind him. A minute later, Ben and the others pulled up in the car. Got him staked for Joe. Steiner says that was Max. Let's make sure. Come on. Which one's the end? The one down at the end here. I'll be careful. You too. All right, here we are. Wait a minute right there. All right, look, there's no rear door. He's got to come out the front. Keep the door clear. You ready? All set. Cover me. Open up in there. Who is it? Police officers, open up. Just a minute. All right, Ben, give it back to him. No, no, don't shoot. We'll come out. 
All right, throw your guns out first, then come out with your hands behind your head and make it fast. Watch it, Ben. He's making a break. All right, mister. That's far enough. Get out of my way. Get out of Get my way. Get him, Ben. That's good, Ben. You all right? Yeah. He didn't mean it, Copper. He didn't mean it. He didn't know what he was doing. Well, that must be a good excuse, lady. A lot of people use it. Come on, Ben. Let's take him in. <laughs> It was ten minutes past midnight when we got back to headquarters. Both the man and the woman were booked for violation of the State Narcotics Act, a felony. He gave his name as Max Jansen. In his luggage, we found 13 vials of morphine, large quantities of heroin, and a small amount of panopin. He gave us the names and addresses of six active members of the narcotics gang. He identified Dr. Springer as second in command. Just a few more questions, Jansen. Yeah, all right. Why did Springer kill Trounsel? He had it coming. Trouncil knew the score and he was blackmailing them, bleeding them white. Why didn't the gang take care of him? Boss said no rough stuff. Things were going too good. He warned Springer, but he wouldn't listen. All right, Jensen, just one more question. Who's the boss? Do I get off flight? State's witness? It might help. We can't promise you anything. Who's the boss, Patterson? Yeah. 138 East Beverly Drive? That's right. What about Norberg? How does he figure? The same guy. Patterson and Norberg, both the same. And what's his real name? Norberg. Tony Norberg. What's his front? He's legit, or he used to be importing business. Where? Here. Got an office downtown. Do I get protection? Where's Norberg now? Home, out in Laurel Canyon. Do I get protection? I thought you said he lived out on East Beverly. His apartment, his home's out in the canyon. Where? What's the address? Do I get protection? You'll get protection. Winding Way. 860 Winding Way. All right, Friday. Romero. Take some men with you. All right, Davis, cover the back of the house. Levine, you cover the front. Come on, Ben. Yes? Mr. Norberg in. Who's calling? Police officers. Oh, come in, won't you? Thank you. Now get your hands up. Face the wall. You'll never make it, lady. The house is surrounded. Tony, get the stuff. It's our only chance. They'll cut you down, Norbert. All right, Jeannie, give him the gun. Don't be a fool. They're going to march out the door in front of us, right to the car. I'm not going, Jeannie. Try it if you want. I'm not going. All right, Tony, stay. Come on, coppers. You'll never make it, lady. I said move. Fast. All right, Ben, hit the dirt. She's going for the car. See if you can get those tires. Come on. Dan? Yeah. Norberg was smart. Must be the girlfriend. Guess so. Wonder why this dart. Why do they get on the stuff, Joe? For kicks, Ben. None of them ever get hooked. Just for kicks. The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Tony Norberg, alias John Patterson, was tried and convicted for possession of narcotics, robbery, and conspiracy, and was sentenced to the maximum term prescribed by law, each count to run consecutively. He died three years and 11 days after his arrival at the state penitentiary. You have just heard the ninth in a new series of authentic cases transcribed from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet is furnished by the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Chief Erskine Ert Fish of the North Sacramento Police Department, who on the night of August 11th, 1935, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. This is NBC. The National Broadcasting Company. In the name of the law, 
we bring you another of the thrilling stories in this exciting series, taken from actual police case. Our story begins at a modest home in a small Texas town. It is early morning. Oh, John, the clock. Get up, Sue. Past seven, almost. Sue. Oh, Sue. What in tarnation is the matter with you? You're dead or... Sue. Oh. The alarm went off. Come on, get up. Oh. It's so dark. Oh. oh. Yeah. Looks like rain. In April showers, I guess. Oh, it's terrible. Terrible. What's terrible? <laughs> Say, what are you moping about? Well, Sue, what's the matter? Don't you feel well? Tell me, what's the trouble? Oh, Jim, I had... I had such an awful dream. I hope. Awful dream? Oh, don't be silly. You had me pretty scared for a minute. A dream. Huh. This is so... so terrible. It seems so real. Well, what'd you dream about? Mother. I dreamed she was... Poison. Oh, stop <laughs> crying like a baby. Now stop it. Just because you had a crazy dream is no reason for you to be crying all over the place. Jim? What? I'd like to visit Mother today. What? Travel over a hundred miles just because you ate something that didn't agree with you and you had a bad dream? But it was so real, so vivid. I can see Mother now. You can ask her how she's feeling. Oh, Jim, don't be sarcastic. It, it's what you call a hunch, I tell you. I have to see Mother. Please. Let's go today. Well, that's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard. Please, Jim, let's go. No. Please, I, I've never asked that of you before. Sue? What is it, Jim? You're serious about that, aren't you? About wanting to visit your mother. I was never more serious in my life, Jim. Please, will you come? Yes. Oh, thanks. On one condition. What is it? That you forget about that dream and don't give it another thought. I'll try, Jim. Well, we leave right after breakfast. Foolish <laughs> girl. And that isn't all. You should have seen how she carried on all the way down here. Is that right, Sue? Oh, don't believe him, Mother. You know how Jim always exaggerates? Mm, from the look in your eyes, Sue, I think this is one time that Jim is telling the truth. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. How do you feel, Mother? Oh, uh, I guess I'm beginning to feel my age. When you're over 80, you can't stand the sun and the rain. Why, that... Do you mean to say you do work? Not much. Just putter around the garden a bit and look after the chickens. What's the matter with John? Why can't he help you? That's right. He's your son. Why don't he lend a hand? You don't excite yourself, Jim. John is helping all he can. And besides, I wouldn't be happy unless I had something to do. You know that. That may be so, Mother, but you're you're not a young woman anymore. And oh, why don't you say it, Sue? I am an old woman. I shouldn't work because I may die any minute. Oh, Mother, I didn't mean that. Well, let me tell you something, Sue. And you too, Jim. I'm not ready to die yet. But when I am... When I am... Mother! Mother, what's the matter? What? She's fainted. Oh, mother! Mother! Get a doctor, Jim. Get a doctor! Oh. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? You're, you're the sheriff, aren't you? That's right. Dunwoody is my name. Bill Dunwoody. Uh, have a chair. Yeah, thank you. Uh, your name is... Uh... Uh, sheriff, I'm here on a kind of a mysterious mission. Something that's really not my business. But I feel it. I must tell you about it. I see, mister. Oh, uh, I didn't get your name. Well, I'd rather not tell you my name, sir. 
Uh, you can just call me Jones. That's as good as any, I guess. What's on your mind? Well, I have an idea there's been some foul play. Murder, to be exact. Who? When did it happen? Uh -huh. I'll tell you everything I know, but it isn't very much. Go on, sir. I'm all ears. You heard that Mrs. Viola King died, didn't you? Yes, I did. I died yesterday. Well, she was an old lady. Old lady, I hear. Maybe that's why it doesn't seem uh, suspicious. And you want to tell me that she was murdered? Uh, yes. How? Poisoned, I guess, but I, I'm not sure. Hmm. How do you know this, Jones? Well, that's something I'd rather not discuss. I must be left out of this entirely. Are you related to Mrs. King? No, sir. Do you know who administered this uh, poison? No, sir, I don't. Do you know anything else that can help us? No. Nothing else, eh? Nothing. I've told you all I know. Do you live in town? Yes, and I'll keep in touch with you if you want me to. Yes, I certainly do, uh, Mr. Jones. Yeah, that's all then, I guess. Goodbye, Sheriff. I'm glad to have met you. Uh, good day, sir. Uh, Sam Smith in right away, will you? Send for me, Sheriff? Yeah, sit down, Smith. I want to talk to you. Uh, shoot. What is it? Uh, someone just told me that Mrs. King was murdered. Poisoned. What? That old lady? Well, what did anyone want to kill her for? Sit tight, Smith. In the first place, I'm not sure that it is murder. But if it is, we'll find out more than just why it was done. Uh, sure, all right, sir. Now, I want you to get busy. Get hold of the doctor that treated her when she died. Find out what he knows. And if he suspects murder, have an autopsy performed. Right. One other thing, Smith. Yeah. Not a word of this to anybody. If it is murder, we don't want, we don't know who's involved yet. I get you, Sheriff. No worry. Oh. You treated her when she died, didn't you, Doctor? Yes. Now tell me, did you think her death was natural? Uh, what do you mean? Well, was there anything suspicious about Mrs. King's death? Uh, offhand, I'd say there was. What do you think was the cause of death? I believe Mrs. King was poisoned. You do, huh? Yes. She showed all the symptoms of strychnine poisoning. Uh, you mind telling me what those symptoms are? Well, there were uh, convulsions and uh, shrinking of the iris of the eye. That indicated poison. Yes. But I performed a more uh, certain test on Mrs. King. I step behind the head of her bed and clap my hands, uh, like this. What happened then? It sent her into another convulsion. A little later, I repeated the test, and the same thing happened. Now, we get that result in two kinds of cases, strychnine poisoning and tetanus. So I examined Mrs. King for some wound uh, which might have uh, been caused by a rusty nail. And? And I found nothing, not a scratch. Uh, that eliminated tetanus. So you think she died in strychnine poisoning? That it, Doctor? I'm inclined toward the strickland theory, yes, but uh, suggest that a careful examination be made. We'll take care of that, Doctor. Uh, tell me, Doctor, if you suspected poison, why didn't you notify us? Uh, there, on my desk, uh, the letter I'm writing the sheriff. Oh. Uh, don't forget, Doctor, not a word to anyone, you understand? Perfectly. <laughs> What did you do after you left the doctor, Smith? Well, I arranged to have an autopsy performed immediately, and some specimens were rushed to the state laboratory. Did you tell them we were in a hurry? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I instructed him to tell us about the result here. What else? Checked on who was around Mrs. King the last few days. I found something very interesting, incidentally. What? Mrs. King's daughter and son-in-law visited her a little while before she died. Came up from San Angelo. That's so. Yeah, I thought you'd be interested in that, Sheriff. There's something for you, Sheriff, on the territory. Uh, come on, Smith, let's go. Maybe that isn't fast, huh? Report on examination. Mrs. Viola King. Stomach content submitted. Indicate presence of stricken in sufficient quantity to cause instant death. What do you think of that, Sheriff? Uh, come into my office, Smith. One thing is certain, Smith, we've got a murder on our hands. I'm sure certain of another thing, Sheriff. What? That we're going to solve this case. You can bet your bottom dollar on that. Now, listen to me. I want you to visit every drugstore in town. Find out if anyone bought strychnine during the last week. Yeah. That's all for you now. And while you're out, I have a few little ideas of my own. Now, get going, Smith. We can't lose any time. Right. And get back here as soon as you can. There's plenty to do yet. Right. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> Miss Hagen? Yes? My name's Dunwoody. I stepped in to tell you how sorry I was to hear about your, your loss. Thank you. This is my husband. Jim, this is Mr. Dunwoody. And your mother. What do you do? You're a friend of Mrs. King? Well, uh, yes, I knew her. Grand old lady, all right. Yeah, she certainly was. Well, John, this is Mr. Dunwoody. This is my brother-in-law, Mr. King. How do you? Dunwoody was one of your mother's friends, John. He just stepped in to... Uh, don't make me laugh. One of my mother's friends. What do you mean? Wasn't he? I knew your mother, Mr. King. I met her a few times. That's not so. You didn't come here to tell us how sorry you are or to pay your respects. John, please don't talk that way to a friend. Don't tell me what to do. This guy's the sheriff, see? He's here snooping, that's what. Sheriff? Now, just a moment, folks. Don't lose your heads. I'll explain everything. This is a pretty poor time. Please, please. just a minute. You folks are all upset, and I don't want to... Are you the sheriff? Yes. Well, what do you want? Mr. Fagan, if you ask that way, I'll answer you the same way. I'm here on official business. Official business? What is it? I'm here to investigate the death of Mrs. Viola King. Investigate? Why? What the... Is anything wrong? Mrs. Fagan... Your mother was poisoned. Oh. What? I didn't want to be so blunt, but you gave me no alternative. Your mother was murdered. I'm here because I want to find out who killed her. Now, now keep your chin up, Sue. What the sheriff says is so, I should be anxious. What I said is so, all right, Mr. Fagan. I received a report from the state chemist this morning. There's absolutely no doubt that Mrs. King died from strychnine poisoning. I'd never dreamed that anyone could... What's the matter, Mr. Fagan? Why'd you stop? You're Mrs. King's daughter, aren't you? Yes. I, I recognize the resemblance immediately. You knew Mrs. King? Indeed, I did. She was the dearest lady. Oh, this is terrible. She wanted so much to live, and I... I just want to tell you how sorry I am, Mrs. Fagan. That's your name, isn't it? I've heard your mother talk about you so many times. Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Dancy. I live in that little white house up the road. Thank you so much for coming in, Mrs. Dancy. How are you, John? How do you think I am? John, oh, now don't worry. I understand. He's so upset. Well, so are we all, but there's no reason to be impolite. Fagan, when I ask you how to act or what to say, you can tell me. John, please don't lose your temper. Well, I, I'll be leaving now. Goodbye, Mrs. Fagan. Goodbye, Mrs. Dancy. Just a meddling old fool. Always minding everybody else's business. Gives me a pain. Sorry I had to hear all this nonsense, Sheriff. Don't worry about me, Mr. Fagan. I'm a pretty understanding guy. You've got to be around here, I guess. Uh, Mr. Fagan, before Mrs. Danby, uh, that was her name, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. Uh, just before she entered, uh, you said something that intrigued me. I said something that... Huh. I'm afraid I don't know what you mean, Sheriff. Well, you started to say something and then stopped suddenly. I asked you what happened and just then the door opened. Funny... I don't recall it at all. I wish you would. You started to say something about never being able to dream that anyone could do something or other. Uh, poison Mrs. King, I guess, is what you meant to say. But you stopped. Now, uh, what's it all about? Well, uh, I, I... I don't remember what I was going to say, Sheriff. Fagan, I don't believe you. You don't believe... Say, I don't like that tone of voice one bit, Sheriff. And I don't like your line either. You're concealing something, Fagan, and I want to know what it is. I'm concealing nothing. Don't try to be so darn cagey, Sheriff. Who do you think you are, anyhow? Sherlock Holmes, Fagan? I'm not playing any games with you. This is a murder case I'm working on, and if you know anything more serious, I'd like to know what it is. Please, I, I can't stand all of it. It'll it drive me crazy. Stop it, Stop it, I said. And you, Sheriff, please don't yell that way. Uh, I'm sorry, Miss Fagan. <laughs> what are you laughing about, King? Nothing. It just amuses me to see a couple of grown-ups acting like blooming idiots, that's all. I ought to punch you right in the face, John. Why don't you try it? Of course, I'd kill you. I uh, did. You want to know why Mrs. King died, Sheriff? Why don't you ask this guy? Our son. He knows. Shut up! Uh, Are you... Uh, you uh, never uh, 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 now, the next time I use this gun, I'm not going to aim at the ceiling. Now, oh. Sit down, King. You too, Fagan. Oh. Oh. You feeling all right, Miss Fagan? Yes, I, I'm all right. I'm, I'm fine. Fine. Howdy, sir. You told me you wanted me here right immediate. Okay, what's the idea of that? What? The gun. What's up? Nothing. We're just having a nice little tea party. Uh, sit down. Uh, Smith, do you know these people? Yeah. Yeah, they were pointed out to me at the funeral. Okay. 
Now, Fagan, what did you mean when you said King knows who killed his mother? Why don't you ask him? I'm asking you. What is it? Well, it'd be to help his mother instead of letting her do all the work, she wouldn't have died. Hmm. Now you, all of you, sit tight here for a few minutes. Uh, oh, Smith. Yeah? Come here, I want to talk to you. Right. Jim, why don't you control yourself? And you too, John. Is this the time to be acting like children? Uh, fighting? It wasn't my fault. If he ever opens his mouth again, I'll do the same thing. <laughs> don't make me laugh. Uh, okay, Smith, that was fine work. Now let's get down to business. Fagan. What? Do you know who killed Mrs. King? No. How about you, King? I don't know, if that's what you're asking. And you, Mrs. Fagan, do you know anything about your mother's, uh, uh death? No, sir, I, I don't. Tell me, Mrs. Fagan, uh, you do a great deal of traveling. A great deal? No, I don't think so. Well, you have left San Angelo from time to time. Oh, yes. During the last two weeks? Yes, that's right. Uh, King, what is it? You had uh, an argument with your mother recently, didn't you? Yes. What about? Well, my mother was an old lady, kind of an eccentric. I didn't like the way she handled her finances and all that. What do you mean by that? Well, she didn't have much money, but she had a habit of giving it to anyone who gave her a to her. Uh, who, for example? That's why I had a scrap of that. She wouldn't tell me. Mm. How much money did she give away? I don't know. A few hundred, I guess. Smith? Yes, sir? You were down at the bank, weren't you? Yeah. What'd they tell you? Mrs. King's statement was returned to her with all the vouchers. Hear that, King? What about it? The canceled checks were returned to your mother. You know who got the money. I don't, I tell you. And I don't believe you, King. Now, out with it. Where is the money? If you think I took my mother's money, you're crazy, Sheriff. I know a couple of guys in the death house who said that about me. Why, Sheriff, you don't really think that John was... Mrs. Fagan, it doesn't make any difference what I think. I'm only interested in solving this murder. If I have to step on some toes as I close in on the killer, well, it's just too bad. Can't be helped. Yes. Yes, of course. Now, I want to ask you a few questions again, Mrs. Fagan. Before Mrs. Dansby entered this room, your husband started to say something and stopped suddenly. He stopped because you looked at him, stared at him. You don't think I noticed it, but I did. Now spill it. What are you keeping from me? I, I haven't the slightest idea what you're talking haven't about. You? you about it. Go on, Smith. Mrs. Fagan, when you visited your mother the other day, you told her you had a dream about her the night before. Is that right? Why, yes. That's right. Well, what did you dream? Why, I... I don't recall exactly. Yes, you do. Just think about it. I'll tell you, Sheriff. She dreamed that her mother was poisoned. I started to say something before and used the word dream. That's why I stopped so suddenly. My wife didn't want you to know about that. Because, well, because it sounds so... So unbelievable, I guess. I knew exactly why you stopped. Now, Mrs. Fagan, I'm going to talk to you straight from the shoulder. You claim you had a dream that your mother was poisoned. Is that right? Yes. You were so upset that you decided to visit your mother. When you arrived, she was hale and hearty. A little while later, she died. No one... Oh, oh you I'm sorry. Sit down, Miss Dansby. I'll be through soon. Thank you. Miss Fagan, a little while later, your mother died. No one but you and your husband were present when she was poisoned. Now, which one of you murdered her? You mean... You mean I killed my mother? Sheriff, maybe it does look bad for us. Maybe. Past the maybe stage, Fagan. I tell you, the murderer of Mrs. Viola King is in this room. Where are you going, King? Uh, uh, no place. Just looking for a chair. Out for some air. This uh, room isn't big enough for all of us. Stay where you are. Mrs. Fagan, you visited the town of Anson recently, didn't you? Yes. Well, Detective Smith has located a druggist that sold some strychnine to a woman last week. What have you got to say about that? Oh, for heaven's sake, arrest me. Kill me. Do anything you want. I don't care. Maybe I did murder my mother. I don't know. Maybe it wasn't a dream. Maybe it was real. 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 Oh. She's made it. Come on, get some water. Somebody I'll quick. I'll get the water right away. There we are. All right. All right. You'll be all right. Get some water. Oh. 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 Maybe it wasn't a dream. It was all so, so strange. When I came here, the auto, the auto... Well, what about the auto? After the dream, later, when we came here, the auto was real. Uh, Miss Fagan, look at me. Look. Now, now, tell me about that dream and about the auto. Tell me everything. 
I've been my mother. Dearest mother, I... What are you knitting, mother? A sweater. If I ever finish it. Mother, what is it, Sue? What's wrong? She looks so sad, rocking and sighing. Please tell me, what's the trouble? Nothing. Nothing is wrong. You're not telling the truth. You're worried. Oh, I guess I am, Sue. Why? With a sweater, Sue. I'm knitting it for myself. For the cold weather. But I have a feeling. A feeling. About what? Please tell me. Please. Sue, I have a feeling I'll never finish it. Never. Why? Because I'm not feeling so well. My heart, it feels like... Like... I... Like someone poisoned me. It burns. It burns. Everything burns. And, and I'm sweating cold. Uh. Mother! Mother! Speak to me! Speak to me! Mother! Sue! Sue! What in tarnation is the matter with you? Sue! Oh! Oh, oh, oh. Jim, that was terrible. But what was terrible? I had an awful dream, and it seemed so... That was your dream, Miss Fagan? That's exactly how she described it to me, Sheriff. Hmm. And now, Mrs. Fagan, you said something about an auto. Uh, what about it? After the dream... After Jim promised to take me to my mother, we drove here in his auto. In yes. his auto. And... Go on, Miss Fagan. You drove here in your husband's auto. Uh, what happened then? The wheels. The wheels. All they were saying was, it's too late. 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 Poor woman. If she had anything to do with her mother's death, I'll eat my hat. I think she's falling asleep, Sheriff. The yeah, best thing for her. Oh, Smith, come here a minute. Yeah, what is it, Sheriff? What do you make of it? You said something about there being nobody else in the house when Mrs. King died. That is, nobody beside Mr. and Mrs. Fagan. That right? Right. Well, what was Mrs. King doing? I don't know. Oh, Fagan. Yes? What was Mrs. King doing just before she died? Well, near as I can remember, she was sipping some tea. Say. What's the matter? After, after the doctor left, say, that sure is funny, all right. What are you talking about, Fagan? After the doctor left, the cup, it was gone. That must have had the poison. Uh, who was there? Just me and my wife and the doctor. Uh, oh, yes. Mrs. Dansby came in when she saw the doctor's car. Where are you going, Mrs. Dansby? Why, I, I have to leave all this excitement. Stay where there. you are. Uh, Mrs. Dansby, what do you know about this? I, I don't know anything about it. It's all so upset. What are you shaking about? I'll tell you why she's shaking. She poisoned my mother, that's why. She took her money and killed her. That's what she did. Is that right? Oh, no, no, I didn't. Smith, yeah. get that Anson druggist over here. I want him to identify her. Right. No, I bought the street and I bought it. Why? For the dogs. They were after my chickens. What chickens? You haven't got any chickens. <gasps> Mrs. Dansby, you murdered that old lady. Yes, I did. She had more money than she could use. And I needed it more than she did anyhow. I decided... You took some of it from her, didn't you? I wanted more. I wanted all she had. What did you do? I gave her half a lemon. But before I did, I smeared some poison on it. She didn't see me. Then you removed the cup and destroyed the lemon. When the doctor arrived, I knew it was over. I walked in, washed the cup and saucer, and threw the lemon away. Why are you telling this story to us? Why? Because you'd find out anyway. I know it. I feel sure you would. And she, she would dream about me. I was afraid. I couldn't bear it. I'm afraid of dreams. Take her away, Smith. The charge is murder. <laughs> I have some news for you. Mrs. Dansby was found guilty. She was sentenced to 99 years. Yes, I know. You're, you didn't dream about it, did you? No, my husband just found me. Be with us again when truth and justice triumph. 
in the name of the law. Five six to control one reporting in service. Starting mileage seven eight three three seventy eight thirty three. Officers Perkins and Walter. Roger five six. Six oh three p.m. Starting night watch. This is Don Reed. I'm a police recorder riding with this detective unit just reporting in service on the night watch. You're going to ride with us tonight. Five six. Contact Lieutenant Lugo on car five zero at Washington and Overland uh, regarding a three eleven. Five six ten four. We're in the area now. A three eleven is indecent exposure. We'll be on that case in just a few moments. But as I started to say, you're going to ride with us tonight and follow our investigations. And just remember one thing: the people you hear are not actors. This is it. This is real. This is what happens on the night watch. Night watch. The actual on-the-scene report of your police force in action. There are no actors. There is no script. Every voice, every sound is authentic. The investigations are recorded as they actually occur. Night Watch is presented with the cooperation of the Police Department of Culver City, California. W.N. Hildebrand, Chief. We switch you now to car 5-6, already on investigation in the field, and your police recorder, Don Reed. We're approaching uh, Washington and Overland Boulevard now, where we'll uh, meet uh, Lieutenant Lugo of the Uniformed Division. Straight ahead, I can see his car parked in the gas station. Lights off, waiting for us. Here we are. Now, let's get over there and see what's up. The reason I wanted to see you is that I have a complaint here from a woman. Uh, this particular man exposed himself to her, and uh, I have the license number here. I've run the DMV on it, and this is the name and address of the person. I'm sure she can identify him. And uh, I wonder if you and Walter will follow this thing up and go pick the man up. Okay, right. Uh, you got the address, sir? Yes, it's right on this uh, piece of paper here. Okay, fine. We'll go right out there. As well. You uh, heard the lieutenant assign us to this exposure case. In plain English, this means we're going to pick up a suspect who evidently has exposed himself indecently in front of a woman victim on a public street. So, let's get back to our car and get underway. We've uh, been driving for better than an hour... And uh, as the suspect in this case lives in another city some, oh, 30 miles away. A moment ago, we stopped at a local police station and picked up another one of their officers to go in with us. This is uh, oh, uh, customary courtesy when you're working out of your district. It's just a matter of blocks now, but uh, before we do, uh, I want to lean over the front seat here for just a moment. Sergeant, I noticed that uh, when the lieutenant assigned us to this case, he seemed a little more concerned than usual. Uh, any particular reason? Well, yes, Don, uh... I think what he had in mind was that in this type of a case where you've got a man exposing himself to either women or children, uh, you've got a man that is usually mentally ill. Mm -hmm. And uh, this coupled with the fact that many serious crimes, including even murder, uh, will start with this kind of a background. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't have to be premeditated, but quite often the victim will scream or will fight. And as a result, the suspect, in his panic, he may injure the victim or do her great bodily harm. And even in some cases, as I said, uh, the results will be homicide. Oh, I see. Well, that's why uh, Lieutenant Lugo is so anxious that we pick up this person. That's it. Uh, let's see. This should be about the house along here. Wait a minute. That looks like the car out there. Eh? Yeah, yeah, this is it here. This is it. Kurt, uh, I'm going to cover the back door. Do you want to pull in the front with the lieutenant? Yeah. Approaching the house now. Young lady coming up to meet us at the door. The uh, suspect is stretched out on a divan, listening to the radio. Young fellow, nice looking. 
in the corner, a couple of young girls yeah. playing with dolls. The uh, police lieutenant from this local city right here is identifying us. Good my identification. Did you call this city? Yes, sir. Thank you, Pat. Yeah. I'd like to go on back to Culver City for some questioning with regard to crime that occurred in Culver City. Do you suppose I would be able to go to work today? You won't make it tonight. Isn't that funny, Sergeant? He's um, not even curious why we're picking him up. He knows why we're here. Yeah, but uh, if I were being arrested, I'd at least ask why. That's an important piece of evidence. He knows he's committed a crime, so he's not even going to ask why. Hmm. Is the um, young lady here his wife? No, I was just talking to her. That's his sister-in-law. Hmm. Seems his wife works. We'll talk to her later. Hmm. What about the uh, two youngsters over here? They belong to him? Yeah, he's the father of two children. Hmm. You know, um, somehow he doesn't fit the crime. Nice looking, well dressed. Could be the young fellow that lives next door. Here he is. Hmm. You ready to go, fellow? Why are you calling me, Daddy? Well, Daddy, be back. We're going to go see Mommy. I'll see you right back. Well, we have the suspect in custody heading back now for our car. We'll uh, ride up in front with Sergeant Perkins. Detective Walter will sit in the back with the prisoner. Appreciate very much for your your cooperation, your department's cooperation. I'll uh, give you guys a ring on that deal. I'm very glad to have met you, sir. My pleasure. Thank you, Lieutenant. If we can help you any time, let us know. Okay. Good night, sir. Good night. pick you out of three million people in the county of Los Angeles if we didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. You know that. So why don't you tell us? Well, I, I can well imagine. Uh, there's only there's only one thing that I could possibly imagine what it would be, and I can't imagine it could be that. Well, what What is it that you imagine? <clears throat> well, <laughs> why don't you tell me, and then if you're no, right, I'll tell you. Well, you know why we're down here. Why don't you tell us? We've heard this story before from others, too. Well, I, have, I haven't committed any crime that I know of. Uh, I hate to... <laughs> well, what have you done? Well, I'm kind of embarrassed about the whole thing. Uh, doesn't embarrass us any. We've talked to people before on the same subject. Well, uh, a girl on uh, the street corner saw me last night when I was, uh, do I have to say it? I have to say it. You tell us. What were you doing? It sounds kind of silly when you say it. Did you expose yourself to her? Well, I didn't expose myself to her. I think she saw me. What were you doing? But I didn't intend for her to see me because I didn't see her standing there until <clears throat> I turned around and then she was standing there. I guess she was waiting for a bus or something, and so I turned right away as soon as I saw that she was standing there. You mean you had your your private parts exposed? Yes. When the girl was standing alongside of the car. Well, I I suppose she was. Either she walked up or she was standing there. I didn't notice her. Did you try to attract her attention to you? No, I didn't. I went around the block and I came back by to see if she, you know, was looking and uh, trying to see whether she was, had noticed or not. But Have you ever exposed yourself in the car just to yourself? Possibly. Well, do, you, do you do it when you're driving, too? <laughs> I suppose maybe I have at one time or another, but I mean, uh... Do you feel this urge to just stop and park uh, all by yourself? Well, 
occasionally, yes, I might say so. Uh, I, uh, I, <coughs> I kind of have my own views about that. Uh, and I feel I want relief, well, uh, that's the easiest way I know to get it. We all do stupid and silly things sometimes, and each one has their own fault. When, when you get this urge, do you, uh, do you ever stop to consider the surroundings or the area in which you're in, or any, anybody being able to see you? Well, uh, or the earth I, I might say, uh, well, naturally, I mean, uh, uh, to a certain extent, uh, I don't, uh, I don't make any bones about uh, heading off someplace to try to get some particular spot or so on to do it. Uh, uh, I'm always, I always try to be uh, very careful about having no one see me. Naturally, I mean, you don't, uh, you don't want anybody to see you doing anything like that. But I certainly never thought that I would ever be picked up for doing anything like that. Law. I mean, it's against the law if nobody sees you. But in case somebody saw you. Well, I know, but I... That's why we're down here to pick you up. Yes, I understand that. We wonder how many cases have happened in the past in various localities that uh, the police were not fortunate to obtain a license number or a description of the car. Where there are outstanding crimes have been committed. Five, six, in with one, we open the booking door. And four, five, six. You are listening to Night Watch and following the activities of a detective unit on their tour of duty. The people you hear are not actors, and every voice and every sound is real. The investigations are recorded as they actually occur. We will give you the final results of tonight's case at the conclusion of The Night Watch. And now we switch you back to police headquarters and police recorder Don Reed. We've uh, been here at headquarters for over an hour. And the prisoner has been booked and placed in the cell. The uh, suspect's wife has been called to the station. And Sergeant Perkins and Detective Walter are in the office now discussing the case with her. Let's go on in. She's, uh, sitting at the desk, small in stature, early 20s, modestly dressed, attractive, sort of a bewildered expression on her face. He does park the car, and then he goes uh, with these fellows that he shares a ride with. What, uh, what area is it? Occur? What? Where did this occur? Here in Culver City. I mean, he never, he's not even in this vicinity. Doesn't he ever come up in this area? Well, no. He doesn't? I mean, unless he comes after me. I see. And then I'm never at work that late. Uh -huh. This is what a, time, what time the reason he... we're late tonight is because I was trying to get information on him tonight. Mm -hmm. And what time did he pick up last night about? It was about 6.30. Did you notice know anything night. unusual about him last night? No. Was he at all nervous or anything? No. Well, he uh, was involved in an incident last night prior to the time that you uh, that he picked you up. I can't. I just can't imagine that. But how long have you been married? Four years. Four years. Have children? Yes, I have two, and I'm expecting another one. May I ask you a personal question? Certainly. How do you and your husband get along? Perfect. No, uh, no disharmony or no, trouble. No, we've always got along perfect. Were these uh, children or grown-ups or what? Well, these were adults. Well, I'm, I'm just shocked. I mean, I mean, we have two children. I guess you saw them when you picked them up. My sister said they were crying. But, uh, I mean, I haven't noticed any anything different about him. I mean, he's always the same. He's very attentive to the children and myself. And he's, uh, well, he's been a good husband, as, you know, and a father. I, I mean, he's, I've never deprived him of anything, and I can't imagine anything like this. When could I see him or talk to him? Well, it would be better if you wait until Monday. Mm -hmm. So would you feel that you want to get a lawyer? I can't afford one. Well, I don't think you 
You absolutely need one until we finish the investigation and then you can see where you stand. Mm -hmm. And if you feel that you need a lawyer, you can hire yourself. Or if necessary, you can continue to serve as a public defender. So he'll be held here? I mean, he'll be held here. If you want to contact the department Monday, I will have more information uh, regarding it. Okay, we'll come along with you then. Good night. Yeah, thank you. Uh, is Lieutenant Lugo in his office? Okay, oh, wait a minute. Here he is now. Never mind. Uh, Lieutenant Walter and I have been talking to this fellow, and uh, he admits the accusations of the case. He appears to be a fairly intelligent man and uh, normal in all appearance, but talking to him, well, you can tell he's got quite a psychiatric problem there that something should be done on it. Now, we're uh, just about ready to make out the reports on him and wanted to talk to you to see what you recommended. it. Well, Perk, uh, you've checked into his background, and if he has a problem, uh, I would suggest that you uh, mention that in your reports and to the district attorney, and possibly it may lead to giving him some help in his particular case. Well, he, uh, he uh, is perfectly willing to, to get the help. He wants the help. He has no prior criminal record, but talking to him in his background, well, you can see he has this problem that has existed for some time. So, Say, uh, excuse me, Lieutenant, while you're making out these reports, uh, I'd like to go over for a moment and talk for the prisoner about some of the points you've discussed here just now. Sorry with you. Surely. Go right ahead. Fine. Thanks. Uh, one thing I'm going to report for before I statements have been recorded for police testimony as well as for the radio program Night Watch. And I'd like to have your permission to use this entire case for broadcast purposes, if, if that's all right with you. Okay. Um, now that you're alone here in the cell, I'd like to know how you really feel about this thing. Oh, I don't want to discuss the possibility of mental illness or that you're a family man, wife, children. However, I noticed in the car you stated that you felt that you had not committed a crime. I think now that you realize that you have. But somewhere, possibly, uh, there are other people suffering from this same compulsion. So if you had a, you had a chance to speak of your experience, what would you say to them? What would you tell them? All I have to say is that... Uh... <laughs> If there's anyone, if this happens to strike anyone that might be listening to it, just uh, if you can take anybody's word for it, take mine. That it isn't, it isn't any of it worth. It just isn't worth what. No matter, no matter what the, what the crime may be today in that line, and no matter what satisfaction a person might get out of it, it certainly isn't worth. It was isn't worth a, an ounce of what you have to go through if you ever get caught. Now, I want to say this much, that I've been treated pretty nice by all the officers since I've been here. But boy, when they come into your house and you wait and go to work, and they tell you, come on, let's go. Don't even take a belt with you because you'll take it away. That right there is not proof that it isn't worthwhile. Okay. Good night. You have been listening to Actual Investigations as recorded from Detective Unit 5-6 on The Night Watch. And now back to police headquarters and Chief W.N. Hildebrand. Tonight's case involving the indecent exposure 
brings to mind that these suspects remain at large for long periods because the victims either feel embarrassment and fail to report the incident or provide the police with little or no description. In that event, your law enforcement officers are powerless to apprehend them. We must depend on the citizen and their cooperation to control this problem. In the case heard tonight, it was apparent the suspect was in need of mental treatment. This fact was included in the officer's report, and the court directed the prisoner be given treatment as part of his sentence. Consequently, when this man is released, he'll be ready to take his place in normal society. It is my honest opinion that the average citizen does not realize the real problems facing the law enforcement officer today or the dangers they encounter to maintain public security. That's why we are bringing you the facts as they actually happen. If we succeed in bringing this message to just a few, then our efforts will be well rewarded in presenting Night Watch. Thank you, Chief Hildebrand. You have just heard on-the-scene reports of your police force in action. Every voice, every sound has been real. Night Watch, brought to you through the cooperation of your police department of Culver City, California, is produced by Sterling Tracy and Jim Hadlock, with technical advice by Sergeant Ron Perkins, and described in the field by police recorder Don Reed. Side, Captain York. Captain, Rod Dugan has just been killed. Yeah? Where did it happen? In Tom Cotsonaris joint. Who's this talking? Ryan. I'm the officer on the beat. Okay, Ryan. Don't let anyone out of the joint till I get there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir? Get a car around to the front and a couple of men from the detective bureau. Send in a general call to surround Tom Cotsonaris' joint and hold any suspicious-looking hoofs that try to slip through. Rob Dugan has just been dumped off. Yes, sir. Come on, get those people out of that door. Come on, open up here, open up. Where is he, Ryan? In the back room, Captain. He's dead. Where's Cotsonaris? He's back there, too. Well, don't let him slip out. This will be just about the last gang killing in his place. The old man said to padlock him if anything else happened down here. Here, let me shut to this door. Come on, help me here. Get Come on, get back there. Get back Come on, back up, back up there. Come on. There, stay on the door, Ryan. Say, what's this bunch of rats doing here? You told me to hold them, Captain. Oh, so they're the guys that were here when Dugan was killed, eh? A fine-looking bunch. All right, just keep them where the idle wagon gets here. We'll sift them out down at headquarters. Yes, sir. Who called you in from the beat? Uh, Cots and Harris. Okay. I'll stroll in the back room and just see what's going on. Oh, Captain York, eh? I'm glad you're here. Yeah, I'll bet. Where's Dugan? Why, back there, uh, behind the tap. Hmm. 
Knife in the back, eh? Who did it? I don't know, Captain York. Frank, one of the waiters came back here and found him. Was he back here alone? No. Nick Dinesco was with him. That dirty little snake, eh? When did he get out of prison? I don't know, Captain. No, I suppose not. How long was Nick with him? Oh, about one hour. And then Nick left? Yeah. Anybody see Dugan alive after Nick left him? No, Captain. This knife has Nick Dinesco's initials on it. Is it his? Well, looks very much like it, Captain. Know any reason for Nick killing him? Oh, I, I don't know no. Now listen, Captain Errors. I've got orders to pad like your dump the next time there's trouble down here. Now you'd better give us your help on this case. Come on now. Maybe the old man will go easy on you. Well, I want to do what's right, Captain. I don't want the boys killing one another in my place. I'm trying to run a nice place. You can't run a nice place serving liquor to a bunch of rats. What reason would Nick Donesco have for killing Dugan? Well, maybe it was over Nick's old girl. You see, Captain, after Nick went to prison, Dugan stole his girl. So when Nick got out, he looked Dugan up and knifed him in the back, eh? Yeah. But nobody saw him do it. Don't make any difference. Where does this gal live? Is her name's Sadie. She's living with Big Jim Diamond right now. So she bounced Dugan too, eh? Going in for heavy money. Playing around with Big Jim Diamond, eh? Well, we'll look her up. Unless I miss my guess, we'll find Nick hiding around somewhere near. Yes, sir. I've got a hunch that Nick beat it right to Sadie's place and wants her to frame up an alibi for her. What do you want? Oh, shh. Let me inside, Sadie. Tom York is right behind me. I killed a man, Sadie. I, I killed him. You killed a man? Who? Dugan. <gasps> Dugan? Nick? Why? You know why I killed him. I slipped up on him. He was half drunk. I slipped up on him and drove a knife oh. into his back. Don't. Don't. Ah, so, you were still in love with him, huh? No. No, I, I never loved anyone but you, Nick. You know that. Ah, you can't put that line over on me. You're staying with Jim Diamond right now. I know that. But I don't care. Sadie, you've got to hide me. You've got to hide me, do you hear? I can't hide you, Nick. Tom York will come up here the first thing. Yeah, I know that. But you've got to give me an alibi. You, you've got to tell Captain York that I've been right here, uh, playing cards, since 11 o'clock. You've got to. Why, Sadie, you got your bags packed. Yeah. I'm leaving Jim, Nick. He beats me. He beats me something terrible. Look. Look at these boozers. Yeah. Okay. Now, you give me an alibi, Sadie, and when things blow over, we'll go away together, see? Yeah, we'll go away together. Me and a dirty, rotten little stool pigeon. Oh, I'm not so bad, Sadie, and I've always loved you. Honest. Yeah. Sadie, you got a gun on the table. Why? Why, it's warm. <gasps> it, it's been lying on the radiator. But it's just been fired. Smell the powder, Sadie. I'll tell you the truth, Nick. Jim came home tonight and tried to beat me up. I got this gun to scare him. You... you killed him? No. I just scared him, that's all. He chased me into the next room there. And I fired two shots over his head, through the window. He got scared and left. I gotta get out of here before he comes back. That's Tom York, lady. Oh, he, he'll get me sure. You gotta give me that alibi. All right. Listen to me, you little rat. What time did you kill Dugan? Uh, about... about half an hour ago. At uh, 12.30. Hmm. It's one now. Anybody see you do it? No. But my knife, they'll find that sure. That's all right. You can tell them you lost it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I lost it. Now listen to me. You, you've been here since 11 o'clock tonight. Yeah, yeah, I've been here since 11 o'clock tonight. I'll tell Tom York that, that I called you over here. That I was afraid of Jim. That I wanted you to protect me. Yeah, that's it. That'll be a good story. That'll give you an alibi. Yeah, yeah, but Tom will find this gun. And he'll want to know about it. Yeah. I got it. We'll tell him that I was afraid of Jim. And I called you over here to protect me. And while you were here, Jim came in. He was drunk, and you fired two shots through the window in the next room to scare him. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that'll stop him. Oh, he's getting pretty close now. He'll be up here any minute. Captain York ain't no fool, Sadie. You'll have to go easy with him. I know how to handle him. Shh, he's outside now. All right. You've got to act like nothing has happened. 
Get out in the kitchen and start making some sandwiches. Don't come in this room till I call you. I'll handle the captain. Okay. All right, Nick. Beat it to the kitchen. All right, all right. Keep your shirt on. Hello, Sadie. Hello, Flatfoot. Mind if I come in, Sadie? Help yourself, copper. The door is open. Oh, getting kind of ritzy since you've been associating with Jim Diamond, eh? Oh, I've been doing all right. Sure, leave it to you, Sadie. Leave it to you. All right, Flatfoot, stop beating around the bush. What do you want? Sit down, Sadie. Don't get so huffy. We're going to have a nice, long talk. All right, Captain. You better sit down, too. I know what you want to talk to me about. And I'll give you the lowdown on the whole thing. Nick came up there. Oh, so that's the way it was, eh? All right, Sadie, you can go. Thanks, Captain. You can come out now, Nick. Sadie's told me all about it. Oh, hello, Captain. Well, I, I was wondering who was out here with Sadie. I, uh, where is she? She took her bags and left. Told me all about it, though. Yeah? All about what? All about where you was all evening and what you was doing. Yeah? What's wrong? I was just about to make a mistake, Nick. A terrible mistake. Yeah? Yeah. You know, Nick, I was just about to make the mistake of trying to pin the killing of Rod Dugan onto you. On me? Oh, gee. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, funny, isn't it? (laughs) And Sadie tells me you've been here since 11 o'clock. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, Dugan wasn't bumped off until about 12.30. Yeah? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I almost pulled a bone of that time, Nick. Yeah. Sadie tells me uh, she called you over here tonight to protect her from Jim Diamond. Yeah, that's right, Captain. She tells me that Jim beat her up. Yeah. Did she show you the bruises? Yeah. He must have beat her up something terrible. Yeah, he does. I shouldn't imagine that you'd like it, Nick, seeing as how you're stuck on Sadie. I don't. Sadie tells me Jim came up here tonight. Yeah, that's right. How was he feeling? Oh, he was drunk. Sadie says uh, you and him had some trouble. Yeah, he starts getting tough, and I told him to get out. He didn't want to go. So? So I I grabbed Sadie's gun just to scare him and and tells him I'm going to kill him if he don't beat it. And what did he do? He got tough, and I I bust a couple of caps right over his head just to scare him. Mm, I see. And uh, what did Jim do? (laughs) He beat it out the door running like blazes. Oh, I see. Oh, by the way, Nick, where are the bullets from your gun go? Huh? Uh, through an open window. Uh, It was in the next room. This room over here? Yeah. Come over here, Nick. I want to show you something. Huh? What's that? Look. Look who's lying on the bed. Jim. Jim. Diamond. Sure, it's Jim Diamond, and he's dead. Dead? Oh, oh, no. No. You heard me. He's dead. Killed by bullets from that gun. Uh, uh, you killed him because he was beaten up on your girl. Oh, no, no, I didn't. I, I tell you, I didn't. Don't lie to me, you dirty rat. I didn't kill him. I, I wasn't even here. I wasn't even here. No? Then where were you? I was... I was... Oh. Oh, my God. <laughs> Police headquarters. Okay, Captain. Hello, Tim. Cancel that pickup on Dick Dinesco for that Dugan killing. He just confessed to Captain York. Police headquarters. The International Secret Police. Stealing Zero. Stealing Zero. Stealing Zero. Stealing Zero. Stealing Zero. Be 
Reed, Clint, and Barney send a cablegram in code to Chief Riley of the International Secret Police stating that a jewel smuggler was also aboard the clipper bound for Hong Kong. But they did not mention that Marsha Winfield, governess to little Jean Kingsley, is also going to China and has asked their protection during the flight, hinting that she, too, is seeking the mysterious criminal, the octopus. That same night, they surprise an intruder in their bedroom and after a terrific struggle, overcome the man and discover him to be the jewel smuggler who was aboard the China Clipper. After turning the man over to the local police, we find the boys talking in their room just as dawn is breaking. What a night. I'm sleeping along just as peaceful. And all of a sudden, I wake up and see that guy's face almost touching mine. He was trying to hear what you were saying in your sleep, Barney. It's getting so a guy don't have any privacy at all anymore. People climbing up balconies and listening to every word you say. Yeah, we're darn lucky to get out of that as well as we did. What were you stirring up such a rumpus? What'd you expect me to do? Give that thug a sweet smile? Well, you gave him plenty of noise. And on top of that, you couldn't find the lights. Of course I couldn't. Somebody's foot was in my eye. <laughs> it sure was a mess. Half the time, I didn't know which was Barney and which was a jewel smuggler. Oh, so you're the guy that kept hitting me in the dark. No, Barney, honest. Well, if you ask me, we were lucky to get out of it as easy as we did. That smuggler waving his gun around like that? Hey, one of us might have been seriously hurt. I'll say. The darkness made it hard for us to see him. But I was lucky at that. Because he certainly couldn't see us good enough to aim a gun at us. You know, it's a funny thing. No matter what happens, I always get the worst of it. Must be fate, I guess. If you don't keep your head better when any emergency arises like that, you won't have any fate. What's the matter with you, anyhow? You've had enough training in the past to be ready for anything. You're right there, old pal, old pal. Ready for anything. And believe me, I get everything. What did you expect me to do while that guy was jumping on my neck? Relax and enjoy sweet and beautiful dreams? No, but you might have feigned sleep a while longer. <laughs> that smuggler had a gun. You're telling me? That bullet parted my hair. Clint and me were just sneaking up on him when you woke up, Barney. Another minute and we would have had him. Well, you got him, all right. With me on the bottom of the pile. After this, I don't sleep in front of no more doors or windows. <laughs> well, that was your own idea, you know. You wanted air and wanted to see the moonlight. Yeah, and I saw stars, too. That fella had a punch like a pile driver. Why do you think he came to our room, Clint? Well, to get the key to our international secret police code. You mean our disguise is having fooled the octopus gang? They know who we really are? Yeah, I'm afraid so. By coming to our room, the smuggler proved to me that he was a member of the octopus band. And also that our disguises are useless. Then we can forget them? No, while they may know that we're the secret police, I'm sure they don't know how we really look. Uh, me, at least. You know, I've been careful of that in the past. As long as they're not sure of my real appearance, I may be able to get through their lines yet. But, Clint, what about us? I want you to stay out of this whole mess, Speed. You're in it more now than I counted on. I'm sorry that I ever let Chief Riley talk me into bringing you along. Oh, my Clint, I wouldn't miss this for ever anything. Not the kids like me to fight crime in every way we can. I'm luckier than the rest because I'm getting a crack at the octopus. Yeah, you've done more than your share so far, Steve. Capturing Blackie Spears in my room, discovering the jewel smuggler tonight. I'm proud of you. But now with the octopus aware of who we really are, I want you to just stay out of the picture. That's right, kid. You'll run into more danger since leaving Alameda than I've had in a year. But I'll say you know what to do in a pinch. So far, you've done all the head work of this outfit. Oh, no, Barney. I've just been lucky. But I sure wish I could do away with these glasses I have to wear for a disguise. Yeah, you'll have to keep them a while longer, Speed. If there was no other reason for keeping our disguises, passport difficulties would be enough. If we assumed our real identities now, <laughs> we'd have to do a lot of explaining to the Clipper officials. That's so. The Clipper captain and the crew don't know about us being in the secret police. But the octopus does. Yeah, the octopus. I'd give a lot to know just how much information he does have. What does the octopus call us here for? Anyone know? Does anyone know the master's desires until he has spoken, Splintas? No, but he seems to know what everyone else is thinking, though. <sighs> Gives me the creeps coming to this room. Nothing in it but that microphone for him to hear us and that loudspeaker for him to talk through. Your feelings are unimportant in the matter. This meeting is important. 
It is the first time the Hong Kong branch of the band has been gathered together since we first started operation here. Oh, yeah? Talk some more, Kwan Wu. I ain't been with you long, so anything you tell me is news. The band of the octopus does not waste words. The master is successful because he acts. Well, why don't he show himself? This mystery business is okay for the yokels, but I'd like to know who I'm working for and what I'm heading for. You are heading for disaster if you keep up this foolish talk, Sinter. The master pays you well for the work you do. Yeah, but you've seen his face. Why can't I? I'm one of the best aviators in the sky. I can do everything with a plane but make it cook. And still, I can't see who I'm working for. It is best not to, Sinter. I have seen the master's face. Because I am the only one he can trust. I have always been with him. Well, I'm sick of the whole business. I've been sitting around in this private underground hangar till I forgot what the sky looks like. I won't do it no longer. I want action. The master. You call yourself splinters? Huh? Yeah. Uh, octopus? I have heard your complaint. No, 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 not that. When they leave you, they, they leave the world, life, everything. They never heard of again. I was talking foolish, Octopus. I'll keep my mouth shut after this, I promise. Your promises are less than nothing to me. Kwang Mu hired you because you are a good aviator. Yeah, the best I can do. I, I know your record in the air. And also on the ground, Splinters. You are one of the lowest type of criminals. A renegade aviator. A man who will fly for anyone who can pay him. Regardless of the purpose, a man without conscience, without heart, as unfeeling as the ship he flies. I, but I, uh, I need such a man for my work. But such a man must not complain, for then he will be punished. I have certain underground dungeons for such punishment. No, 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 not, not torture. I ain't done anything against you, Octopus. I, I work for you hard. Don't torture me. I will give you a chance to prove your worthiness of remaining in the band of the octopus. What? How? Anything. One move. Yes, master. I have just been talking to the Honolulu office over my short wave set. Operator 41 was arrested two hours ago on a charge of burglary. Burglary? Then... Yes. Only Speed Gibson, Clint Barlow, and Barney Dunlap could be responsible... And their room was the only one he was going to search. Operator 41 must have been clumsy. The boy, Speed Gibson, was the real cause of his capture. A kid? For your information, Splinters, this boy is Clint Barlow's nephew. Barlow is not only the cleverest and most intelligent man in the International Secret Police, but he's raising this orphaned boy as his own and has taught him the rules of the Secret Police. Train him to follow in his footsteps, should he so desire. And it is Barlow's heart that I will attack through his nephew. Since Barlow is our worst enemy, Master. The only one I acknowledge, Kwan. The only one who might end my career. But he made his one mistake when he brought the boy on this trip. For what reason did the boy come? If Riley thought of such a move would remove suspicion, all three of his guys, traveling under assumed name. For the time being, I shall allow them their masquerade. May I humbly ask why, then, you caused the warning note to be presented to them under the dinner check, master? More to frighten the Winfield girl. Women are troublesome. I wanted her to stay away from China. Why she frightened? Yes, but the little fool has the courage of ignorance. She's coming to China under the protection of our enemies. Does she know who they are? Not yet. That note also worried Barlow, not because of his own safety, but that of his nephew. Speed Gibson is the vulnerable point in Clint Barlow's armor. What is your plan? First of all, nothing must interfere with our business of smuggling. The men I have assigned to take care of that will not concern themselves with this warfare against our enemies. Kwanu. You are friendly with Dr. Kingsley, the little girl's part. Very, Master. I see him almost every day at the council office. He thinks very highly of me. Good. The more you are in his confidence, the more you will learn about Marsha Winfield. I want you to work on that alone. You know the background there, Kwanon. 
Yes, Master. It will be a pleasure. Now for the International Secret Police. It is Monsieur Pierre Dorsey and Jim at Earl Fletch. I am not attempting to interfere with their activities so long as they are aboard the clipper ship. That would be foolhardy. It is the stopovers that concern me. Those are the places where I can reach them. But Master Operator 41 is no longer flying with them. I know, but there are other ways. They leave Honolulu very shortly. They reach Midway Island in about eight hours. They will leave Midway the following morning. Fly over the international date line and reach Wake Island Sunday afternoon. Splinters. Yeah, yes, sir. I want you to take my special bullet monoplane and fly to Wake Island. You will leave immediately and await the clipper plane from Midway. Do I go alone? Yes, but you will have a passenger when you return. At least, you'd better have a passenger. Yeah, I will. Who will it be? Speed Gibson. <laughs> Gibson, his uncle, Clint Barlow, ace operator of the International Secret Police, and Barney Dunlap, also of the police, are flying to Hong Kong, China, via the China Clipper, to end the smuggling activities of the world's most dreaded criminal, the octopus. At the Honolulu stopover, they become acquainted with Marsha Winfield, governess to little Jean Kingsley, and are startled when she tells them that she took the position so that she could go to China in search of the octopus who has brought tragedy into her life. She asks their protection for the duration of the trip for the little girl's sake. Meanwhile, the octopus has dispatched a renegade aviator, Splinters, in a special bullet plane to await the arrival of the China Clipper at Wake Island, and there, kidnap Speed Gibson. At the moment, however, we find the boys talking things over several hundred feet in the air, about half an hour out of Midway Island. Yeah... You know, I wouldn't mind living on one of these clipper ships the rest of my life. Rides as easy as a big, calm yacht. Good feed, sightseeing, and a guy can get a good night's sleep in one of them berths. <laughs> the one you got at Honolulu, huh, Barney? You're darn tootin', Speed. What with you and Clint using me as a battlefield to capture that smuggler? <laughs> well, your snoring wasn't any lullaby for us, either. Is that so? If I hadn't snored, Speed wouldn't have been awake to see that smuggler when he climbed up to our balcony at the hotel. <laughs> it's no use, Clint. You can't top Barney. <laughs> Look, he's the champion alibi Ike of the service. Yeah, what do you mean, alibi Ike? Well, I won't go into painful details now. After all, I'm just supposed to be Pierre Dorsey, the French tutor to your son here, Earl. And you're Jim Fletcher. The Texas oil man, I remember. How can I forget it with you reminding me every half hour? By the way, where's Miss Winfield and Jean? In the lounge. Miss Winfield's writing letters. Oh, think I'll see if she needs me help. No, no, you don't, Romeo. You stay right here with us where I can keep an eye on you. Okay. Nothing to do, though. Nothing to do? Gee, Barney, in just a little while we'll cross the international date line. Just think, we've been flying like 60 ever since we took off from Midway Island, and we'll still lose a day. Lose a day flying at this speed? How do you figure that? Because we crossed the international date line. If we were coming the other way, from China, then we'd leave Wake one day and arrive at Midway the day before. Clint, do you think the altitude's getting the kid? <laughs> no, speed's right, buddy. You pass over the same line on boats, you know. We're just confused because we're traveling so much faster. Oh, I get it now. Say, they always have some sort of celebration on a boat. 
Last time I crossed over the equator, they ducked me and held me under for a whole day. At least that's the way it seemed to me. Oh, but you were red as a boy of lobster when they pulled you out. <laughs> and that's funny, huh? <laughs> I wonder if they'll have a celebration up here crossing the date line in the air, as they do on shipboard crossing the equator. Nah, and if they do, they can count me out. For once, I'm going to be the watching audience. Watch it. Here comes one of the stewards. Hmm? Oh, as I was saying, Mr. Fletcher, the clipper route is fascinating. You will remember that soon after we left Honolulu, we passed over the very sands that Sir Charles Kingsford Smith used as a landing field for his Southern Cross plane when he blazed the first sky route from San Francisco to Sydney, Australia. Uh, thank pardon, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Fletcher? Uh-huh. Oh, yes, Stuart? Uh, the captain's compliments, sir, and he asks if you will not impersonate Father Time for the usual ceremonies when we pass over the time demarcation line. You mean to say that you have ceremonies up here in the air for that? Oh, yes, sir. Everything but the immersion, of course. <laughs> you are going to be in the watching audience. <laughs> yeah, that's right, lad. I should have stayed at Midway Island and enjoyed the fishing. Father Time. <laughs> Radio OC34, calling shortwave station OC127. OC34, calling OC127. Come in, please. Gotta come in quick enough. I don't think that octopus ever leaves his set. He talks to me more by radio than when I'm with him in Hong Kong. Uh oh. Here he comes. OC-127 to OC-34. OC-127 to OC-34. Stand by for two-way conversation. OC-34 already for two-way. Flinders? Yes, sir. I just sighted Wake Island. We'll land there shortly. Can't see nothing of the China Clipper yet. Wait at Wake Island. Clipper will probably lay over since there we were the report forms of typhoon in Formosan waters heading for Wake Island. Typhoon? Well, that'll drown him, all right. That's a piece of weather that even I won't buck. You might, Splinter. What do you mean? The plane will naturally arouse curiosity. You have the story you are to tell the aviation officials. That you are trying to establish a new speed record between Guam and Wake Island for your own satisfaction. I got all that straight, but what about flying in a typhoon? Once you get speed, Gibson, you will have to take off, no matter what kind of flying weather you have. But octopus, you might as well tell me to send my bullet plane in a nosedive into the ocean right now. Typhoon flying is just another name for suicide. Are you going to obey my orders? You know what awaits you here if you fail. And don't think that you can escape me by going elsewhere. Remember, the tentacles of the octopus. I can reach you anywhere. Oh, I know. I thought you wanted to speak Gibson alive. I want to strike at Clint Barlow. Losing his nephew will remove Barlow from the chase. What happens to the boy is of little interest to me. But my life, sir, I... What are you going to do? I'll get speed, Gibson. We'll fly into the typhoon if we must. That is better. You have full instructions. You are to stay by the plane as much as possible. So you will be in constant communication with me. Yes, sir, I'm circling Wake Island now. Very well. Land and tell your story to the officials. And tell it well. Tell it so that they will believe it, or you will have to answer to me. Shoo, I thought we never would get out of that lounge performance. <laughs> oh, Father Time himself, huh? You've still got some cotton whiskers hanging on your chin there. <laughs> I'll take them off, Barney. Thanks, kid. I was kind of nervous when the steward was putting them on me. Thought maybe he'd find out I had a phony mustache and a squint. Yes, uh, he was laughing too hard to examine your face, pal. You should have seen yourself when they put that paper crown on your head. Looked more like a dunce cap. Yeah, well, let me tell you, not all dunces wear caps. Le Jose, get off your high horse, cowboy. Here comes Gene. Now, remember who you are. Guess I'd better put these glasses on again, too. Hello, everybody. 
Mr. Fletcher, I want to tell you what a wonderful father time you made. I should have... You too, Jean. I thought you was my friend. I am. I wasn't laughing at you, but with you. You sure were having a good time initiating the passengers over the international date line. <laughs> and I'll have to admit I got a kick out of it, all right. Well, I'm sure glad to have one of these international date line certificates they give to everyone who flies over the line. Boy, listen to this. The main of Phoebus Apollo, ruler of the sun and heavens, know all people that Earl Fletcher, once earthbound and time-laden, is now declared a subject of the realm of the sun and of the heavens with the freedom of our sacred eagle. That with the speed of our flaming chariot, this subject did fly the Pacific skies over the international date line, which mortals designed to mark off in the limit of days our eternal course through the skies. All right, all right. You didn't have to read your certificate to us. We all got one, and as far as I know, we can all read. Yeah, Pop, but I like the sound of those words. It makes you feel like, like somebody. I'm awfully proud of my certificate, too, Earl. I like these pictures of the sun, moon, and stars around the edge, and the flaming chariot, and the clipper ship. I love this whole trip, especially the goonie birds. Mr. Doris says, do you think there'll be any goonie birds on Wake Island, like there was on Midway? Well, very probably, mademoiselle. They're so funny and awkward. I would have liked one for a pet. You have a heck of a time keeping a goonie bird aboard the China Clipper. <laughs> I got a kick out of those goonies, but the birds that moaned and groaned gave me the heebie-jeebies. Wonder what they call them. Don't know, Bar. I mean, Pop. But the Clipper captain himself pointed out that turned frigate birds and giant albatross... Boy, they're colossal. They're col- colossal, Al. But do hear that, Mr. Dorsey? You have to teach him better than that. Well, well you always exaggerate, Mr. Fletcher. Well, they were big, and so are the fish. Hope I can get in some more fish in at Wake Island. I think we'll have to stay in the hotel at Wake. Well, what do you mean, Jean? The steward just told Marcia that a typhoon was heading for Wake Island. We'd probably have to lay over until it passed. Typhoon? Lay over? Well, then we'll be late getting to Hong Kong. Oh, not very late, Miss Herr Fletcher. These typhoons are terrible, but very quick. Look, there's Wake Island ahead now. I don't see any signs of a storm anywhere. It's coming from Formosa, he said. The aviation weather reports give a clipper plenty of warning, Earl. They may have a half a day of clear flying weather ahead. But if there is any danger whatsoever of a bad storm crossing their path, they are ordered to remain grounded until all is clear once more. Well, as well as this clipper plane is to ride in, I'll be glad to walk on land again. Sort of get air legs up here. It won't be long now. Oh, look at that pretty lagoon we're going to land in. And look, people are coming to the dock to meet us. You can certainly see good, Earl. Let me look through those glasses. Uh, uh no, they're, they're too strong for your eyes. Oh, everybody always gets excited when we come to a place, especially when it's in the middle of the ocean. Any sign of the typhoon yet? No, monsieur. But I see something else, Barney. Danger? I don't know, but I got a hunch. Look at that plane down there. Boy, a two-seater and built for terrific speed. No familiar identification marks. Barney, that plane looks more dangerous to me than a dozen typhoons. You think the octopus? We'll know soon enough. But watch yourself after we land. Anything can happen way out here in mid-Pacific and be called an accident. p.m. on the 25th of June. The control room of Synchro Burglar Alarms, PTY Limited. The controlman, Ken Prinslow, is making himself a cup of coffee. Suddenly, lights flash on the control panel, throwing a relay. The controlman turns and regards the panel. He turns in time to see the decoder rattle out three figures on the roll of paper fed into it. 
Quickly, he moves to the filing system and turns up the number indicated on the control panel. Then, he dials a phone number. Hello. Mr. Lazard? Speaking. The synchro burglar alarm's here. What, again? I'm afraid so. Look, you got me up three times this week for nothing. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you. Do you want us to report the alarm to the flying squad, or shall we send a serviceman? Send a serviceman. Tell him to please find out the fault. I'm sick of this every night. Please, don't bother me no more. At 23 p.m., the controlman reaches out and throws a switch on the control panel. This is the company's two-way radio. Hello, Des? Yeah? Where are you? Just passing City Deep on the way back to town. I fixed up that false alarm in Germiston. It was the branches of a tree catching the wires in the wind. But what's up now? It's the Capricorn Discount Company. Again? Yeah. Old Lazard wants us to see if we can find the fault. Oh. Okay, I'm on my way. Eleven forty p.m. Desmond Faraday parks his van in President Street, outside the building housing the Capricorn Discount Company. He expects to be greeted by the Bantu night watchman in the foyer of the building, but there's no one about. From recent experience, he knows that there are closed circuits on every other floor except the sixth. When he steps out of the lift on the sixth floor, he's challenged from the darkness. Who's that? Huh? A serviceman from Synchro Alarms. Who uh, are you? Um, Mr. Lazard asked me to have a look at the place on my way home from Pisco. Just to see if everything was okay. I oh, see. Uh, is it? Oh, it seems to be. Everything's locked up and secure. Oh, well, there's a fault somewhere. Just have a look around and check it over. Oh, you snooping yeah. swine! <laughs> And very bright to you, Mr. Synchro. One thirty a.m. on the 26th of June. The Synchro controlman, Ken Brinslow, calls up his colleague, the serviceman, Des Faraday. Hello, Des? Des? Desmond! Uh, all right. We'll try ringing him. If he had, he'd have reported in. No, no, something's up. Police, Constable Velchen speaking. Oh, uh, Synchro Alarms here? Yes? I'm worried about our serviceman. I haven't heard from him since about half past eleven. Well, I've tried to raise him and I can't. And he hasn't reported in. I think there's something wrong. Oh, the address of the premises, please. Capricorn Discount Company, President Street. It's on the sixth floor. All right, we'll send somebody right away. Well, this is the address Control gave us. Can't understand why there's no night watch for them. Place is wide open. Ah, you, you got your torch. Yeah, you are, Sergeant. All right, let's see. That's better. Wait a minute. It doesn't look healthy, does it? No, Sergeant. What's that sticking out of his back? It's a... It's a screwdriver, Sergeant. Good. Hold the light steady. Let's, let's have a look at him. He, is he dead, Sergeant? Not yet. Pulse is very weak, though. I'll stay with him. You tell Control what's happened and get him to send an ambulance. All right, Sergeant. 2.25 a.m. The wounded, still unconscious serviceman is borne on a stretcher into the lift 
and descends to street level where an ambulance is waiting to receive him. Two CID men, Detective Sergeant Frank and Detective Constable Willemser, have arrived from John Forster Square to take charge of the investigation into the robbery and the attempted murder. Also on the scene, wearing a thick jersey and an overcoat on top of his pajamas, is the managing director of the Capricorn Discount Company. Four times they phoned me. That's four times, including tonight. So, of course, I think it's another false alarm. And look at the place. Cleaned me out. What happened to the night watchman? Surely you have one? Yeah, disappeared. Should be on the door downstairs all the time. Mm. Constable. Yes, Sergeant? Go downstairs and have a look around for the night watchman. Good night, Sergeant. Yes, and if you find him, tell him he's fired. He can go. After I've spoken to him. Right, Sergeant. I reckon you'll be needing this. This is what was sticking out of the serviceman's back. Screwdriver. I use my handkerchief. Good. Thanks. We'll subject this to an intensive fingerprint search and microphotography. Might heal something. Oh, Mr. Lazard. Yeah? You say you've been called out four times. Uh, what do you mean exactly? Four times this week. Started on Sunday night, then again on Monday and on Tuesday. Last night I can sleep. But tonight they call me out again. False alarms? Oh, they all seem to be. What caused the alarm to go off on the three previous occasions? Uh, they thought it was a fault, but they were not able to find it. Oh, I see. You think that the three false alarms had anything to do with tonight? Uh, how should I know? But it seems funny. Well, I'd be much obliged, Mr. Lazard, if you'd check your stock and let me know exactly what is missing. All right, yes. Uh, I will go and phone my manager. Well, there's no hurry. In the morning, we'll do fine. I'm going down to see if Constable Willem, sir, has found your night watchman. Constable. We're back here, Sergeant. Uh, the night watchman. I reckon so. Can you wake him? Well, that's what I've been trying to do ever since I found him. He's as drunk as a lord. Did you find the bottle with him? Uh, yes, Sergeant. Now he's going to take some sobering up. Any suggestions, Sergeant? No, I'll leave that to you. I'm going up to the hospital, so there's no hurry. I'm anxious to talk to the burglar alarm man who was stabbed. He's probably undergoing an operation, so I won't be able to talk to him until he comes round from the anesthetic. If he comes round. The detective sergeant is advised of the serviceman's condition on his arrival at the hospital by the doctor who performed the emergency operation. He's a very lucky youngster. The screwdriver penetrated the chest cavity between the third and fourth ribs. It missed an important artery by a matter of half an inch. Oh. Had that been severed, he would have bled to death in a matter of a few seconds. Instead, the point of the screwdriver penetrated the left lung. It was a terrific blow he received with it. The wound was only just short of emerging from the patient's chest. It must have gone in up to the hilt. Yeah, the screwdriver, that is. Does it have a big handle? Yes. Mm, I thought so. The handle hit the spinal column between the third and fourth vertebrae. I very much fear that the damage there is much more serious than that sustained by the lung. No meaning, Doctor? The lower half of his body may well be paralyzed. Do you feel well enough to answer one or two questions? Yeah, okay. Did you see who did it? No, uh, no, not properly. He was standing in the dark. I got out of the lift and I, I couldn't see, just having stepped out from the light. Did you know there was somebody there? Well, as soon as he spoke, I did. What did he say? I think he got a fright when the lift doors opened. He said something like, what's that or who's that? Did you wonder who he was? Yeah. I asked him who he was and he said that Mr. Lazard had asked him to pop in on his way home from the bicycle. So you presumed he was something to do with the business? Yeah. Did he actually use the name Lazard? Yeah. That's what made me think everything was okay. Mm -hmm. You see, I'd been to the place three times this week with the old man, Lazard, there. Uh -huh. <clears throat> but I'd never met any of the other staff there. 
So it's someone who knows the Capricorn Discount Company well enough to be acquainted with the managing director's name. Uh, um, any impressions of this man, uh, the man who stabbed you? Well, uh, only that I seem to think he was tall. I don't know why. Anything about the voice? Yeah, I'd know it anyway. I'll never forget it. What sort of voice was it? Uh, rough? Well-spoken? I don't know how you'd describe it. Quite a nice voice, really, I suppose. Well, this might sound odd, but was there any sort of distinctive smell associated with a man, uh, say, an aftershave lotion? No. no, I don't think so. Anything else? Any other impressions? No. It's almost midday when Detective Sergeant Frank returns to the Capricorn Discount Company's premises. Well, Constable Willem, sir. He's feeling very sorry for himself, Sergeant, but he's well enough to talk to. Where is he? He's lying down in the yard here, Sergeant. A silly fool. What's he had to say for himself? Uh, complains, mostly. Says he has too much bubble ass. It certainly looks that way. How are you, my boy? How about it? Bubbleless. No, I don't expect any sympathy here. What happened to you? Too much pusa, my boy. Yes, yes, I know, but where did you get it from? It's the, the, the big boss give it to me. Which big boss? That one was here before. Three times he's coming here. When? At night time, my boss. What did he want? He is, he is here to look around. He promises much money at the end of the week. No, I think you had that. Did he tell you to drink this whole bottle of brandy? Yes, my boss. Yeah, lucky a bubble ass is all you've got. You could have died. <laughs> but, uh, hey, you've been a fool, my boy. Mr. Lazard is going to fire you. The boss has already fired me, sir. Didn't you know that the big boss, as you call him, was going to steal Mr. Lazard's property? Yes, but, but they promised me much money. They? There's two others. How did they come? In the big van, boss. Well, my boy, the bad news is that you're under arrest. Me, my boss? Why? You're an accessory before the fact. You helped the men. Oh, boss. Yeah, that's right. And all you've got for your trouble is a king-size hangover. <laughs> Detective Sergeant Frank and Detective Constable Willem, sir, sift the evidence at their disposal in a CID office at John Forster Square. Three men with a van, a Bantu night watchman who could and will, if we ever find him, prove helpful as an identification parade. And Desmond Faraday might be able to help us there as well. He remembers that the man who struck him down had what seemed to be a nice voice. He had the impression that his assailant was a big man whom the night watchman had never seen before this week. And the same big man obviously knew that there was a Mr. Lazard attached to the discount company. Yes, that seems significant. Oh, there's the brandy bottle with the fingerprints other than those belonging to the night watchman. And it bears the label of the bottle store from where it was purchased, the Albion in Bramfontein. No, that might be significant too, the area. Did Mr. Lazard compile a list of the stolen stuff? No, yes, Sergeant, along with quantities and values. Uh, here. Oh, thanks. Detective Sergeant Frank. Uh, afternoon, Sergeant. Uh, Pretoria here, Bureau of Standards. Well, we have a report on that screwdriver which was sent over here this morning. It's a Vulcan 8-inch standard type, imported from America. Uh, no fingerprints. Blast. Uh, but when it was subjected to chemical tests, uh, traces of animal fat were discovered. Animal fat? Yes. Uh, there was a considerable amount of it around the shaft and in the socket of the hand. What sort of animal fat? Beef and pork. Then is the screwdriver from a butcher's? That's what we thought at first. But if it were a butcher's screwdriver, wouldn't you expect to find mutton fat too? Mm, that's true. What about an abattoir? Possibly, but they slaughter sheep, too. Mm. Did your chemical tests reveal anything else? Well, the source of the fat seemed to be the socket in the handle that we took the shaft out. There was a considerable deposit of animal tissue, none of it human. 
Uh, we've managed to isolate cows and pigs. Is the tissue old or new? Both. Can you put a date on the oldest deposit? Yes, yes, a carbon test fixes it at three years. Ah, and the newest stuff? Just a matter of days. All right, Mr. Cooper. Is that the lot? Yes. Yes, I've already sent the screwdriver back to you. Oh, thank you. Cheerio. You look worried, Sergeant. I'm trying to figure out where and how a screwdriver would be used. So you came into contact with beef and pork carcasses. Butchers? That's possible. Unlikely, though. No mutton fat. Same applies to an abattoir. Well, what about a chef in a kitchen somewhere? Same thing applies. There aren't many kitchens. I was going to say that don't have mutton or lamb about, but I suppose some of the plushier high-class restaurants would qualify. Would they? Possible. But a screwdriver? You don't cut meat with a screwdriver? Oh, that's for sure. Ah, cold storage place. Or a meat processing factory. They handle mutton, don't they, Sarge? There's one way to find out. Compile a list of all such firms on the reef and go visit it. Now, pork we don't have. We can't show. Yeah, we've got all three. Beef, pork and mutton. We specialize in pork sausages and ham. Maybe a little bit of bacon sometimes. No beef. Si, sir, no mutton here. We make a process to meat, salami, sausages and ham. Anybody else along the Vitvatis one manufactures exactly what you do? It's not that I know of. If there is, a, they're not big enough to be competition for us. Eh? Have you ever seen this screwdriver before? How can I be sure? A screwdriver is a screwdriver, eh? Which of your employees would use such a tool? Uh, electrician, maintenance man. I, uh, I wonder if you could arrange for me to see your men working unobserved. Oh, see. When, when you want to do this? This afternoon. Sure. The two detectives bring the Bantu night watchman Samson Butulese to the premises of Apollo Meat Processing Brantham Team. They stand in an office which overlooks the working area. Not bother last now, are you? No, my boss. Right. Uh, I want you to look through this window and tell me whether you recognize anybody. Yes, my Oh, well, go on then. Yes. Well? No, sir. Oh, blast it. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Yes, yes, what is it? That one has just come in the overalls, down beside the big machine. He is the one. He's promising me money. Uh-huh. This one's name is a mayor. He's something of a comic. He get up and sing at the drop of a hat, eh? What does he do around the place? He's an electrician. Uh, are you sure that's him, Samson? Yes, my boss. He must be definitely. Right. Uh, are you going to arrest No, him? no. We'll keep him under surveillance. That way, there's the chance of him leading us to the other two and the goods. Uh, where does this mayor character live? Hmm, I can't tell you now, but uh, tell you what, I go have a look in the records, huh? A bottle of brandy ties up, Sergeant. The Albion bottle stores in Brown Pantine, too. And the singing would account for the nice voice. The Samson? What? You realize you could be making too much trouble for this man if you're mistaken? No, I'm not mistaken, my boss. He is the one. He gives me bubbles and plenty nonsense. Uh, see, I've got here. He's live in Melville. Full address? The one the five the six the second avenue. The address turns out to be that of a boarding house, as the two detectives discover when they visit the premises in disguise. Yeah. Routine check on the number of Bantu residing on the premises. Oh. Well, let me see. There's three, I think. Elsie, keep that kid quiet, man! You can't hear yourself think someone's always racket going on. Uh, where do they live? Who, Elsie and the kid? Oh, no, the Bantu. Oh, out in the back. Well, just go and have a look. Yeah, help yourself. We've nothing to hide. I'll be upstairs if you want me. What do you think, Sarge? All that stuff that was pinched from Lazard's place was bulky. Van load of stuff. It would need a garage or something to hide it in. Let's go take a look. Our building's as clean as a whistle, Sarge. But what about inside? No, no, they wouldn't. A lot of stuff coming into a place like this would be seen and commented on. They wouldn't risk it. 
It's probably with one of Mayer's accomplices. Well, how do we find out who they are? Just keep Mayer under surveillance. He's bound to go calling sooner or later, or they'll call on him. Five days later, Detective Sergeant Frank and Detective Constable Willem, sir, are part of a squad of men commanded by Lieutenant Johan van Mulen, detailed to raid an address in Linmayer. And uh, Mayer's inside, is he? Yes, sir. He arrived with another man. Does the other man live here? No, sir. The house is rented by some people called Tomaselli. He doesn't seem to work. He's always at home, sir. <laughs> All right, I'll knock at the front. And you and Detective Constable Willem, sir, cover the back. Very good, sir. Open up, police! All set, brother, sir? Yes, sir. Can you see the windows on that side? Yes. Come on, open this door. Watch it. Here they come. All right. Police. That's enough. You're under arrest. Just stand where you are. Keep your hands well away from your side. Frisk him, Willem, sir. All right, Sergeant. All right, copper. Now let me go. You shoot and your man gets it first. He's got me in an arm lock, Sergeant. Come on, Mayor. Don't be a fool. This will get you nothing. Get me away from you. Watch it, Sergeant. He's got a gun. And he knows how to use it, too. Get down, Sergeant. Uh, uh, now drop that gun. Drop that gun. Do as I say or your pal gets it. Uh, don't worry about me, Sergeant. You shut your mouth. Uh, sir, round the back. No! Nobody can help you, mister. You're going with me. What's all the fuss here? He grabbed Willem, sir, sir. But we don't want any trouble. Enough's enough. Fool, we can all get away. But for how long, Jack? Where do we go? Come on with me. I'll see you right. Not a chance. You've messed up the whole business. We can't even get rid of the stuff we've pinched. Never mind that now. It was very nearly a murder charge, Mayor. Don't do anything foolish now. I don't think you're in any position to dictate to me. I'm leaving with our friend here. If there's any attempt made to follow, he gets it. He's bluffing, sir. No! Thought I told you to shut up. Now stand up straight and move. Nice and easy. Any attempt to come anywhere near me and this copper gets it. Come on, copper, are you coming with oh, me? Oh, wait a minute. No, Sergeant. He means it. Let him go. Nice and easy now. Then nobody gets hurt. <laughs> forces the detective constable into the car parked at the front of the house. Right. Get him behind the wheel. Nice and easy. That's the idea. And I get in the back. They'll come for you. They won't bother about me. I hope for your sake that you're wrong. Now drive. Come on, let's go. Well, where to? I don't know yet. Just get us a long way away from here. And I, sir? Well, get these two kettles in the van and we'll arrange a reception party for Mr. Mayer. Roadblock, sir? Yeah. What Mayer said didn't sound like threats to me, sir. And do you have another suggestion? I wouldn't worry about Constable Villain, sir, if I were you, sir. He's a very resourceful character. Well, there's a soft street ahead. Where do you want me to go? Turn left. All right. And don't try anything fancy. This gun's pointed at the back of your head. You're being a fool. You know that, don't you? Shut up and drive. Left, you said? That's right, and hurry it up. Hey, what, what are you doing? Why are you reversing? You'll see. The, the wall! My, my mind, where are you going? What the devil do you think you're doing? so quickly. Detective Constable Willem, sir, suddenly throws the car into reverse. Mayer, expecting the car to move forward and to the left, is thrown off balance. The motion of the car causes him to bang his head on the driver's seat. This gives Detective Constable Willem, sir, the advantage he needs. 
Disregarding Mayor's shouts, he directs the car backwards at a high brick wall. After the inevitable collision, during which Mayor again hits his head and drops the gun he's holding, there's a sudden roar as spilt petrol ignites. It's on fire! Get out! I got the, the door jammed. Come on, get out! Don't leave me! Hey, come on, Anne, over the seas. Come on, hurry up! We can give you a hand. Here. Come on, look over! I am. The petrol tank will be going soon. For heaven's sake, hurry up! Come on, on your feet! Now run! The blast of the explosion threw the two men onto their faces in the roadway. Neither was seriously hurt. Mayer was so shaken by the fact that he'd narrowly escaped death by burning that Detective Constable Willemser had no difficulty in effecting an arrest. At the subsequent trial, it was learned that Mayer had purchased goods from the Capricorn Discount Company. That was how he discovered the name of the managing director. He also took the opportunity of acquainting himself with the layout of the business. Samson Butulese, having turned state's witness, received a suspended sentence. The other three, Wilfred Brunt, Henry Lampton and John Mayer, were sent to prison for periods varying between three and ten years. The burglar alarm serviceman is in a wheelchair to this day. He will never walk again. They prowl the empty streets at night, waiting in fast cars, on foot, living with crime and violence. These men are on duty 24 hours out of every 24. They face dangers at every turn, expecting nothing less. They protect the people of South Africa. These are the men of Squad Cars. Listen again next Friday evening to another authentic story in our dramatic South African police series, Squad Cars, brought to you by General Motors. Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is... The lineup. Now we can sit right here, Mr. Hunter. How many men will we look at? Mm, 31 altogether. Our man probably won't be any of these, but may we want to cover every possibility. Please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention? Thank you, my name is Graham. Sergeant Matt Graham, I'll explain the latter. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, then name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner. As I call his name. Please be prompt with your questions or identifications. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get an answer. Don't avoid, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Bring on the line. All right. Come on. Move it up to the end of the stage. Right on up to the end. That's right. Now turn and face front hands to your sides and look straight ahead. Now when I ask you questions, talk up so the people in the back can hear you. All right, number one, John Nathan, robbery, face front, talk up. Where do you live, John? 66 on River Street. What's that? Siemens Hotel. Don't look at me, look right out front so the people can see you. What do you do, John? Chief's cook. Anybody arrested with you? No. Any weapons? Yes. Pistol, wasn't it? Yes, sir. What kind of pistol? Uh, 32, I think. 38, I know. Yes, sir. You have a car? Yeah, Chrysler. Well, sedan, a coupe or what? Sedan. What color? Black. Okay. Number two, David Moore, a soap. Where do you live, David? 205 South New York. Can't hear him, Matt. Now, look, I don't want to tell you boys again. It's a long way to the back of the room, so you got to talk. Come on, now. Where do you work, David? The fisherman's son. What do you do? What's your work? Tom. Your landlady says you hit her. 
Yes, sir. With what? A hot plate. Something you cook on? Uh, yes, sir. I was cooking. She said I was smelling up the building. Why did you hit it? Oh, it's a long story, Sergeant. You'd have to know my landlady. Okay, number three, Ivan Cyberling, drunk and disorderly. Any of these men, Mr. Hunter? No. no. Great Park, 644 North Orchard, Great Park. Don't tell me. Tell the people out there. Yeah. What do you do, Ivan? Construction engineer. You were pretty drunk. Yes, sir. The arresting officer said he's had complaints before. Yes, sir. She has complained for a week. Who's she? My wife. You live at 644 North Hudson? Yes, sir. The report says you broke a window at that address. The door was locked. I broke one other night, too, when she locked me out. I will keep right on breaking them until she leaves the door unlocked. Maybe you'd better stop drinking. Yes, sir. Any questions or identifications from the audience? How about it, Mr. Hunter? Number two was picked up in your neighborhood. No. Any questions or identifications from the audience? We'll look at the next bunch. Nothing, Matt. All right. All right, run them off. Bring on the next line. Cup of coffee, Mr. Hunter? Thank you. Now we won't keep you much longer. There you are. Thank you. Sergeant Greb should be here any minute now. Hi. Uh, this is Mr. Hunter, man. Sergeant Greb. Well, how do you do, Mr. Hunter? Sergeant, grab a chair, man. Thanks. Hey, I voted for you in the last election, Mr. Hunter. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, didn't you spot anybody in the line at all? No, I didn't. Coffee, man? Uh, no, no, thanks. Mr. Hunter can't think of anybody who'd want to kill him. And you can't remember seeing anybody suspicious hanging around your house? No, no, I, I can't, Sergeant. Well, none of your neighbors saw anybody either. Uh, here's a report from the lab. The bomb was a time bomb. Found pieces of an old alarm clock. From the size of the explosion, must have been about eight or ten sticks of dynamite. <laughs> sure lucky you and the family were in the back of the house. Very lucky. Now, we'll do our best to catch whoever it was, sir. Well, probably just a crank. A man like myself, politic. Public figure makes a lot of enemies for one reason or another. Maybe this one didn't vote for me last election, Sergeant. <laughs> Come think of it, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, we may want to talk to you again, sir. Oh, pardon me. Guthrie. Yeah. Oh, yeah? How long ago? Anyone hurt? Right, sure. Another bombing. What? Friend of yours, Councilman Adams. Well, was he hurt? Yeah, both he and his wife. They're in the hospital. They've got a child. No, the child's all right. Ruined the house. Were Adams and his wife hurt badly? Well, I don't know. Ambulance took him away. I'll have to check with the hospital. Uh, this is awful. Everybody should certainly be warned. Well, they will be, including the mayor. We'll put a man with you and your family, Mr. Hunter. In the meanwhile, we'll go and look at Mr. Adams' house. <laughs> Thinks maybe he saw the guy who planted the bomb. Oh, well, let's go talk to him. Uh, go over and talk to Chief Anderson, Matt. See what he's got to say about the damage. Sure. Yeah. This man's a neighbor. His name's Crump. Uh, Mr. Crump. Hey, yes, Sergeant? Uh, this is Lieutenant Guthrie. Oh, Hi, Mr. Crump. Oh, glad to meet you, Lieutenant. Uh, let's move over here where we can talk. All right. That's good. All right. Now, uh, tell the Lieutenant just what you told me, Mr. Crump. Well, at about 4.30, I was working in my backyard mowing the lawn, and I, I saw Mrs. Adams get into her car and drive out of the garage. Well, about a, an hour later, I went around front to get the hose, and I, I saw an old truck pull up across the street. I saw a man get out, kind of a, an old man, you know, old clothes. And he went around the, the back of the truck and took out something that looked like a box. It was about, to, oh, about this big, I guess. Yeah. Then he headed for the Adams' house. A couple hours later, I was sitting in my living room, and I, I saw Mr. and Mrs. Adams pull up in front of their house and go in. A little while later, my wife and I were having dinner, and the, uh, the explosion happened. Busted most of the windows in our house. 
I didn't think about the old guy with the box until I found out what had happened tonight. I, I remembered reading about this other bombing yesterday. Figured that box the old guy was carrying might have been the bomb. Yeah, I see. Um, can you remember what this old guy looked like? Well, uh, uh, maybe if I, uh, if I saw him again. Mm-hmm. And what kind of a truck was he driving? Oh, it's a real old one, really beat up at an old Ford or Chevy. You know, one of those uh, pickups. What did you say? I said you didn't get the license number. Oh, no. Why would I get it? I didn't even think anything about it until after the explosion. Well, um, if you saw him again, do you think you might recognize him? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. But all right, thank you very much, Mr. Crump. We'll keep in touch with you. Oh, glad to help. Glad Fine. To help. Get Mr. Crump's phone number and anything we might need. Right. I'll be up with Matt. Okay. Matt. Yeah. Oh, Chief. Come on, Guthrie. What a mess, huh? Yeah. Bomb to all that? Bomb and the fire. Used more dynamite than the last time. Blew this room sky high. Oh, oh watch out for the glare. Yeah. The center of the explosion was right about here. Uh-huh. Probably walked up to the side of the house, stuck the bomb into that opening in the foundation. Surprised nobody saw him. Well, somebody thinks he did. Well, you better catch this boy. He hasn't killed anybody yet. He's trying pretty hard. Paper says snow. How'd you make out with Crump? Nothing. He looked through the whole mug file, not a thing. <laughs> I talked to the hospital this morning. The Adams is it going to be all right. No luck on that old Ford pickup? Uh-uh. Why don't you turn up the heat? Oh, okay. Say, yeah, I'll bet we get a blizzard. We do, you know. <laughs> Guthrie? Oh, that's yeah. Yeah. And what was he wearing? Uh-huh. Well, that sounds like him. We'll be right down. Well, maybe we got the bomber. Yeah? Twenty minutes ago, picked up a man wearing old coveralls and a dirty leather jacket coming out of the state building. Spotted him. Followed him three blocks before they grabbed him. He's climbing into an old Ford pickup with 30 sticks of dynamite in the back of the truck. <laughs> Set, man? Yeah, Ben. I got Crump sitting out front. How many men are you going to show? Three besides the suspect. Oh, okay. I'll go sit with Crump. Hello, Mr. Crump? Hello. Oh, oh Lieutenant Guthrie, I couldn't see. Yeah, well, uh, we want you to look at some suspects. Oh, that's that's what Sergeant Grab said. Yeah, we think one of them might be the man who planted the bombs. Well, I hope I can help. All right, Ben, run them on. Yes, sir. Lights. Bring them on, Frank. Come on, move out to the interstate. Come on. Get on the line. Are you all got on coveralls and leather jackets. I'll take a good look. All right, uh, now. Ten the man on the end, Lieutenant. Yeah, what about him? Yeah, that's the man, no doubt about it. I, I remember right, better than I thought I would. He's the one that got out of the truck, all right, the, the one with the box. All right, Matt, run him off. Yes, that's all. I'm off. Well, we'll need a statement from you, Mr. Crump. Oh, sure. Um, what were the others arrested for? They weren't, Mr. Crump. Three others were police officers. Edmund O'Brien, who plays the title role in yours truly, Johnny Dollar, will be on his latest case tomorrow night over most of these same CBS stations. In one of his most thrilling investigations, Johnny Dollar goes to London to join forces with the men from Scotland Yard in the hatchet house theft matter. How that London trip had Johnny Dollar's famous old expense account. Don't miss Johnny Dollar on Wednesdays. It's going to be a tough nut. Arresting officers couldn't get a thing out of him. We've got men over there talking with people in the state building. So far, nobody remembers seeing them come in. Yeah. Name's Lewis Black, huh? Yeah, driver's license gave his address at 1910 East Flower. 
Ash is over there now, checking. I wonder what he was doing in the state building. Yeah, I'm worried, too. I wonder if... Oh, no. No, he couldn't have. A big building. I hope you're right. Hello, Lewis. I'm Lieutenant Guthrie. This is Sergeant Grimm. Quinn? Yeah. We'll see you upstairs. Right. Sit down, Lewis. I want to talk to you about these bombings. We know you made those bombs. A man saw you walk up to the Adams house with one of them. It's sheer cold in here. Yeah, it started to snow. That's right, that's right. Why don't you tell us about it? Well, I made him, sure. Why? I made him. I don't have to tell you why. You put one of them on the George Hunter's house. Do you know him? No, he is. But you don't know him personally? No. Did you know Adams? No. Well, then why try to kill him? Isn't there a heater in here or something? I've been out of work. Been out of work long? Yeah. Hunter or Adams have something to do with it? <laughs> you sure want to know why I made those bombs, don't you? We'd like to know. It's no fun being out of work. I've been out of work for a long time. You ever been out of work? Yeah. Well, then you know it's no fun. You trying to get a job? Oh, sure. I couldn't. I kept trying. Just couldn't get one. Look, do we have to sit in here? It's really getting kind of cold. We'll get out of here as soon as you tell us about but it. Don't try to push me. I don't like being pushed around. I can stand it down here just as long as you can. We're not trying to push you. No? No. We don't like this any better than you do. It's just a job. If it weren't us, it'd be somebody else. Okay. If you had a job, you'd try to do it the best you could, wouldn't well, you? Well, sure. I used to have jobs all the time. I always did the best I could. What kind of jobs did you have? Oh, all kinds. I was minor once. I worked in Pennsylvania. Is that where you're from, Pennsylvania? Yeah, I did all kinds of jobs once, and I couldn't get it to nobody. Give me a job. That's the trouble. It's not enough jobs. I've got to do something about getting jobs from people. Ah, a bunch of dirty politicians. They don't worry about guys. I mean, they make speeches, sure. Yeah, they get elected. They don't do nothing. Like Adams and Hunter. You're darn right, Adams, Hunter, a whole bunch. Even the mayor. Sure, the mayor. And the governor. He's the worst one of the bunch. He's the biggest. He could do something if he wanted to, but he don't. I ain't had a job in three years. You'd like to take care of him like you did Adams and Hunter, wouldn't you? Uh, 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 I'm not going to tell you anything. You think I'm going to tell you something, don't you? But I'm not. What were you doing in the state building? Why don't you try and find out? Look, Lewis... We don't want you to get into any more trouble than you're already in, I don't so... want to talk anymore. I want to go back to my cell. I'm cold. You can go back to your cell as soon as you talk. Oh, Lieutenant, can I see you a minute? Yeah, come on. Sergeant, can we have some heat in here? I'm cold. Then we've got a janitor upstairs from the state building. He remembers seeing Louis Black come into the building by the side entrance. He says Black was carrying a big box. Holy. Look, see that the state building's cleared as fast as possible. Rope off the street. Step on it. Right. Lewis, I just found out that you planted a bomb in the state building. I don't care what you found out. I'm not going to tell you. I'm tired of playing with you. Where's that bomb? Where did you put it? Oh, sugar, you can do anything you want. Get rough. Beat me. I won't tell you where I put that bomb. Well, at least tell us when it's set to go off. What time is it? It's uh, six minutes to five. You won't find it. How much time? Mm, about 40 minutes, I guess. <laughs> Everybody's out of the building. You find out where he put it? No, he wants it to go off. We got him over in the car with Walter and Asher. They'll keep working on him. Uh, it's army car. Captain Phillips, demolition expert. I'm Phillips. And Guthrie, hope we can use you. Know what kind of a bomb it is? Quiet, I'll tell you all we know. We've got to get into that building and try to find it. Uh, uh, 30 men are there now covering every floor. Who's in charge? Harrison, he's in the basement. Come on, man. What time is it? We've got about 25 minutes, more or less. Any luck? Uh, not yet, Lieutenant. Harrison's still in the basement? Yeah, yeah, he's down upstairs. Thanks. All right, all right, they'll be sure to check it out. Yeah. We'll take it thorough now. Harrison. Yeah, over here, Ben. Well, any luck? No. How much time we got? Less than 25 minutes. What orders did you give? Well, if the bomb's found, it's to be taken directly to the street. 
We've still got any time left. The car will drive it to a safe place. That army man get here? Yeah. Well, this is the way I want it to go. It's uh, 5.13 by my watch. I set your watch. Right. Now, at exactly 5.25, order your men out of here. Tell them they've got ten minutes to get clear. We'll go tell the rest on the other floors. All right, Ben. All right, men. Come on. Let's come to the stairs. Check that out. Can you run an elevator, man? Well, sure. I'll take the second floor. I'll take the ordinance, third, fifth, and so on. Be sure they set their watches with yours. Right, Ben. Sergeant. Yes, sir? You got a watch? Yes, sir. Set it with mine. Five seconds. It'll be 5.14.35. Now, okay, have all your men off this floor by 525. 525, yes, sir. Ben. 525. Everybody's out. Yeah. Well, what do we do? That's a good question. Black wasn't lying. We've got something like ten minutes. Man. Yeah? Go out to the car and get Black. But... Huh? Go out and get Black. Maybe the last thing I do, but I'm going to find out where that bomb is. Who's going to watch Black while you get it? I'll worry about that when I get to it. Uh-uh, I'm staying. Okay, I can't argue. How about it, Black? You want to tell us where it is? You never find it. What time is it? 5.28. Ah, oh, you can't scare me. You think if you keep me here, i tell you where the bomb is, eh? About five minutes, sir. I guess so. You're not very smart, are you? I said 40 minutes. Well, maybe 40, but maybe not. I can't be sure. Might go off in a second. I guess so. Ah, who are you kidding? You won't stay in here. You're scared. Listen, Black, you're darn right we're scared. But so help me, you're going to tell us where that bomb is or it's going to blow all of us sky high. Now shut up unless you want to tell us. I'm not afraid to die. You're going to have a chance. Eight stories in this building. Yeah. If it's too far away, we may not have time anyway. Let me out of here. I'm not going anywhere. You're going to stay right here until you tell us where it is. Tell you I won't. Well, I won't. Five twenty-nine. Black, you're not doing anything but wrecking a building and killing yourself. You can't get the governor. He's been taken can't out. Can't make me tell you. Okay, okay. How much dynamite's in that bomb, Lewis? Fifty sticks. Hope you guessed right about the time. Ben? Yeah? I told you what's no. Oh. Gonna be a big one. Lewis, why don't you tell us? I can stand it if you can. 5.30. All right, all right, all right. Show us. All right. Step on it. How much time is it? Not much. Can you stop it? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, where, where? It's up there. On top of the big pipe. You see in the back? How did you get up there? Here yeah, with the ladder. Uh, Where's the ladder? Everything's been moved. Forget yeah. the ladder. Show us the spot. Yeah. Right about here. Give him a booster. Come on, come on. Put your foot in my hand. Where did you go? Oh, no, I'm scared. No wonder we couldn't find it. You see it? Yeah, yeah. Well, grab it. Hand it down. Okay. Stretch it out. Let it go off. We don't care. We might not have time to stop. Can I tear off these boards without setting it yeah, off? Yeah, yeah. Well, explain it to me while I rip them off. I don't know. I don't remember. Please, let's get out of here. If you want to get out of here alive, yeah. you better remember. Well, this is dynamite. It's an old alarm clock. It's batteries and breakers. Uh, the alarm goes off and causes the circuit to batteries. <laughs> okay. Now, take it apart. No, 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 no. Let me get out of here. You're going to stay all right here. The floor is all over you. Now, you settle down. Come on, Lewis. Tell me. Tell me what to do. The wires from the battery to the dynamite pull them loose. Please? Yes, yes, yes. Those. Okay. Now, you sure that does it? Yes. All right. Let's get 
get it out to the street. Can you make it all right, then? Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's go. All right, Lewis. It would have. Oh. It was. It would have. Ben. I may be. Uh, I may be late to the station in the morning. I'm going to take my alarm clock and throw it as far as I can. Before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again an hour earlier, a week from next Thursday, when we will again bring you The Lineup. May I have your attention, please? Lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Guthrie and Wally Mayer as Sergeant Matt Greb, is written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Howard McNear was heard as Lewis Black. Featured in tonight's cast were Jim Backus, High Everback, Sidney Miller, Peter Leeds, Joe Duval, and Harry Lang. The Lineup is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> Beginning next week, the lineup will be heard on a new day at a new hour, Thursday nights at 9 o'clock Eastern Daylight Saving Time. This is Dan Coverly inviting you to join us July 5th, a week from next Thursday, when we will again bring you The Lineup. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To your FBI, you look for national security. And to the Equitable Society, for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight, the story of a crime against the community. Bank robbery. According to the 19th century German philosopher, Frederick Nietzsche, only the weak man is moral. The strong man, the superior man, is above morality. As the basis of the Nazi religion of the Superman, this philosophy produced a nation of gangsters. It can make a criminal out of any human being who permits his ego to feed upon it. Tonight's case is the story of a young man who made the Nietzsche philosophy his religion a highly intellectual youth with an extraordinary educational background. He was precocious as a child, cynical as an adolescent. And now, well, our story opens at a cabin resort on a lake in northern Illinois. It is nearly sundown. Philip Houston and his young bride of a week are strolling along the lake shore. It's going to be a lovely sunset, Philip. The storm would be even more beautiful. You know, nature is never more beautiful than when she's angry. When the thunder rolls and rumbles, and crashes, and lightning cuts a gash across the sky. And the wild wind and rain beat against the house and smash trees to earth. And swollen streams become raging torrents. And leap over their banks. And crush everything in their way. Phil. Yes. 
I love storms, too. That's part of what I've been talking to you about the oh. past three days. The beauty of power, of force. Remember what I've said? Remember? To annihilate that which is weak, imperfect, ugly, and to build instead that which is strong, perfect, beautiful. And that then makes the act of annihilation itself beautiful. Yes. Look, Skippy's come down to the shore to meet us. Well, hello, Skippy fella. How are you? Oh, you're that silly Della? looking animal I ever saw. Della. Uh, yes? You might as well test yourself right now on a very important lesson. What do you mean, Phil? I've told you, you must have no emotional attachments for anybody or anything. Quiet, Skippy. That kind of love is weakness. It rules the one who indulges it. You must overcome it now. Here, take this pistol. Why? Take it. Phil, you don't mean you're asking me... The strong me to... must be ready and able to inflict suffering or death upon any enemy of his strength. Phil! Shoot that dog, Della. No. You're forgetting the lesson of obedience, too. No, no, Phil, I can't. All right, I can't. give me the pistol. Phil, no, no! <laughs> oh. oh, no, Phil, no. When you've gotten hold of yourself, Della, come on to the cabin. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Shaw. Oh, I, I heard a shot. I thought it came it from... It did. Down. I had to shoot Mrs. Houston's dog. You had to... Oh, but why? I'd like to settle my bill now, Mrs. Shaw. We're leaving before dawn. We have an appointment some distance away. To the disciple of the role of force... That which is an enemy of strength must be annihilated. The dog provoked affection, affection is weakness. Therefore, Philip Houston destroyed the dog. As for the appointment he and Della had some distance away, it is two minutes after nine o'clock the next morning. The Freeport, Illinois National Bank has just opened its doors for business. It is a small bank and only one teller is on duty at the moment. He is counting his supply of currency when he becomes aware of a shadow across the counter and looks up into the muzzle of a pistol. Excuse me, Mr. Teller. Uh, what? Uh, this is a hold-up. Uh, uh, yes, it sort of looks that way. And if you're reaching with your foot for the alarm pedal, don't bother. Oh. Uh, put all your money in this bag. Here. Very well. And don't worry about the rest of the staff. They're under the watchful care of the young lady over there with a the submachine gun. You... you won't get away with this. That's what you've told yourself so often, isn't it? You're envious of my courage to do the thing you've... often been tempted to do yourself. It's the fear of apprehension that keeps most people honest. And put in those tens, too. Very well. Most people are weak, and they make laws to... Make a virtue of their lack of courage. There. All right. Give me the bag. Here you are. Thank you. You've cooperated splendidly. I, I st still say you won't get away with this. Mr. Teller, none of us lives this life forever. But it's far better to live it courageously than cowardly. Philip Houston, the Superman, and his bride escaped with $20,000 in cash plus securities. A few minutes after the robbery, the Chicago office of the FBI was notified, and Special Agent Cameron went to work. At the bank, employees gave him a good description of the couple, but there were no other clues at the scene. Houston had been careful to leave no fingerprints, and no one had seen which way the bandit car left town. With the aid of the local police, Cameron began combing the country over a wide radius. And it was the next afternoon when he reached the lake resort and questioned the owner, Mrs. Shaw. The descriptions check all right, Mrs. Shaw. And you say Philip Houston and his wife left here about dawn the morning of the robbery? Yes, sir. That would have given them time enough to reach Freeport and get set for the robbery, all right? Here's something that might help. 
What's that? Well, after the way he killed that dog, I got suspicious of such a mean man and took down his auto license number. Good for you. It's on this slip of paper. Here it is. Hmm. A Michigan license. Uh, Mrs. Shaw, I'd like to look at the register he signed when they checked in. All right. Oh, but he had me sign for them. Oh? Careful not to leave any fingerprints, wasn't he? Of course. I never thought of that at the time, but... Wait a minute. Yes? When I was cleaning up after they left, I found a book he'd left behind the bed. Must have fallen over without him knowing it. May I... I have it, please? It's right here on the desk. Here you are. Hmm. Ecce homo. I couldn't make head nor tails of it. It's in some foreign language. Mm-hmm. He had a lot of books that didn't make much sense to me, even in English. This but... one's in German. The work of the philosopher Frederick Nietzsche. And it explains a lot about our Mr. Philip Houston. You don't say. Yes. And I'm pretty sure we'll find some fingerprints that might tell us a lot more. That night, Special Agent Cameron contacted the Detroit FBI office and requested a check on the Michigan license number of the bandit car. Also, he airmailed to Washington fingerprints he found in the book. Next morning, there was another bank robbery a hundred miles south of Chicago. And that afternoon, found Houston and Della hiding in the barn of an abandoned farm. Della? Yes? From now on for a while, we'll hide out by day and travel by night. Until we get where we're going. Where are we going, Phil? You'll know when we get there. And after that, we'll take off time for some real fun. But, darling, the police will still be looking for us. And we'll still be outwitting them. Now, you curl up and get some sleep. I'll keep watch. No, I... I'm not sleepy. Della? Yes? Look in this bag. That's over $30,000. I know. Money is power, Della. Power to do whatever you want to do. Go everywhere you want to go. Have everything you want to have. I know, Phil. What I... chance? What what chance would you have for this back home? Huh? Scrubbing and cooking. Scrimping and saving. Moving in a circle that gets tighter and tighter until it chokes the very breath of life out of you. Do you want that? Of course not. No. You and I have got to be free souls. And our freedom is in this bag. It's full now, Della. And it's going to stay that way. Because we're smart enough and strong enough to keep it full. Do you understand? Yes, Phil. Della soon dropped off to sleep, and Philip Houston relaxed with a book. But his Superman self-assurance would have been a little disturbed had he known what was taking place in the Chicago office of the FBI. Cameron speaking. Hello, Cameron. Murphy, Detroit. Oh, hello there. Have you got something on that Michigan license? Yes. It's a 1938 black Buick sedan. Bought two weeks ago from a used car dealer. Mm -hmm. And re-registered under the name of John Weatherford. Any description of Weatherford? It checks with your man, Houston. All right. Motor number? Uh, 6323930. Oh, oh. Got it? 9300. Oh, oh. Right. I'll put out a five state alarm on it right away. Thanks a lot. Busy, Leo? No. What have you got, George? Teletype from Washington. The fingerprints on the book have been identified. Good. They belong to Philip Windsor, who served time in Kansas State Reformatory. And the description is that of so-called Philip Houston. Well, Mr. Windsor better pray for a quick cool spell. His trail's getting hot. We momentarily close the Federal Bureau of Investigation file on Philip Windsor, bank robber. We'll return to this case in just a moment. As you read today's newspapers, you undoubtedly experienced a profound feeling of satisfaction when you noted how quickly America has begun to return to the ways of peace. Already a number of the restrictions that were necessary in time of war have been lifted. 
Others will soon be removed. Business, as well as government, is playing an important role in hastening this return to normal living conditions. And in the forefront of this movement is the management of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. During the war, it was necessary to exclude certain war risks from newly issued life insurance policies. But yesterday, one day after hostilities ended, Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Equitable Society, announced that the society would discontinue effective immediately the war clauses in life insurance policies hereafter issued. This means that Americans, even if now serving in the Army or Navy, can now buy an equitable society policy that contains no restrictions as to war risks. Just as the Equitable Society is alert to peacetime opportunities to improve and liberalize its life insurance services to the public, so its funds will continue to work in ways that benefit the country as a whole. Equitable Society dollars the result of the work, thrift, and savings of the American people will continue to be invested in the great industries which are now converting to peacetime production to provide jobs for our returning servicemen. Yes, by serving its members, the Equitable Society serves America. And now, back to the file on Philip Windsor, Bank Robber. Criminals are not always products of an underprivileged childhood. Many of them had more than comfortable homes, and many of them received the advantages of an excellent education. What caused them to turn to crime? Some started out merely seeking new thrills. Others? Well, let's go on with the story of the young man in tonight's case, whose real identity has been established as Philip Windsor. The FBI now knows that Windsor and his wife are driving a 1938 black Buick sedan, Michigan license. And so far, maybe as a kind of dare, are operating only in the limited area of Illinois. Hi, George. Oh, come in, Leo. Any report from that alarm on Windsor's car? Not yet, but here's a file on him from the Kansas Reformatory. He got ten years for a Kansas robbery, but was paroled after two. Yes, I see thanks to a good family background. His father was a university professor. Uh -huh. In a nutshell, Windsor was a precocious kid who eventually became contemptuous of everything normal and conventional. And overripe for the power philosophy of old Frederick Nietzsche. Exactly. Come in. This teletype just came in. Thanks, Ruth. Well, what is it? A report from Belleville. The police down there found Windsor's Buick in a local garage an hour ago. I see. He left it there to have the motor overhauled and rented a Ford from him to use while the car was being fixed. Hmm. In other words, he just traded cars. Yes. The Belleville police have already sent out an alarm on the Ford. You think Windsor is going out of sight for a while? It looks that way. And the safest place to do that would be at some friend's house. Yes. Let's get a wire off to the Kansas Reformatory. I want to know just who Windsor's friends are. <laughs> It was at about this same time, shortly after dark, that Philip Windsor and his wife, Della, slipped out of a cheap roaming house in East St. Louis, down in southern Illinois, got into the Ford sedan and drove rapidly out of the city and headed north. In a few hours now, Della, we'll be in Chicago. Then what? Then I'll contact my friend Kingston and he'll give us a safe haven for as long as we need it. Personally, Phil... I would like to hurry up and get some of that freedom you were talking about. Well, we have it right now. You call this freedom? Aren't we doing the things we set out to do? Aren't we living our own lives in our own way? I don't call having to hide out by day and slip around by night freedom. And knowing that the police are constantly looking for us. I don't call that freedom either. I don't want to be disappointed in you, Della. Disappointed? I chose you because I thought you had strength and courage. Have I shown anything else? Your behavior right now is a sign of weakness. I'm just tired of running and hiding. That's all part of the game, Della. But we don't call it 
running and hiding. Those are cowardly words. What do we call it, then? This is a game that requires consummate courage, daring, and skill. And in every game, there are offensive moves and defensive moves. Of course, We have but... committed two offensive moves. Now we are meeting the inevitable counterattack with defensive measures. Don't you see? Yes, yes, I see. State Highway Patrol. What do we do? Just keep calm and leave the rest to me. Pull over to the side and stop. Yes, sir. your own car? Yes, sir, my own car. And my own brand new wife. We're on our way home from a little honeymoon trip and we... Let me see your license. Oh, marriage or car license? I don't inspect marriage licenses. All right. My car license is in my bag on the back seat. I'll get it for you. Was I going too fast, officer? I'm not interested in that angle now. Ah, here it is. Here you are, officer. <clears throat> Phil. That's one counterattack repulse, Stella. Yes, one counterattack repulsed. But another was about to form in the FBI Chicago office. It is nearly midnight, and Special Agent Cameron, who went out for a bite of food while waiting for the report from the Kansas Reformatory on Windsor's friends, is re-entering the office. Did that report come in yet, George? Yes, and so did another one. What do you mean? Windsor slugged a highway patrolman who stopped him on the road out of East St. Louis about 9 o'clock. Which way was Windsor headed? Right here, Chicago. What's the report on his friends? After he got out of the reformatory, he corresponded regularly with a Marvin Kingston who was still in. But he's out now. Where? Chicago. And here's the address. Good. Keep your fingers crossed, George. This may be the beginning of the payoff. For three days... FBI agents kept a close watch on Marvin Kingston and his house. But Windsor made no contact with Kingston by person or by phone or by mail. Then on the afternoon of the fourth day, at the corner grocery a block from Kingston's house, an attractive young blonde came out of the store with a small sack of groceries. She spoke to a little girl rolling a doll buggy. Hello, honey. Hello. Do you know where Mr. Kingston lives? Uh-huh, right down there. Well, if you'll deliver this sack of groceries to Mr. Kingston in your doll buggy, I'll give you a whole dime. Do you want to? Sure. Where's the dime? <laughs> Here you are. Thank you. And there are the groceries. And tell your dolly to hold on to them tight now, won't you? Oh, she will. Thank you, honey. Goodbye. Bye. Now, Rosemarie, you hold on to that sack good, like the pretty lady said. Hold on, we're going now. The little girl reached Kingston's house and was about to take the sack from the buggy and start up the front walk when Special Agent Cameron intercepted her. What have you got there, little girl? In the sack? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, it's not mine. It's for Mr. Kingston. Oh. A pretty lady gave me a whole dime to bring it here. Really? Uh Uh-huh. I wonder what's in it. Can I take a look? Well, just one. But you can't have any of whatever it is. (laughs) I promise not to touch anything. All right. Then take just one little peek now. Mm Mm-hmm. Well. Thank you. Now, go ahead and deliver the sack. Agent Cameron watched until the girl had delivered the sack and gone. Then he went up to the house and introduced himself to Marvin Kingston. I'm Special Agent Cameron of the FBI. What do you want with me? There was a message in that sack of groceries from Philip Windsor. What makes you think so? You're on parole, Kingston. Do you want to face a charge of conspiracy? All right, here's a note. Winter wants me to meet him at 8 o'clock tonight at Joe's hamburger stand on Euclid Avenue. But you'll have to stay here. 
The FBI will meet Philip Windsor. At 7.30 that night, several FBI agents joined Cameron and took up positions at various points outside the hamburger stand. Promptly at 8 o'clock, a car drove up and parked half a block away. Philip Windsor and his wife got out, walked to the hamburger stand and went in. The agents saw them order soft drinks. Minutes passed. Windsor grew restless. Finally, at 8.15, he spoke to Della quietly. Something must have gone wrong. I'm sure the little girl delivered the sack with a note. Maybe Kingston wasn't at home to get it. Oh, shall we take a chance and call him? No. Drink your soda. I don't want any more. What are you nervous about? What are you? I'm not nervous. I've never seen you act this way before. I tell you, I'm not... I'm not nervous. Well, I am. I've got a funny feeling. Shut up. And so have Shut you. Shut up, I tell you. Come on, let's get out of here. Where are we going? Let's get out of here, I said. Come on. Go ahead. All right. Come on, back to the car. Phil. What's the matter? Stop where you what? are, both of you, and raise your hands. Not for anybody. Phil! Don't reach for your gun, Windsor. We're the FBI. Phil, don't! Oh, oh, oh. You're his wife, Della? Yes. I... I'm sorry. It didn't have to end this way, you know. Yes, I'm afraid it did. It never could have ended any other way for Phil. Philip Windsor had no respect for law-abiding citizens. He said, It is far better to live courageously than cowardly. And saying that, he showed his contempt for those of us who lead conventional lives. Philip Windsor would have been smart to have looked at the record of this nation at war. Because the courage of conventional ordinary people has been proven on every battlefield. Freedom from tyranny was won on those battlefields for you the law-abiding conventional citizen of the world. And freedom from criminal aggression is being won for you here in America by the special agents of the FBI. The special agents who every day prove he who lives by the sword shall perish by the sword. That's the way the Bible puts it. And the history of the world has shown how right the Bible is. You'll hear the disposition of this case in just a moment. Did you know that in a single battleship of the United States Navy, there are more than 900 electric motors, a thousand different electrical instruments, 1,100 telephones, 1,600 electronic tubes, and a wiring system 1,700 miles long? All that on one battleship. That gives you an idea of the tremendous wartime assignment that the electrical manufacturing industry received from Uncle Sam. Radar, automatic plane pilots, smoke generators, sound detectors, range finders. These are only a few of the thousands of complex electrical products supplied an enormous quantity to our armed forces. So will you join the Equitable Society in a salute to the electrical manufacturing industry and its one million employees? Theirs has been an outstanding job of war production, a credit to the industry and to the American system under which that industry flourishes, and a promise of better living for all of us in the peaceful years to come. For many years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States has regarded electrical manufacturing as a sound and safe field for the investment of Equitable Society funds. So millions of Equitable Society dollars have been invested 
in electrical manufacturing, as well as in scores of other great industries which were mobilized for war production. In wartime, equitable society dollars have been fighting dollars. And at all times, they are security dollars. For you, your home, and your country. After the death of her husband, Della Windsor was convicted for her part in the bank robberies and sentenced to 10 years imprisonment. The incidents used in tonight's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferries. Your narrator was Frank Lovejoy. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for This is Your FBI. Whitehall, one, two, one, two. Pretty, please. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These accurate records are drawn from the actual files of Scotland Yard. They're true in every respect except for the names of the participants, which for obvious reasons have been changed. Research on this exclusive series has been done by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Some of the participants, Donald Rhodes, chief security officer of Heath Row Airport and a former Scotland Yard man. It was a considerable responsibility. Detective Sergeant Vivian Morris of Scotland Yard. I am a suburban housewife. Chief Inspector Robert Sheehan of Scotland Yard's Flying Squad. Step into the Black Museum here with me. I should like to show you something. John? Oh, is that you, Sheehan? Yes, I brought some friends to see you. Yeah, I'll be with you at once. Good afternoon. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson, curator of Scotland Yard's Black Museum. Oh, how do you do? Well, I expect you've come about the relics of the Heath Row affair. All right. Oh, on the table there behind you. All we have. Oh, good. Yes, this one I recognize. Iron bar used by criminals in Heathrow Fair. <laughs> some of my hair still sticking to it. Yes, yeah, some of your blood too, Bob. Makes my head ache yet. Yeah. This is uh... a briefcase carried by the GOC. And here, <clears throat> alterable license plate. Used by the GOC gang. You see, it reads GMU 436. Press the lever, please, John. And hey, presto. It reads CGC 829. Very neat, isn't it? You, of course, don't have the most important souvenir at all here, John. What's that? The half million pound sterling. I think that I should tell you a little about our flying squad. It consists of a large number of motor cars, all wireless equipped, all very fast, and all kept constantly in superb condition. The flying squad is on duty 24 hours a day, a highly mobile force, available on extremely short notice at any point in the entire London area. 
The members of the flying squad are hand-picked, and they're very unusual men. These three are typical. This is Detective Sergeant Nobby Clark of the flying squad. Yes, sir. I was one of Lord Lewis' commandos. I was at Norwich. Oh, yes, and at Gear. Former leading petty officer Dusty Miller of HMS Phoebe. I am 29 years old. I am six foot two and I weigh 14 stone eight. I was welterweight champion of my ship, the light cruiser Phoebe. Detective Sergeant Ray Lawton, the Canadian. I, I'm about the, uh, the only policeman you ever heard of who was once a lion tamer. Uh, in a circus. Like all policemen in Britain, we seldom carry arms. Although I assure you we're quite able to use them effectively should the occasion demand them. British policemen rely on the weapons provided by nature, augmented occasionally, of course, by the issue of stout truncheons or rubber cautions, which I understand the Americans call black jacks, and which are wondrously effective. Our job, you see, is not to shoot criminals, but to bring them to justice, or, if possible, to prevent their depredations. We find our methods rather effective. Well, in June 1948, the great new London airport, London had long since outgrown the famous old Croydon Airdrome, was operating at capacity, although it was still far from completion. My old friend Donald Rhodes, a veteran Scotland Yard man who was chief security officer at Heathrow, came to call on me at the yard. Can't stay away from the old home place, can you, Donald, I asked. I always know where to come for help, Bob. What's the matter? You know the GOC? General officer commanding what? Ancient and honorable brigade of robbers. Oh, Moriarty? Moriarty, Townsend, Inge, Hughes, West, Simmons. Brown, Bennett, <laughs> dozens of names. Yes, I know him. Or know of him, I should say. Big operator. Biggest. Well, his recce people have been looking us over. What's he after? A nice new airplane for himself? Gold. At Heathrow? We transship thousands of pounds in gold, you know. International affairs. Planes fly in, dripping with the stuff. Leave it overnight with us and... Uh, Leave it lying about? We keep it as short a time as possible in our bonded warehouse under guard. Strongest safes in the country. Guarded, of course. <laughs> Try and get past them. Much gold? Plane load at a time. How's he going to do it? Tanks or something at dawn? Oh, he'll be much more clever than that. He always has been. That's why he isn't sewing mailbags at Dartmoor today. How'd you get on to all this? I brought the chap along, one of my mechanics. Like to talk to him? Naturally. Come in, will you, Curran? Yes, sir. This is former Lieutenant John Curran of the Royal Tank Regiment, Bob. Good afternoon, sir. Sit down, Mr. Curran. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, tell Chief Inspector Sheehan about it, will you please, Curran? Well, sir, I've been with Mr. Rhodes for quite some time. The day before yesterday, I received a telephone call from an acquaintance of mine named Edward Mybridge. Where did you know this Mybridge before? We were in prison together, sir. Prison? Well, Mr. Hitler's off flag, 18, in the war. Oh, German prison camp. Yes, sir. I hadn't seen him since we were demobbed and we had a drink together. Oh, let's not waste any time, please, Curran. Oh, no, sir. Well, he telephoned me again yesterday, sir, and... You had another drink? Right, sir. He asked me how I'd like to make a lot of money and the whiskey, and I said, fine. I asked how... He said, passing on some information about Heathrow, how it was run, and the guards, and all that. What sort of looking chap was he? Red hair, squint eye, limps on right leg. Sound familiar to you, Bob? Not as what you call him, Kern. Edward Mybridge, sir? His name's Ginger Johnson in our books. Unmistakable. He's not a nice fellow at all, Kern. I found that out, sir. Oh? He warned me to say nothing to anyone about our conversation, or he'd have to take steps. I remembered what he did to a German prison guard the day we were released, sir. What? Cut his head off with a mess knife. A very hard character indeed, this Edward Mybridge, alias Ginger Johnson. An old Borstal boy. He had served honorably in the army, but had returned to his old ways immediately upon demobilization. He was well known to us as one of the GOC's most useful lieutenants. <laughs> This G.O.C., a man of great mental attainments, we knew for the leader of one of the most desperate gangs of lawbreakers in all our experience. A genuine storybook mastermind. He had for many years operated like a real general officer commanding, maintaining a small staff of rough and ready assistants like Mybridge, and recruiting his actual operatives, his army, for specific jobs as he needed them. Scotland Yard had never been able to lay a finger on him, 
although he was quite well known to us under a variety of names and ostensible professions. It was obvious that this was to be no small undertaking. He needed to be watched, and thoroughly, and beginning at once. I telegraphed a chief inspector I remembered in a Scottish town not far from Perth, and he reported to me at Scotland Yard the next day. I finished my briefing on what he had to do for us. Oh, I'll recognize him all right, sir. You have a lot of pictures of him. I wish we had him. I'm not to arrest him, sir. You'll not have a chance. He's a most law-abiding man. Now, he's never seen you in his life. And you understand, I don't want him to see you. Okay, sir. I'll want to know everywhere he goes, everyone he talks to. Aye, sir. Don't telephone in. Stay with him till you see him home in the evening. Then come in and report. Okay, sir. And good luck. You'll need it. I'm a very ordinary-looking man, sir. He'll never see me. Chief Inspector Ross was back in my office in two hours. Uh, <clears throat> well? He, uh... I was standing on the corner, sir, waiting for the bus with him. And just as it stopped, he turned to me and said, It's all right, Chief Inspector Andrew Ross. You can go back to Perthshire. I'm just going to my bank this time. A detective constable we imported from Leeds who looked like a clergyman was addressed pittingly by name by the GOC who trod on our man's toes. The language he employed was quite unclerical. The law, of course, does not permit tapping a suspected man's telephone, so we were forced to continue to try to trail him to find out precisely what he was doing. But infallibly, he recognized our people. Rhodes kept hounding us. He couldn't organize his plan to defend the airport until he knew more of the GOC's probable intentions. And the man outwitted us at every turn. There came a morning ten days or so later when I saw Vivian Morris... One of our women detective sergeants passed my open door. Oh, uh, Sergeant, I called. Good morning, sir. Come in here a moment, will you? Uh, yes, sir. Vivian. Yes, sir. You're a very pretty girl. Why, thank you, sir. Have you ever followed a man? Report of Detective Sergeant Vivian C. Morris to Chief Inspector Sheehan at Scotland Yard. I don't think he recognized me, sir. You look like a young suburban mother, Vivian. I am. Got two girls. I shall send them each a hair ribbon. What happened? I got on his bus one street after him. There was no seat, but I spotted him at once. He was staring about the bus, looking for one of us. And we were not there. All at once, he leaped to his feet and offered me his seat. The very mirror of politeness. Yes. Then he rushed to the door, leered at a perfectly innocent man in a Homburg hat, and leapt off the bus almost before it had stopped. I couldn't follow, of course. Naturally. But tomorrow is another day. Report of Detective Sergeant Morris the second day. Yes, sir. He stayed on the bus this time. I had my netting with me. I'm doing a pair of tartan stockings for Sheila for her birthday. He didn't pay the slightest attention to me. He got off at Waterloo Station with most of the others on the bus, including myself. He went into a small tobacconist shop. Here's the address, sir. Thank you. He was wearing a dark blue coat and a bowler hat and carried a small briefcase. I went into a Lyons Corner house. You know the one, sir where I could watch the door of the tobacconist. I had three buns and three cups of coffee before he came out again, this time wearing a brown tweed suit and hat and without the briefcase. He looked about him sharply and hailed a taxi cab and they drove off. The number of the taxi cab was EBC 414. Thank you, Sergeant. Most well done. Would you just shove me the telephone, please? Thank you. There's an urgent telephone call waiting for you, sir. Who is it? Inspector Green of Traffic, sir. What does he want? He said it's quite important, sir. All right, put him on. Yes, Green? Uh, Green, yes, Shane. See, I hear you're interested in Ginger Johnson. What about him? He's dead. I refuse to burst into tears. He was apparently struck by a motor car. Where? On the Great West Road near the New Heathrow Airport. Oh, was he killed instantly? Well, he lived only a few minutes after we picked him up. Well, he's out of our hair. Oh, uh, did he say anything? Uh, uh, just a sec. What must he say? Oh, uh, say, perhaps you'd know what he was talking about. What did he say? He said, tell Karen not to drink the tea. It's poisoned. <laughs> Sounds quite Max Romerish, doesn't it? <laughs> You're sure he said, tell Karen? Did he say Karen? Yeah, yeah that's right, Karen. See, so I don't know any Karen. Quite all right, old boy. I do. Oh, uh, thank you very much. I hung up on him. Is there anything I can do to help, sir? 
Yes, go out and get someone started on tracing that taxi cab at once, please. Here, take the paper with a number on it. Right, sir. Will you put me through to Heathrow Airport at once, Chief Security Officer? Oh, good, you're here, Bob. Oh, Donald, I was just telephoning you. Never mind, operator, he's just come in. Look, Don, what about Colonel and the tea? Eh? Ginger Johnson just got killed. His dying words were to tell your man, Colonel, not to drink the tea because it's poisoned. Tea? What's it mean? I think he was off his rocker. Thought he was still in the German prison camp. It could be. What I came over for, I have a signal from the foreign office. The Americans are sending us some money soon. Much? Mere 388,000 pounds in gold. When? Ten days from today. Wonder if that's what the GOC is getting his sights on. A great many people knew that we were expecting a large amount of gold from America. He has a long nose. That long, do you suppose? You had a great deal of experience with him while you were here at the yard. I wonder. Oh, excuse me, sir. Uh, Come in, Vivian. You know Sergeant Morris, don't you, Donald? Indeed, I do. How are the girls, Vivian? They're fine, sir. Excuse me, sir. Uh, they're checking the taxi driver, sir. They'll telephone you. Good. You can go home now, if you like. You want to try again tomorrow? Of course, sir. Good girl. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night, Mr. Rowe. Good night. What's... what's she doing? She's caught up with the GOC. Find out anything good? Shortly. Look, we'll have to get going on this thing at once. If it is the, ship, the new shipment he's after. I know it. There's not much we can do until we have an idea how he intends to try. Pity Ginger Johnson died. He might have told us instead of babbling about poison tea in German prison. She in here? Shattinger here, sir. In the 999 room. Yes, Shattinger. And rather good luck on tracing that taxi cab, sir. Found the driver had just come into the company garage. Had his trip book with him. Good. The uh, trip at 10.23 this morning was from Waterloo Station... To a shop in Sowell, a chemist shop. A chemist shop? Yes, sir. The taxi driver said he saw his fare enter the shop. George Schill, chemist, he said. George Schill, I know that name. George George Schill Schill has been involved in a number of narcotics cases. Yes, I know. Thank you very much. What about George Schill? That's who the GOC was visiting this morning. Is he in the narcotics thing, too? We shall find out, old boy. I wonder where he went from there. Probably to bump off Ginger Johnson. Bump him off. Now tell me why he should do that. Well, good old Ginger might have been looking on the wine when it was red. Bible, old chap. Or the whiskey when it is amber. And blabbered about his talk with your man, Kern. The GOC wouldn't like that, would he? He wouldn't know whether Kern had talked to you. And he might have decided to prevent any more talk by Ginger to the wrong bloke. Ah, a little fantastic. But plausible. Where'd they find Ginger? uncomfortably close to your precious airport on the Great West Road. Ah. Yes. Put me through to Superintendent Trevelyan. Is that you, Trevelyan? She in here. Look, sir, I'd like to have a detail of men at once on an investigating job. Yes, sir, most important. I'd like to have a check made at once of all houses along Great West Road near the new Heath Airport. I'll direct them if you like. Eh? Oh, thanks, Donald. Mr. Rhodes, the chief security officer at the airport, will help them out. I'm looking for a house that has a a recent lodger. Check the houses that overlook the airport first. Please, for a lodger that did not return this evening. Here's the description. Tall, red-haired, has a squint eye and a gimpy right leg. Got it, sir? Thank you. Yes, sir, I'll get a search warrant and come at once when they find him. Thank you very much. They can telephone me at home if they find the place out of ours. Right. A few minutes after midnight, I was awakened by a telephone call from one of the men of Superintendent Trevelyan's squad. After some difficulty in obtaining a search warrant at that time of night, I proceeded to the house in which he had telephoned. The house was almost directly across the road from the main gate of the airport. Donald Rhodes, who was awaiting my arrival, accompanied me upstairs to the former lodger's room, which provided an excellent view of the airport from its single window. The householder turned on the lights and left us. The room was quite neat. There's a a chair by the window. Yes. Turned towards the window. 
cushion's rumpled quite a bit. Somebody's been sitting on it a lot. Here's an officer's musette bag in the closet. Have a look. That's his, all right. See? E. Mybridge, Lieutenant, King's Royal Rifle Corps. Good regiment. He's a good soldier, I expect. Here's a drawer in the table. Ah. What? E. Lights, Wetzler. Good pair of glasses, these German officers. 10X30. He was spying. That's this. What's this? Royal Corps Signals Field Message Pad. Or his reports to the GOC, eh? <laughs> Quite regimental. Been using it, too. Good. What? Writing on the sheet he just tore out left an impression on the second sheet. Let's see. Hold up the lamp there, Donald. Mm -hmm. No, hold it so the light comes across the page from the edge so it casts a shadow on the ridges of the writing here. Hmm? Read it. Hold the lamp still. See to guards at... at... what's this word? Looks... looks like midnight. What guards will he see to midnight? Makes no sense. Let me look again. No, that isn't C. Here. No. Looks like... I know what it is. What? T. T? T to guards at midnight. I don't... What was it Ginger said to tell Curran? Don't drink the tea. It's poisoned. It was the custom at that time for a local tea shop to send a man with a tricycle around the airport every night with a huge container of hot tea. It was a familiar sight to everyone on the field, and the sound of his funny little French taxi horn was the signal for everyone to have his tuppence ready for his tin cup of the stuff. The GOC's plan was obvious. If that tea were poison, then if they all drank it, and if half a million pounds in gold lay unguarded with a dead man at the gates, a, a most diabolical scheme. Nevertheless, a feasible one, by the GOC's reckoning. But he had overlooked some factors in his reckoning. One factor he'd overlooked was a rough, tough man's aversion to poisoning a wartime friend. The other was the flying squad. I sent men the following morning to all parts of London on a search for certain men whom we knew to have worked for the GOC before. A number of them were in prison. But we discovered that 11 of them had been mysteriously disappeared. They, we reasoned, had been mobilized by the GOC for final briefing and held in readiness for the attack. The GOC himself had left for parts unknown. He reappeared only once, and Vivian Morris reported that he had made a most curious purchase. Six pairs of nylon stockings, the largest sizes available. He knew something of the GOC's plans. This was our final briefing in the flying squad garage. Repeat your instructions, Nobby Clark. I'm to drive to seal lorry that picks up all the guards and takes them to the shelter. I drop off a flying squad man for everyone I pick up. The flying squad men are to be dressed in BOAC uniforms like those the guards wear. Each will be armed with a truncheon or a rubber cough. At the shelter, I'm to tell the guards I'll pick up what is going on. Right. Detective Sergeant Norton, what do you do, lion tamer? I'm in charge of the flying squad men. It'll be planted in the bonded warehouse where the money is. And you, Dusty Miller? I'd like to be with lion tamer. What's your job? Oh, I'm in general charge of the cars. So I was welterweight champion. We'll save one of them for you, Dusty. Say to it, Martin. All right, Dusty. Now remember, not a man must touch the tea. Oh, no, no, no. Not that poison it hurts any of you, but I, I shall need it for evidence. Well, couldn't we offer them a drink, sir? Donald? Look, it's my airport and it's my responsibility. What do you do? I just sit in that bloody little shelter by the telephone, and when they're all inside, I'm to lift the receiver. Good. And the sergeant from the 999 room? Constable Lloyd, sir. I want to watch the special switchboard for it to light up when Mr. Rhodes lifts the receiver. And then? Then at once I'm to shout into my wireless microphone one word. Well? Go. Where's Dusty Miller? Oh. Then I go a yoinks and the cars with the rest of us converge on every entrance to the airport. Render such assistance as might be necessary. None will be necessary, Dusty. And Lawton, when do you start operations? Not till they start to open the safe, sir. Then what? Then we smite them hip and thigh, sir. Carry them all off to the pokey. To the what? Oh, I'm sorry, sir, that's Canadian. It's to the bowels of the vast time. And when you're done, boys, Heathrow will supply beer for all. A bottle of pigs! <laughs> beer and bandages, boys. Mm -hmm. 
The day came. The airplane from America arrived with the gold. It was transferred under heavy guard to the bonded warehouse. Donald Rhodes supervised that himself. I joined the guard at the gatehouse of the airport about 11 that evening. It was very quiet. That'll be Clark, taking our men around and picking up the regular guards. Very lonely and very quiet. Maybe they're not come, I thought. I borrowed a cigarette from the gate guard, but I crushed it out. They mustn't know there's anybody here besides you, I told him. That's right, sir. Squidge down on the floor. I waited. That was Nobby, taking the regular guards to the shed. I... Who's that? Art gave it, sir. Yes? Clark here. Tell Mr. Sheehan I've picked up all the guards and our people are waiting. Yes, it was... I heard him. Just in time, sir. Here comes the tea. The man with the tricycle came up and stopped. Hello, Herbert. Hello, James. I thought I was going to be late. I've come. Hey, got your tin cup? Yeah. Some guard or somebody stopped me down the road a bit and demanded what I was doing. Made me open up the tea and let him look at it. Got all cold, I'm afraid, him staring at it. All right, Tuckmas, please. Right. Go on in. The guard brought in the tea, which we set on the floor to keep as evidence. The driver came back with the empty container and went on about his business. The guard and I crouched on the floor of the little hut, waiting. Only the sound of a belated airplane or two broke the silence. It was half an hour later when we heard the sound of a lorry. I crawled under the table. The guard lay back in his chair, motionless. The lorry stopped at the gate and a man got out. He looked in our window. Here's one of them now. I stood up cautiously. The lorry moved straight to the bonded warehouse and stopped. We heard them at the door. We kept quiet in the dim light. The door opened. I watched through a crack in the sheltered door. My hand on the telephone to the 999 room. We sat in our cars, motors running, hidden at the road junctions all around the airport. My eyes began to hurt watching that switchboard. I said to the guards in the shed, now mind you, not a sound. I could see the shadowy figures clustering about the door to the bonded warehouse. A man whispered in my ear. What have they got on their heads? They look like ratty elephants. They had women's stockings on for masks. They sure looked weird with their legs hanging down over their faces. I hope the GOC is with them, I thought. The last one entered. I picked up the receiver. There it is. Go, you sods, go. Come on, the flying squad. They're at the safe. I saw a man running towards me. He tore the stocking from his head and I leaped out the door at him. Stop! Stop, I yell, stop! I'm an inspector! When I came to an hour later, I discovered the grandfather of all bumps on my head from the loaded cosh the man had caressed me with. My men of the flying squad stood about, many of them bandaged to the eyes, but all happily quaffing beer. We totted up the score. Eleven prisoners, including the one who had struck me and whom the gate guard had taken care of. Two broken arms, one smashed nose, and a turned ankle. A pile of heavy cautious and short iron bars the robbers had carried. And the 388,000 pounds still untouched. The prisoners bore a large variety of contusions, black eyes and broken heads. I, uh, I had a headache for a week. We never did catch the GOC, but we sent 11 of his men to prison, having caught them red-handed. And to this day, no one has ever dreamed of robbing Heathrow again. If they do, sir, may I have a chance at them, too?
heard another true story from the files of Scotland Yard. Only the names were, for obvious reasons, changed. Research for Whitehall 1212 is done by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. fans. Stand by. Dick Tracy is on the air. The makers of Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, the two tempting, delicious, nourishing cereals that are shot from guns, now bring you another thrilling Dick Tracy detective adventure. Big guns. Hear them? Well, the next time you have a big dish of crisp, nourishing Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice for breakfast, remember the sound of the big guns, because those two delicious cereals are actually shot from guns. Sun-ripened grains of nourishing wheat and rice are loaded into the guns, and then these little kernels of grain are exploded to eight times their normal size. That makes them look different and taste better than ordinary cereals. That special Quaker process makes puffed wheat and puffed rice specially easy to digest so that you get trigger-fast food energy more quickly and easily. And you need lots of quick food energy if you want to be as fast on your feet as your friend Dick Tracy is. And here's a good idea. Puffed wheat and puffed rice are two different delicious flavors. So ask Mother to get a package of each at the grocer's. And then you and Mother and Dad can have Quaker puffed wheat for breakfast one morning... And Quaker puffed rice the next. That really gives you variety, doesn't it? So look in the pantry today to see if one of those famous red and blue packages is there now. If it's Quaker puffed wheat, ask Mother to get a package of Quaker puffed rice. And if it's Quaker puffed rice, ask her to get some Quaker puffed wheat. And then you have both for a delightful change that thousands of wide-awake boys, girls, and grown-ups enjoy every day. And remember, fellows and girls, there's another secret code message at the end of the program today. So be sure you have your pencil, paper, and code book ready. Dick Tracy has been trying to protect Dryden Small, a well-known Egyptologist from dark forces which seek his death. Small has received strange warnings, and several times his life has been attempted unsuccessfully due to the daring efforts of Dick Tracy. Both Dick and Pat are convinced that Small has kept from them the real reason for these mysterious attacks. In our last episode, we heard how a strange message, seemingly written by an invisible hand had appeared on the wall above Small's bed. Let's see what the invisible hand is writing. Your hour is at hand. Your end is near. The black pearl of Osiris must shine again. Yes, yes, and look there on the floor. It's another scarab, Tracy. Another scarab. Yes, so I see. Another symbol of death and destruction. Why don't you do something? But it's no use. You can't fight the supernatural. They told me there was a curse upon the tomb of Tutankhamun. I should never have gone into it. All the others who have been in it have come to sudden death. Oh, stop it, stop it, Small. There's nothing supernatural here. I know, but Dick, the writing on the wall, we saw the message being written. Yes, sir. And now look, it's beginning to fade. Ghost writing, that's what it is. The handwriting of a ghost. Oh, come, come, Small. Pull yourself together. This isn't the work of a ghost. The man with a yellow face, whoever he may be, paid a visit to this cabin in our absence. How do you know he was here? Why, it's simple enough. The scarab on the floor, he left it there. The handwriting on the wall, he put it there. No, no, no. He might have put the scarab there, but the handwriting, that couldn't have been done by anybody human. We saw the message being written and there was no one here. Of course there wasn't. The message was written before we got here. We saw it when we turned on the bed lamp. I don't get it, Dick. Pat, put your hand over that lamp, about six inches away. All right. I've got it there now. What do you feel? Nothing but heat. Ah, precisely. Heat. The heat from the lamp. Do you recall ever having used heat in connection with invisible messages before, Pat? Oh, why, sure. Say, I get it. This message was written in invisible ink and couldn't be seen until the heat of the lamp brought it out on the wall. Go to the head of the class, Pat. That's exactly what happened here. The man with a yellow face wrote his message in invisible ink. Small came in, turned on the lamp, and in half an hour or so, the heat from the lamp brought the message out. 
There's your supernatural for you, Mr. Small. You you make it sound simple. It is simple. If the rest of this case were as simple as that handwriting, we'd have no problem. But but it's not simple, Small, because you choose to make it difficult. I choose to make it difficult? Yes. You refuse to tell us all you know about this. You refuse to tell us what we've got to know of where to protect you against the man with the yellow face. There's a definite reason why you're being followed. There's a definite reason for these attempts on your life, such as the one in the dining salon tonight. There's some reason for these scarabs and that message on the wall. Now, what is it? I'm sorry, but I don't know any more than I've told you. And I've told you once, and I'll tell you again, that you're not being entirely truthful. Now, look here. I want you to tell me the meaning of that message about the Black Pearl of Osiris. Yeah, that was a queer one. What is the Black Pearl of Osiris anyway, Dick? I don't know about the Black Pearl, Pat. I do know, however, that Osiris was a god worshipped by the ancient Egyptians. And that even today, there are certain secret societies which still worship him. Hmm. Your knowledge of Egyptian history is remarkable, Tracy. Well, unfortunately, I don't know quite enough. But you know what I want to know, Small. What is the Black Pearl of Osiris? I demand an answer. I I don't know, Tracy. I swear it. If I knew, don't you think I'd tell you? I I, I feel rather faint. I, I wonder if one of you would mind going up on deck with me. Just for a little while. Well, uh, I had a date with a... All right, Pat. You'll have to forget your date. I've got to see the captain at once. You'll have to stay with Small. Keep close to him on deck and don't let him out of your sight. Okay. I hope I get a chance to explain to that girl that I didn't mean to disappoint her. You feel better now, Small? Yes. Yes, Mr. Patton. The air is doing me good. Looks like we're going to have a fog. You can see whispers of it floating past the binnacle light up there. Yes. You know, Small, you really ought to come clean with Tracy. Patton. Yeah? That that man leaning against the rail. Uh, he he just looked this way. And his face. Well, what about his face? I, I'm not sure, but it, it looked yellow. It, it, it... Now, take it easy. Don't start getting jittery. Don't be begin seeing a yellow face in every passenger on this ship. Look, look, he's moving away from the rail. He's disappearing into the fog. What was that? Something dropped at our feet. Yeah, I heard it. Let me see. Hey. Hey, here it is. What? Why, well, see, it looks it looks like a scarab. A scarab? A pattern. It it's another warning. That was the man with the yellow face. Yeah, yeah, we'd better get down and get to your cabin. I'll get in touch with Tracy. No, 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 no. Not back to the cabin. I'm afraid to go there. Let's stay in the open. Okay, okay, but i better get Tracy here as quick as I can. Come on over by the light. What are you going to do? Well, Dick's in the captain's cabin. I'm going to send him a message. A message in code. Well, come in, Mr. Tracy. Glad to see you. How are you, Captain? Mm, worried, Tracy. Very much worried. I'm glad you're here. I don't like the things that have been happening on this ship of mine. Well, I'm sorry about the need for searching the ship, but you must understand, Captain, that at any moment, one of your passengers may be, well, put out of the way. Mm, that isn't what I referred to, Tracy. There are other things that are wrong. Such as? Well, have you heard about what's been going on down in the hold? The hold? Mm-hmm. I know. What's happened down there? One of the crew, a fellow named Weeks, was found about an hour ago, totally unconscious. Unconscious? Yes, lying in the door of the storage room. Not a strong fellow. As a matter of fact, he has a weak heart. That's why we have him down there. All he does is check the books and little odd jobs like that, you know. Yes, yes, but what made him unconscious? Well, according to his story, Tracy, as he was approaching the storage room, he noticed the door was open, which was unusual. As he began to investigate, he suddenly saw, standing in the doorway itself, a strange-looking figure. The next thing he remembers, he was lying on a cot. And the ship's doctor was working over him. Huh? He's not given to seeing things, is he? No, I don't think so. He's a stable, dependable fellow. At any rate, he's never seen things before. Well, in that case, I don't think it would be a bad idea to investigate that storage room. Now, about the search for the man with the yellow face, Captain. Yes, I wanted to talk to you about that, Tracy. We we don't seem to be making much progress. Matter of fact, Tracy, we're not making any progress at all. Yes, yes, I was afraid of that. Oh, excuse me. Come in. There's a message for Mr. Tracy, sir. Oh, give it here. Where did you get this? It was given to me by a gentleman down in Deck A, sir. Thank you. Excuse me, Captain. Yes, certainly. It's a code message from Pat. Hmm? Prisoner 20, 21, 12, 16, 7, 10, 18, 20, 
too. Uh, will you excuse me, Captain? I've got to join Mr. Patton on deck immediately. Uh, nothing wrong, is there, Tracy? I don't know. That's what I want to find out. And I've got to find out fast. Well, I'll go along with you, Tracy. I've got to go up to the bridge, and this will be on my way. Glad to have your company, Captain, but let's hurry. We can take this companion way here, Tracy. It leads down to deck A. Fine. Deck A. I don't see Mr. Patton, do you? No, but this fog is getting thicker. Mm-hmm. He may be down at the other end. Come on. Well, I'll leave you here, Tracy. Man I... overboard! Man overboard! Yes. Man overboard, Tracy. Get down there as fast as you can. I'll see the water in the boats over the side. Right. Man overboard! Man overboard! Hey, hey, you there. Hey, where is he? 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 Where is the man with the yellow face. Patton. Yes, yes, what happened? Overboard. Patton. Patton was thrown overboard. What? Pat overboard? Wait, Tracy, what are you doing? Why are you taking off your coat? Why do you think? I'm going after Pat. Stop, don't. Another man overboard. Another man. Tracy, they'll both be found. Patton and Tracy, too. Patton and Tracy, too. Patton and Tracy, too. Will Dick save Pat? Or has the detective's friend been swallowed up by the black waters in the night? Dick will save him if anyone can. But now the makers of Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice, those two popular, delicious, quick energy-giving cereals that are shot from guns, invite you to attend another meeting of the Dick Tracy Secret Service Patrol. Here comes Dick Tracy Jr. now. The 20th meeting will now come to order, patrol members. And let's be sure we all have pencils and paper ready to take down today's secret code message. Are you going to give Dick Tracy's friends the message that Pat sent Dick today, or have you a special secret patrol message, Junior? Oh, both, Mr. Quaker Man. First, I'm going to repeat the message that Pat sent to Dick Tracy. Good. Are you ready, patrol members? Here it is. Prisoner 20, 21, 12, 16. 7, 10, 18, 20... Two. Once more, Junior, to make sure everyone got it. All right, Mr. Quaker Man. It's prisoner 20, 21, 12, 16, 7, 10, 18, 20, 2. Fine. And now what's the special patrol message, Junior? Here it is. Are you all ready? It's Buffalo. 21, 12, 14, 10, 12, 4. 10, 20, 13, 3, 6, 10, 20, 13, 3, 21. 1, 8, 14, 5. Better repeat that one too, Junior, I think. Okay. Ready, everyone? It's Buffalo... 21, 12, 14, 10, 12, 4. 10, 20, 13, 3. 6, 10, 20, 13, 3, 21. 1, 8, 14, 5. Well, that sounds very important, Junior. It is. It's a special order for patrol members. But how about the fellows and girls who aren't members and can't decode the messages? Well, we can't very well give away the patrol secret. Of course not. I can't imagine any real wide-awake boy or girl not joining, can you? Not unless they don't know how to join on the Dick Tracy Secret Service Patrol. So maybe you better tell them, just in case there are some fellows and girls listening in for the first time. Good idea. Well, here's how you can join the patrol and get the secret code, the patrol pledge, and the membership badge so you don't miss any of the fun. Just tear the tops off two packages of Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice or one of each. Put them in an envelope with your name and address printed on a plain piece of paper and mail them to Dick Tracy, Box L, Chicago. Then you get in on all the secret detective activities, too. And Dick Tracy sends you a secret code book, a patrol pledge, and a special badge, all free. Tell Mother how those nourishing, delicious cereals are shot from guns to make them specially easy to digest. So ask her to get you some Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice at the grocer's. Calling all adventure fans. Calling all 
Dick Tracy fans. Stand by for another exciting Dick Tracy adventure tomorrow at this same time. That is all. fans, calling all Dick Tracy fans. Stand by. Dick Tracy is on the air. The makers of Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice, those two tasty, nourishing cereals that are shot from guns, now bring you another thrilling Dick Tracy adventure. And there's the sound of the big guns in the Quaker plant, where they're making puffed wheat and puffed rice for the thousands of happy families who enjoy something specially good for breakfast every day. You know, breakfast is a very important meal. It follows the longest stretch between meals and comes just before you start your active day. That calls for lots of real food energy, and that in turn calls for nourishing puffed wheat and puffed rice. That's why they're shot from guns. A special Quaker process explodes each grain of wheat and rice to eight times its normal size. The tiny, hard-to-digest food cells are unlocked for you so that you can use their trigger-fast food energy easily and quickly. So have Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice for breakfast often. Try them turn about. Puffed wheat one day, puffed rice the next. You know, there's a good idea for you to tell Mother about. She's always trying to give you and Dad something different that you really enjoy and it's especially good for you, too. Well, with Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, you have two delicious flavors for a taste variety that the whole family goes for. So tell Mother about it and ask her to get some Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice at the grocer's. And then you can change flavors every day and still be getting the trigger-fast food energy you need to be as quick in thought and action as Dick Tracy is. And remember, patrol members, there's another secret code message for you at the end of today's program. So be sure you have your pencil, paper, and secret code book ready. An unknown assailant called the man with the yellow face has threatened the life of the well-known Egyptologist, Dryden Small. Yesterday, we heard how Dick had received a code message from Pat, who was walking on Deck A with Dryden Small. As Dick and the ship's captain hurried to Deck A, someone cried, Man overboard! It seems Pat, fighting hand-to-hand with the man with the yellow face, had been thrown overboard. The brave and courageous detective leaped over the side after his friend. Will he save him, or will he too meet death in the black waters of the ocean? Get my boat more on the side. All right, sir. Take it, sir. Take it, sir. Yes, sir. She's just willing enough to pass. Hey, what? Come along, man. We've got to get that lifeboat over the side at once. Oh, no, no, sir. Good, good. Come along. Come along. Anything about this? Any people level at you, Noel? Watch the men. Smart, Larry. There are two men on the board. Bring them back. Goodness, they're keeping their searchlights going. Right, sir. I don't see. Hold on, sir. There's something to port. Two points in the port bow, sir. This way. Help. That's Help. Tracy and Paddy. Pull out, men. Right, sir. Inside of them. Heave away, there. Heave, boys. Heave. Uh, stand by in the bow, bosun, to help them port. Aye, aye, sir. Pause. Yeah. All right, Mr. Tracy. We've got you, sir. We've got you. Take Patton. He's out. Right, sir, right. Pull him in, boys. Pull him in. Uh, no, no, lend him a hand. There we are. Uh, uh, all right, you're next, Mr. Tracy. Grab hold, sir. Grab hold. Yeah. Uh, Easy. Uh, up you come, sir. Up you come. Over. Oh, thanks. There we are. Uh, oh, that water's cold. How's Pat? Uh, he'll be all right, Tracy. He's suffering from cold and shock, most likely. But we'll get him back to the ship at once. And pull away together. Stroke. 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 Well, Dick... Guess I owe my life to you once again. Someone else would have pulled you out if I hadn't been there, Pat. Uh, but no one else did. That's the point. Now that you're able to talk, Pat, tell me, what happened up there on deck? Well, Small and I noticed someone whom we took to be the man with the yellow face. Uh-huh. I immediately sent you that message asking you to come up on deck. Well, after the steward left with the message, 
Small and I walked aft along deck A when suddenly a figure slipped out of the shadows. He was on us before I could get set. Yeah. He knocked Small to the deck and then I grappled with him. Dick, I, I've never met anyone so powerful in all my life. I couldn't do a thing against him. He was so strong that he actually picked me up bodily and heaved me overboard. Hmm. I don't suppose you got a good look at him, Pat. No, Dick, I, I didn't. Everything happened so quickly. This man, Dryden Small, he knows why he's being hounded, Pat. He knows what the man with the yellow face is after. I'm convinced he also knows who the man with the yellow face is. Well, why don't we just wash our hands of the whole matter, Dick? Well, now you know we can't do that, Pat, even though I told Small I would. If there's something I can do... I can have this out with Dryden Small. So far, we've managed to protect him, but it can't go on this way. We've got to make that fellow realize that the closer we get to America, the more desperate our adversaries will become. Come on, we might as well have this out right now. Yeah, but the doctor said he was sleeping. I can't help that. I wonder who that is. Come in. Well, Captain, come in. I don't mean to disturb you, Mr. Tracy, but something terrible has happened. Well, what is it, Captain? The thing I've been dreading has come at last. You recall earlier this evening, I spoke of one of the crew being found unconscious in the storage room. He was a man with a weak heart, I said. Yes, yes, I remember. He's the man who claimed to have seen a figure standing in the door of the storage room. Yes, well, he insisted on going on with his work in the storage room. He's had another shock, Tracy. One that may be fatal. Another heart attack? Yes. From what I know, I, I'm convinced he was scared into his present state. I see. Where's the victim now? He's still down in the storeroom. The doctor is giving him first aid, trying to revive him. Pat, you stay with Dryden Small. Yeah? I'm going down to that storage room with the captain. Those two things may be linked up. I don't know how, but they may be. Okay, Dick. Don't worry about me. I'll be all right. Here, uh, take my gun. You may need it since you lost yours overboard. All right, thanks. And don't let Small out of your sight. Oh, I won't. Come along, Captain. Right. What you say is true. We may have to make new plans at once to trap the man we're looking for. Well, Doctor? Uh, he's still in a deep coma, Captain. I haven't been able to do a thing for him. I'm afraid he must be taken to the ship's hospital. Oh, oh very well, Doctor, very well. I've already sent for a stretcher. Splendid. Give him the best of care. I tell you, Tracy, it, it was something the man saw. Captain, may I suggest that your men make a thorough search of the hold at once, especially the storage room? I've already seen to that, Tracy. What you told me this evening about the strange apparition this man saw may certainly have something to do with this. Perhaps it was the man with the yellow face. By the way, what... What's that thing over there? Is that? <laughs> That's the mummy case Dryden Small is bringing back to America. I believe it contains the mummy of Tadonkamal's second son. Frankly, Tracy, I'd feel much happier if Tadonkamal never had a second son. Yes. A mummified passenger isn't altogether pleasant. Uh, what I'm worried about is the effect of all this on the crew, Tracy. They talk a great deal. Too much, perhaps. Rumors get around, you know. Before you know it, your ship has a bad name. I, I don't like it. I can well understand that. Ah, here comes the mate. Have you found anything? No, nothing, sir, not a thing. The men are still going over everything, though, just to be sure. Yeah, thank you. Well, Tracy, there doesn't seem to be much either of us can do here. Do you care to join me in my cabin? A little coffee, perhaps? Some sandwiches? Yes, I'll enjoy it very much. But I feel the most important place for me to be right now is back in Dryden Small's cabin. All right, I'll have the coffee sent there. Hey, Jack, sir. This way, Captain. Dryden Small State from us down this way. Yes. You know, Tracy, it certainly is reassuring to have you on board this trip. I'd hate to have all these bizarre things happening without you here to help clear them up. Well, I haven't cleared them up, Captain. No, but I know your reputation. I have absolute confidence in you, Tracy. Well, thank you. This is really one of the most puzzling cases I've ever encountered. Mm -hmm. I don't believe I ever had so little of a tangible nature to work with. There's so many things I'd like to know... I'd give a great deal, for instance, to know what the black pearl of Osiris is and where it is. I'd like to know why the man with the yellow face is so anxious to get hold of it. To make it brief, Captain, I, <laughs> I'd like to know what it's all about. Mm, that is all that, eh? Well, I'll say this, Tracy. I'll be a very much relieved man when this ship docks at New York. I dare say. Well, here we are. Mm -hmm. huh. Pat must be in the bedroom. Yes, he, uh... I told you this before. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Voice, strange voice, listen. I have no desire to discuss this matter with you at any length. All I ask from you is that you tell me where the black pearl is. The black pearl of Osiris. I don't know, I tell you. I don't even know what you're talking about. Your friend, Ryden Small, practiced the same deception. He, too, pretended ignorance of the black pearl of Osiris. You see what has happened to him. The same thing will happen to you. 
this pearl-handled revolver of his may not be very impressive looking, but I rather think if it is well aimed and uh, skillfully handled, it can be deadly indeed. Now listen, I'm telling you. You that will I... tell me nothing but what I want to know. Where is the black pearl of Osiris? Answer you, white devil, or it will be the worse for you. Great heavens, Tracy. What what's going on in there? It's evident the pet's on the spot. I never heard that voice before, but I'll bet it's the man with the yellow face. What can we do? Have you a gun? No, I haven't. Mm, neither have I. I gave mine to Patton. I can get one, though. No, there's no time. We've got to work quickly. But you can't do anything against that man without a gun? Time grows short, my friend. Answer me quickly. I refuse to waste further words with you. Now, listen. I'm telling you the truth. Why should I lie to you? I don't know where the black pearl you're talking about is. This little pearl-handled revolver is about to speak. I do not think you would care to hear its voice. Now, I tell you, you've got me all wrong. I don't know any more about that black pearl than you do, or Tracy does. He tried to get dry and small to tell us, but he wouldn't. Very well, my friend. I see you are not only stubborn, but reckless of your life. And so it Ready, becomes Captain. necessary to... What are you going to do? Pull a bluff, Captain. Pull a bluff. Kill you. And believe me, my friend, you could have avoided it if you had wanted to. However, you forced my hand. And so... Dick! Dick! Oh, there you are. Drop that gun or I'll drop you. Who is the man with the yellow face? And will Tracy succeed in bluffing him? What is the mystery of the black pearl of Osiris? We'll soon know. But now the makers of Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice, those two delicious nourishing cereals that are shot from guns, invite you to attend the meeting of the Dick Tracy Secret Service Patrol. And here's Dick Tracy, Jr., your patrol president now. The 21st meeting will now come to order. And today I have another secret code message for you patrol members. So get your pencil and paper ready, fellows and girls. You know, one reason why we're sending you these secret messages every day is that Dick Tracy wants you to be able to use the code as easily and as quickly as he does. That's important. And that's why you should send at least one code message to every patrol member you know every day. That's the way to get good at it, and it's a lot of fun. But now, get ready for today's secret message from Dick Tracy. Here it is. It's football. 10, 11, 7, 17, 11, 26. 17, 9, 12, 25. 5, 17, 6, 15. 11, 25, 13, 3, 26. Did you get it? Repeat it, Junior, to make sure. Okay. Here you are. It's football. 10, 11, 7, 17, 11, 26. 17, 9, 12, 25. 5, 17, 6, 15. 11, 25, 13, 3, 26. And remember, fellows and girls, that's a real message from Dick Tracy to you. Follow those instructions because something very important is about to happen. And if you or any of your friends are missing all the fun we're having, tell them how to join the patrol right away. You know, you just mail two Quaker Puff Tweet or Quaker Puff Rice box tops or one of each with your name and address to Dick Tracy, Box L, Chicago. Then you're a full-fledged member. You get the secret code book, the Dick Tracy Pledge, and the patrol member's badge. And don't forget to form your own active Dick Tracy patrol. It tells you how to in the secret code book. And then you're a patrol leader, and Dick Tracy sends you the special patrol leader's badge to wear with your regular badge. And say, patrol members, have you been promoted to the rank of sergeant or lieutenant yet? It's a real honor to wear one of those officer's badges, you know. Look it up in your code book and start now to win your promotion. Show Dick Tracy the kind of stuff you're made of. There go the big guns to remind you that Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice are actually shot from guns to give you lots of trigger-fast energy in two different delicious cereals that thousands enjoy every day. And if there isn't any puffed wheat or puffed rice in your pantry now, be sure to ask Mother to order some for you at the grocer's. Calling all adventure fans. Calling all Dick Tracy fans. Stand by for another exciting Dick Tracy adventure tomorrow at this same time. 
That is all. Rinso presents Call the Police. Attention, Homicide Department. Flying squad detail. Murder suspect in your zone. Close in according to instructions. Between you and the evil outside the law, between you and the housebreaker, the kidnapper, the murderer, stands the policeman of your community. He gives up his sleep that you may sleep unafraid. He gives up his safety that you may be safe. And if need be, he gives up his very life to protect yours. The Lever Brothers Company, makers of Triple Action Rinso, bring you Call the Police, a new series of realistic radio dramas inspired by the courageous work of police departments all over America. This is Police Commissioner Bill Grant. In the files of the Ashland Police Headquarters are thousands of different case histories. The one I just came across is listed as number 36-99. I remember that as the Porter case. That all started in a little place just outside of the city. A dog kennel run by a man named Porter. One rainy spring morning, a 1932 Packard touring car drove up to the Porter house, and two men got out. Morning. Porter? Yes, I'm Mr. Porter. The name's Bliss. This is Mr. Langford. How do you do, Mr. Bliss? Mr. Langford? Nice little place you got here, Porter. I'll raise the finest dogs in this county. That's so? As a matter of fact, we uh, just got a new litter of Airedales. Uh, make you a good price. Funny coincidence, Porter. We got a little information, and we're going to make you a good price. What are you talking about? $50,000. And you better grab it at the price, pal. The kind of stuff we're marketing can jump 10,000 bucks overnight. Now, what are you trying to sell me? Like I said, information. Nothing I want to know that's worth $50,000. Yeah, but there's something we don't think you'd want other people to know. Is this a joke? I doubt if your wife would see it that way. What's my wife got to do with this? Plenty, Mr. Porter. Plenty. Why, this is some kind of lousy blackmail oh, racket. Mr. Porter, please. Look, Porter... Langford and me are registered at the Rex Hotel. And we ain't going to breathe a word to a soul if you drop in on us before midnight tonight. With uh, 50 grand. I haven't got that kind of money, and if I did have, you wouldn't get it. Your wife's got $50,000 in her own name. And don't kid yourself that we ain't going to get it. As I got the story from Porter, he didn't know how to broach the subject to his wife. It wasn't until he finished his third cup of coffee that he worked up enough courage to say, Ginny. Yes, dear? I've never asked you any questions about your past. No, Eric. We've had kind of a silent agreement to let bygones be bygones. But I, I have to ask you now. What, what do you want to know? Do the names Langford and Bliss mean anything to you? Bliss? Langford? No, Eric. Are you sure? What do you mean, am I sure? Now, please, Jenny, I, I've never asked about your past until now, but Bliss and Langford are forcing my hand. How? They want money. Lots of money. Every cent you have in the bank. For what? Blackmail. Well, Jenny. All right, Eric. I've, I've been in jail. I didn't tell you about it before because I never dreamed you'd have to find out. I, I moved to another town and changed my name. Then how could they have found you here? There's a photograph of me in the police lineup. I've tried for years to get hold of it, but I couldn't. So that's what Bliss and Langford are trying to sell for $50,000. Jeannie, I know where they're stopping. I'll give them a chance to listen to reason. People like that never listen to reason. Then I'll take matters in my own hands. Shh. It, huh? Yes, Mildred? Uh, Miss 
Porter, I want to get the breakfast dishes. I hope the cream wasn't sour, Miss Porter, but that milkman never comes when he's supposed to. How long have you been standing in that door, Mildred? Just for a second, Mrs. Porter. You heard what we were saying, didn't you, Mildred? No, Mr. Porter. You sure? Yes, Mr. Porter. I didn't hear a single solitary word. The maid's name was Mildred Connors. She'd been in the Porter's employ for over a year, and she wasn't the kind of a girl to let grass grow under her feet. Ninety minutes later, she had persuaded Sergeant Maggio that her business was urgent, and she was in my office. And their names are Bliss and Langford, Commissioner. Uh Uh-huh. And you heard Porter say that he was going to kill them, is that it? Not in so many words, but that's what he meant. What did he say, Miss Connors? He said, uh, he said that if they wouldn't listen to reason, he'd, uh, uh, oh yes, he said he'd take matters in his own hands. Uh Uh-huh. I see. Well, it scared me to death. When I walked into the room, I started talking about something else right away. And when they asked me what I'd heard, I said I hadn't heard a thing. Why? It's dangerous to know too much. Mm -hmm. All right, just keep this to yourself, Miss Connors, and I'll get in touch with you. You can depend on me, Commissioner. I came right straight here. I thought it was the safest thing to do. Mm -hmm. Oh, Miss Connors. Yes? The safest thing is not to listen outside of doors. Why, why, I'll get in touch with you, Miss Connors. Bus for me, Commissioner? Uh, yes, Mayor Joe. I want you to give every hotel in town a check. Yeah, what name? Two of them. Bliss and Langford. Bliss and Langford. Okay. Say, she wasn't bad, huh? Huh? Who? That dame that just came out of here. You mean you didn't notice her? Would you believe it? I didn't. Oh, ease up, Commissioner. Ease up. I'll ease up, Mayor Joe, when I've learned all the tricks of this police commissioner job they just handed me. Could be better than the Marines, huh, Commissioner? Maybe it was nicer when we were stuck on Saipan with nothing to do but drink sake and duck Jap mortars. I don't know, Maggio. It's a tough routine. But on the other hand, it has its satisfactions. Oh, that reminds me. One of the satisfactions is waiting outside. Who? That beautiful little thing that works down in the criminal psychology department. Oh, Libby Tyler? Who else? Tell her to come in. Okay. I'll check on Bliss and Langford. You can come in, Miss Tyler. Thanks, Sergeant. Well, morning, Commissioner. Hiya, Libby. Sit down. Thanks. How are things in the criminal psychology department? Uh, Good enough for me to tell you that she's an overt hysteric. Who is? The girl who just walked out of here. (laughs) What exactly does that mean, an overt hysteric? Among other things, it means I wouldn't trust a word she says. Well, she just said a lot of words, Libby. She told me that Eric Porter had threatened to kill a couple of men who were trying to blackmail his wife. I bought my spaniel puppy from Mr. and Mrs. Porter, and I can tell you right now that neither one of them is psychologically equipped for murder. But, Libby... As a matter of fact, I wouldn't be surprised if you found that the blackmailers she told you about are totally non-existent. Oh, excuse me, Miss Tyler. I've located a Ralph Langford registered at the Rex Hotel, Commissioner. Oh, yeah? Room uh, 809. Thanks, Sarge. Well, Libby, how would you like to come along with me and have a look at a totally non-existent blackmailer in the flesh? This whistle means suspicious characters at 8th and Elm. But this whistle... Of course, that's Rinso White and Rinso Bright. Till I tried Rinso, I never dreamed a wash could be so dazzling. Just look at my linens. They're like snow. And all my washable color things are so bright and fresh, yet I've washed many of them dozens of times. Well, ma'am, there's a reason for Rinso's top results. You see, Rinso has a triple action formula that gives you a special soapy rich face, an amazing suds booster, and a marvelous grease chaser. Rinso's soapy rich face makes deep driving suds that get out stubborn dirt fast. Rinso's suds booster means heaps of suds, even in hard water. And Rinso's grease chaser goes after grease and grime, helps prevent yellowing of clothes, yet is easy on hands. So ask for Rinso for a dazzling wash, a wash that's Rinso White and Rinso Bright. When Libby and I got to the Rex Hotel, we checked at the desk and found Langford was in. We walked up two flights and knocked. 
Langford. Langford, open up. I want to talk to you. Try the knob. It's open. Come on, let's go in. Oh, there he is, Bill. Yeah, having himself a card game. Sorry to interrupt your solitaire, Mr. Langford. Look, he's got the ace of diamonds in his hand and the king's open. He's missing a big chance. He's going to keep right on missing it. What? Take a look at his face, Libby. Mr. Langford is dead. The man sat there with a dazed grin of pain on his face. When I touched him, he toppled sideways out of the chair. There was a powder-burned bullet hole right under his left ear. Oh, Bill, how awful. You know, Libby, the maid told me a straight story. What are you looking for? Letters, photographs. Mildred Connor said Langford was blackmailing Mrs. Porter. I didn't get a line on whatever it was he was holding over her head. Well, wouldn't the murderer have taken it, Bill? Maybe he couldn't find it. Where could it be? In the desk here. The girl. Maybe in the suitcase. There's a closet right by the bed. Yeah, take a look in there. You know, Dr. Holzbein, the Viennese psychologist, says that the personality of settled people like the Porters is simply not compatible with murder. You better write Dr. Holzbein and tell him to think it over, Libby. What do you mean? Look who's here in the closet. Libby's jaw dropped a foot when she saw Mrs. Porter step out of the closet. Naturally, Mrs. Porter protested her innocence to the housetops, but we took her in anyway. Twenty minutes later at headquarters. Yes, Commissioner? Maggio, I don't want to be interrupted until I buzz you back. Okay, Commissioner. Now then, Mrs. Porter, let's have it. I've told you, Commissioner Grant, I've told you twice, just the way it was. You walked into Langford's room at the Rex and found him sitting there dead. Is that it? You've got to believe me. And then you heard Miss Tyler and me at the door and you ran into the closet. Why? I, I knew I'd look guilty being there. Mrs. Porter, I'm afraid you've got a servant problem. Servant problem? What do you mean? I've had the same maid for over a year. Mm -hmm. Her name's Mildred Connors, isn't it? How did you know that? Look, Mrs. Porter... Langford was murdered around 11 o'clock this morning. A few minutes before 11, Mildred Connors walked into this office and told me that you and your husband were discussing the fact that two men, Langford and Bliss, were trying to squeeze you for blackmail. She, she told you that? And she specifically heard your husband say that if the blackmailers didn't listen to reason, he'd take matters into his own hands. No. Is it possible, Mrs. Porter, that your husband got to the wrecks before you did? That you found Langford dead because your husband killed him? No. No, it's not possible. Why not? Because I killed him. You want to sign that? Yes. What did you do with the gun? I threw it out the window. Into the courtyard of the Rex? That's right. Yes? Maggio speaking, Commissioner. Somebody here to I speak. said I didn't want to be interrupted. It's Mr. Porter. Well, tell him to wait. I just got a confession out of his wife. You're kidding. Why? I just got a confession out of him. What? He says he killed Langford. Commissioner Grant. Eric, what are you doing here? I walked into Langford's room at five minutes after 11 this morning, Commissioner. No, I... you mustn't believe him. It's no use, Ginny. I did it. He's lying. I did it, I tell you. Commissioner, I insist that you release my wife no. at once. No, now, I won't listen. Take it I easy, can't... Mrs. Porter. Take it easy now. Nobody is guilty yet. We just have to hold somebody for the record. And it might as well be your husband. Take him, Maggio. Eat your lunch, Bill. I'm not hungry. Too much breakfast? Too many confessions. Oh. It's hard to know which one of them is telling the truth. I don't know. Have you thought that maybe neither one of them is? Yeah. Still, we found Mrs. Porter on the scene of the crime. And you let her go? Not far, Libby. Is she being followed? Naturally. Besides, I can't be too definite about any of this until we find the murder weapon. Any idea where it can be? Mrs. Porter says she threw it out of the window of Langford's room. So? So Mad Joe's detailed a few of the boys to have a look for themselves. And if they find the gun? We let Porter go, wrap up his wife for murder. Hey, Commissioner. Oh, Mad Joe, have a cup of coffee? No, but I could use a bottle of aspirin. What's the matter? I just heard from the boys. Yeah? There's a closed courtyard at the Rex, Commissioner. There's an iron door that hasn't been opened since six this morning. Anything thrown into that court from six on would have to still be there. Well? Boys went over every inch of it. No gun? No gun. Hmm. And that's it. That's what, Bill? Mrs. Porter was lying to shield her husband. And you think he murdered Langford? I think he probably loves his wife, Libby. 
I think that he probably figured that she would kill Langford if he didn't beat her to it. Is this the go-ahead, Commissioner? Yeah. We'll get back to the office and indict Porter for murder. Hello, Miguelesco's lunchroom. Just a minute. It's for you, Commissioner. Oh, okay, Mike. Thanks. Hello. This is Mrs. Porter. Yes? I want you to release my husband at once, Commissioner. We've been all over this before, Mrs. Porter. Yes, but we haven't been over this. What time was Langford murdered? Sometime between 10.30 and a little after 11. It couldn't have been later or earlier. Only by a few minutes, one way or the other. Good. I want you to call Judge Hartley in the Chamber of Commerce building. Why? Because he'll tell you that my husband was there with him from 9 o'clock this morning until noon. Well, Maggio? Huh? And they just let Porter go. The alibi checked? Tight as a new pair of shoes. First Mrs. Porter's guilty, then Mr. Porter's guilty. And all of a sudden, neither one of them's guilty, and we're holding nobody. Well, stop pacing. Uh, it's a wonder I ain't out cutting paper dolls. I'm going outside where I can pace in peace. I know just how he feels. I don't. What do you mean? I'm not surprised at all. Oh, Libby. Face the facts, Bill. No two people who try to confess to a crime in order to protect each other are very likely murder suspects. Well, whom should we suspect, Libby? The city council? We should suspect the only one true criminal type left in the picture. You mean Bliss? Yes. Langford's pal. Nobody thinks of him. I've had a squad out looking for Bliss since 11.30 this morning, Libby. Oh. Well, I was wondering why... Yes. Maggio, guess who's here, Commissioner? Who? Bliss. Who brought him in? Nobody. He came in on his own steam. Send him in. Looks like we have a caller, Libby. Commissioner? Bliss? Yeah, I want to see you. I've been wanting to see you. As I understand it, you drove into the Porter Kennels this morning with a $50,000 blackmail proposition. Is that right? Langford talked me into it. He said it was going to be easy money. Didn't turn out to be so easy for him, did it? You can say that again. And you're afraid you'll be next? That's the idea. What do you want me to do about it? I got the evidence we was going to use to blackmail the porters over in my room. And you're willing to let it go for less than $50,000? i am willing to let it go for nothing. I want to turn it over to you fast so you can tell the killer, whoever it is, that I'm out of business. Okay, Mr. Bliss. It's a deal. This is my room here, Commissioner. Dark. Oh, it's on a two-by-four air shaft, lady. Come on, Matt, Joe. Hey, how about some lights, huh? Wait till I strike a match. I ain't been here long enough to find the switch by hand. The slugs cut Bliss down so fast, the match in his fingers was still lit when he hit the floor. I grabbed for the light switch, but before I could get it, the killer was out of the window. And Maggio was after him down the fire escape. Libby found the switch, and together we bent over the body. Who could have done it, Bill? Somebody we know, Libby, looking for something they don't want anybody else to see. The blackmail evidence. What else? You think they took it? Maybe they took it, and maybe they burned it. What do you mean, Bill? The ashes in this fireplace are still warm. Notice? Oh. Um, empty that pitcher into the washstand, will you? Why? Go on, go on. Okay. Now, give it to me. Thanks. Anything else I can do? Yes. You can help me see to it that Bliss's death doesn't break print for 24 hours. Why? Reasons. Oh. Are there reasons for you to be putting those ashes into that pitcher, Bill? Mm-hmm. I want to take them back to the laboratory for the boys to play with. How much can they tell you? I don't know exactly. But I'll have the report tomorrow morning. I didn't see Maggio until the next day. Whoever went out of that window at Bliss's place had led him a wild goose chase that landed him nowhere. When he walked into my office, he looked a little worn. Oh, Commissioner... This thing's got me punch drunk. Is that so? Yeah, what are you feeling so good about? What's this stuff in the box here? Ashes. Ashes? Yes, Sergeant, ashes. Looks like whoever murdered our two blackmailers burned the evidence in the fireplace at Bliss's just before we walked in yesterday. Uh, and then we're through. Unless they're copies of that evidence. Well, you think they are? I don't know. But the other side doesn't know either. 
Maggio, give me that pad. Yeah. Well, what are you writing? An item for the personal column. Here we are. Notice. Mr. Bliss, your photostats are ready. Put that in the noon edition. Oh, I get it. You figure they'll come looking for the photostats. Why shouldn't they? After two murders, they wouldn't want any loose copies kicking around. But this ad ain't got no address, Commissioner. What about it? Well, there's a half a dozen places in town that make photostats. Whoever is sufficiently interested, Maggio, will make all the rounds. Oh, and all we gotta do is be in half a dozen places at once, huh? No, we'll just pick one of the half dozen places and wait. Old man Schmidt, for instance, he's got a nice back room over at his photostatic service. And he's also sharp enough to understand an angle. I see. So I'll tell you what. I'll meet you there at 12.30. And Maggio, bring along a deck of cards. When we got to Schmidt's photostatic shop, we primed the old man, and then we played cards. Stashed in the back room where we could have a full view of the proceedings. At 2.14... The door opened, and who walked in but Mrs. Porter? I've come for the photostats, Mr. Schmidt. Photostats? Yes. Mr. Bliss sent me. Oh, yes, Mr. Bliss. May I have them, please? Uh, well, now, I'm afraid I can't give them to you without a note from Mr. Bliss. But you've got to. I mean, would it be all right if I could describe the contents? Mm. Yes. After all, if you know what they are, Mr. Bliss has probably taken you into his confidence. It's a photograph. A police photograph of the lineup in Detroit, Michigan. There's a woman in a white dress, third from the left. I see. May I have it now, please? Uh, I'm afraid not. But you said if I could describe the contents... But you haven't, my dear woman. I don't have a photo start of any such photograph. Oh. However, there are a couple of gentlemen in the back room who would like to talk to you. What? Porter saw us sitting in that back room. She was petrified. But when we explained the operation to her, she calmed down a little. And then, not ten minutes later, the door opened again. And in came another customer for the non-existent photostats. Uh -huh. And you say Mr. Bliss sent you? Yes, he said I should pick him up for him. Mm -hmm. Well, now, could you describe the contents? You've seen them yourself? I had to, my dear. I made the copies. Well... Well, then, then you know. Uh, I, I'm the girl Mr. Porter wrote the letters to. I'm Mildred Connors. I see. And what is the nature of the letters, Miss Connors? Do I have to go into that? Well, if you want the photo starts, uh, otherwise okay, I might... Okay, okay. They're love letters. We, Mr. Porter and I, were planning to run away together. Correct? Correct. There you are. Stay in this envelope. Thanks. And now I've got something for you. Hey! Put that gun away. I can't help myself, Mr. Schmidt. <laughs> you made me describe the letters, and now you know too much. You you wouldn't kill me in cold blood? I'm afraid I have to. You know as much as either Bliss or Langford knew, and I had to kill them. All right, Mr. Schmidt, back into that room. Grab her, Matt, hey, What is this? Let me go! No, Miss Connors, I'm afraid we're going to have to hold you what? on a charge of murder. I'm awfully proud of you, Bill. Oh, that was a walk away, Libby. But how did Mr. Schmidt know that Mrs. Porter's description of the photostats was wrong? Because Mrs. Porter was describing a photograph, and the lab report showed there was no trace of emulsion in those ashes. Oh, I see. see. Poor thing. She thought Bliss and Langford had that picture of her all the time. Sure. Her husband saw to that. He played on her guilt to make her think the blackmailers were hounding her instead of him and his Mildred. That was a great trick of his, confessing to the murder. He's a slick customer. He knew he was safe. He was certain somebody would establish that alibi of his before we went on trial. Well, I must admit he fooled me a little. Well, that's okay. You're looking awfully pretty tonight, Libby. Well, thank you, sir. Anybody who's as pretty as you are, young lady, doesn't have to be right all the time. Well, thank you. Well, what do you mean, Bill Grant? I was right from the start. You were? Of course. I, I said in the first place that Mildred was an overt hysteric, which implies psychologically that she's capable of pulling a trigger. And you see, she committed both the murders. Whereas Mr. Porter is psychologically completely innocent. Libby, Porter is legally guilty as a, an accomplice. Now, Bill, you've got to admit I'm right or... 
Well, you'll spoil my dinner. Okay, okay, I admit it. Mildred's an obvious case. She's a very pretty girl. And very pretty girls this day and age get away with murder. Yes, sweetheart, they certainly do. Police Commissioner Bill Grant will be back in just a moment with the Lever Brothers Police Award of Valor. But first... <whistles> Rinso White and Rinso Bright. Rinso gives a dazzling wash every time. But you know, ladies, a smart detective checks his sources of information. And maybe you'd like to know how I'm so sure Rinso's tops. I, for one, would, Mr. Sims. Where do you get your information? From two authoritative sources. One from the fact that millions of American women prove their preference for Rinso by asking for it time after time. Two from the fact that only Rinso has the recommendation of the makers of 33 leading washers. And no wonder, for Rinso's triple action formula contains a special soapy rich base, an amazing suds booster, and a marvelous grease chaser. So you can be sure Rinso will give you dazzling results. A Rinso white wash. With ease. A Rinso bright wash. With safety. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Commissioner Grant. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to present the Lever Brothers Award of Valor to an outstanding policeman and the Lever Brothers' plaque of honor to his police department, selected by Chief Peter J. Sicardi, lifetime member of the executive board of the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Tonight, the award of valor goes to motorcycle patrolman Robert A. Barons of the Cleveland, Ohio, Police Department. While on patrol duty, Barons spotted smoke and flames leaping from a neighboring house. Rushing to the scene of the fire, he attempted to enter the front door and two side entrances, but each time he was driven back by the fire. But in spite of the flames, and at the risk of his life, he finally forced entrance through the rear door, and he was able to save the lives of the entire family. To you, Patrolman Robert A. Barons, for your outstanding heroism and unselfish devotion to duty, goes $100 and this week's Lever Brothers Award of Valor. And to the entire police department of Cleveland, Ohio, under the able direction of Chief George J. Matowitz, goes the Lever Brothers Plaque of Honor for their unfailing efforts in protecting the people of their community. Call the Police stars Joseph Julian as Bill Grant and Joan Tompkins as Libby. Headquarters. Just a minute, I'll give you the detective bureau. Detective bureau, Lieutenant Cameron. This is McGrady, Lieutenant. Yeah, Mac, what's up? I'm on the waterfront speaking. I think there's something funny going on in the Silverman warehouse. The Silverman warehouse? Yeah. I just received a big shipment of furs yesterday. And I got a hunch that this band the river at was trying to lift a pelt. Oh. Have you seen anything? Yeah. I've seen several guys slipping down toward the wharf. Why don't you drop down and give me a hand? Okay, Mac. You beat it over to the warehouse and keep an eye on things. I'll pick up a couple of the boys and come right down. Okay, Lieutenant. Yes, sir? Uh, get Brady and Williams. We're going down to the waterfront. Okay, Lieutenant. Yes, sir? 
Order a squad car to the side door and sit tight for a call. McGrady's expecting trouble at the waterfront. Yes, sir. Cut the siren so if the gang has a job on for tonight, we won't scare them away. Yeah, good idea, Lieutenant. Cut your lights and swing in here. Okay, sir. You make anywhere about? No, sir. Black is pitched down on this pier. Under the rain blazes, they don't put in a few lights along this place. See him yet? Well, not yet, Lieutenant. Well, maybe he's inside the warehouse. Brady, you and Williams go around the back of the joint. Joe and I'll go in here. Yes, sir. And uh, don't make any noise. Yes, sir. Come on, Joe. Gee, you got it. So quiet down here, you can hear a... What is that? I tripped over something. Holy smoke. Lieutenant, look. Mm, a nightstick. A Grady's nightstick. Why? Here's his cap, too. Maybe something's happened to him, Lieutenant. Yeah, just what I was thinking. Wait a minute. There's somebody coming out of that warehouse. Look, he's staggering. Drunk, maybe. That man isn't drunk. Come on. Oh, oh that's Mac. Oh, easy, old man. Here. Here, give me a hand, Joe. Oh, glad you got here, Lieutenant. Oh, what a head. Yeah, nasty cut there. What happened? Oh. After I told you, I came down to the warehouse, and I hear somebody moving around inside. I look around for the old Apple, the watchman, and he's not inside. So I open the door and slip in. Uh, where was the watchman? I don't know. I think they got him, too. Go on. What happened to you? Well, I heard several men moving in the back part of the building. So I started back, and somebody tackled me. Recognize him? No, too dark in there. Oh. I felt him, though. Big man, over 200, foreigner, too, I think. He blamed me with something, and I went out like a light. I just came to. Mm, lucky they didn't throw you in the water. How'd your cap and nightstick get out here? I don't know, unless they threw him out. Oh, what a head. Uh, we've got a doctor look at that cut. How do you feel? Okay, except the head. All right. We'll have a look around inside. Give me a hand at this door. Yeah. <laughs> All right, flash your light around in here, Joe. Oh, that's better. Yeah, nothing wrong here. Move on toward the back. Maybe we can... Wait a minute. Who's this on the floor? Well, that's old Apple, the watchman. Get your light over here, Joe. Hmm, he's been beaten, too. Raise him up. Yeah. Not as bad a cut as yours, Mike. Let's see if we can bring him around. Rub his wrist. Yeah. I must have shot him before I came in. Yeah, the same guy put you out. What's that? A cap. Must be Apple. Oh, oh he's coming too. Uh, we're officers. What's happened? Oh, oh my head. Now, well, forget about your head and tell us what happened. Uh, the furs. I got the furs. Who got the furs? Did you see him? No. I was just rounding the corner when I, I saw them carrying the boxes out. I yelled at them to stop and... Somebody hit me. Uh, how many were there? Oh, about three or four. They were all in the back of the warehouse. I, I saw them moving out the first. Did you recognize any of them? No, officer. But the man who hit me was a big fellow. Oh, that doesn't help us much. Is this your cap here? No. No, that is not my cap. Okay. Well, the boys will get you home. Come on, Mac. We've got something to do. Sure knows his stuff. Well, he fixed me up so many times you couldn't count him. You're just a young fellow, Mac. You want to be careful about poking your head around in the strange warehouses. <laughs> you did right to call in. You can bet your boots I'll be more careful next time. Where are you going? Down in the slums. I know where the fellow bought that cap that we found in the warehouse. We'll go down and see if they can give us some description of him. Think they can? Well, the guy who sold this cap owns a small shop down in Spring. He doesn't do a lot of business. Yeah, but do you think he'll remember selling us? He should. It's an unusual size. Seven and three quarters. Hmm. The guy who wore it must have had the big head. Think it was bought recently? I don't know. Well, here we are. We'll find out. Well, gentlemen, 
What can I do for you? Oh, Morris. Do you remember me? Sure, Lieutenant. Always I remember the time you found my lost Becky. Sure. Hey, such a time we had. Mama was weeping and crying and Becky yeah. was weeping. All right, Morris. Yeah. Now, this is Officer McGrady. Morris Rosenbaum, Max. Uh, Morris runs the store. Hi. Hello, Mr. McGrady. I'm pleased to see you. What could I show you today? Now we have some nice uh, hats. We're, we're not here to buy a hat, Morris. No? No, we're here to find out who bought one. Uh, you sold this cap, didn't you? You got an old lieutenant. All the time I'm selling caps, hats, shoes, shirts, everything. Uh, but this cap has your store label on it. Well, that's different. Now, wait, let me see. You got any more like it? Any more in stock? I'm telling you, lieutenant, I think we got one more just like it. Uh, I want you to think hard now, Morris. Uh, how many of these caps have you sold recently? Two. One of the caps I sold to... I don't know his name. What did he look like? He was a big fellow. How old a man? Oh, but he was not an old man. He was a young man. I should say about 20. Uh, let's him out, Mac. I found gray hairs in this cap. We're looking for a man about 40, uh, maybe 50. Hey, why didn't you say so? I sold that cap to a... Uh, now, now, let me think. Now, wait, now. An old man? Uh, he has blue tennis. Oh, about three weeks ago. He came rushing in, bought the cap, and then rushing out. Oh, in a hurry, huh? Sure. He left his truck in the middle of the street. His truck? Sure, in the middle of the street. He parked it, and people were honking and tooting and tooting and honking. Oh, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. How much did he weigh? Oh, he was a big fellow, like you say. Uh, what kind of a truck was he driving? It was a coal truck. A coal truck? Did you see the name? No. No, I wasn't looking. Oh, but you say you saw it. You must have seen the name. Now, think. I am thinking. Was it one of the big companies? No, I'm telling you, Lieutenant. I wasn't paying no attention. Uh, wait a minute. Lieutenant. Huh? Only this morning I seen that same truck. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. Oh, and it was a great big truck, and it had a big star on it. That's it. The Star Coal Company. Good. Uh, where'd you see it? I don't know, Lieutenant. I forgot. Oh, yes, you do. Where were you this morning? I was down by my brother Benny's delicatessen. Benny was giving me some fine pumpernickel and gefilte fish for my lunch. I'm not interested in your lunch. Now, where did you see the truck? Right across the street I seen it. It was parked. Parked, huh? Maybe he hangs out around that neighborhood. Uh, where's your brother Benny's delicatessen? 751 Market Street. Okay, thanks, Morris. Come on, Mac. We'll take a look at the Star Coal Company. Maybe we want to buy some coal. truck, and there's the place. Star Coal Company. Looks innocent enough. Yeah. Anybody inside? Can't see anybody from here. Okay. Take off the uniform coat and your cap. What? Uh, what's the big idea? Don't argue. Yeah, now roll up your sleeves. Good. Say, what? <laughs> what are you... Here. Put your gun in your hip pocket. That's it. Now, what's coming on? They won't spot you as a cop right away. Now, listen. You walk into that place. Yeah. I think the guy in there is the man you ran into in the dark. Flash your gun on him, and we'll take him in on this John Doe one. Oh. You get into trouble, blow your whistle. Okay, I'd like to take a poke at the guy who put this bump on my head. Well, maybe this is your chance. And remember, if you get into trouble, blow your whistle, and I'll be right behind you. Okay, Lieutenant. Just let me get my hands on that guy. Uh, hello, Lieutenant. Huh? What are you doing down here? Oh, just killing time. Well, uh, take care of yourself. Okay, thanks. Hey, but mister. Huh? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, boss. Keep up and hey, you forgot to change. You got him, Mac? Yeah, but there's another guy in the back room. Get him. Okay, hold on to that guy. He's Bo Hoffman. We've had a pick on it on him for a month. I'll take care of him. Get the one in the back room. He's got a gun. I'll get him. I right, don't drop that gun. All right, I found the furs back here, Mac. Must have been sorting them. All right, buddy, slip them on. Say, uh, haven't I seen you someplace before? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I might have known you'd be mixed up on this. Step out here in the next room. Got a surprise for you, Mac. Take a look at who I found hiding in the back. Well, I'll be a knock-kneed cockroach. Old man Affle, the night watchman.
Police headquarters. Okay, Lieutenant. Hello, Tim. Order the patrol out to 742 Market Street. Yeah. And cancel that card on the warehouse job. Lieutenant Cameron just took the men into custody. Police headquarters. and fades quickly back into the shadows of his dark world. And then, the man from Scotland Yard, the relentless, dangerous pursuit, when man hunts man. Now, with Ted DeCorsia starred as the famous Inspector Peter Black of Scotland Yard, we bring you tonight's story of violence and murder, three for all. Sometime, somewhere, somehow, every man touches another and leaves a scar. A word is said, a deed is done, and a mortal hate is planted. And sometimes that hate can become death, violent death, murder. Then a man must be hunted. A man must be stalked. Through a city's crowd, through the sunlit noon, through the twilight shadows, through a thousand places. And finally, a man must be caught. Pursuit. At Scotland Yard, that's our job. Inspector Black? Yes, Sergeant. Chief Inspector Harkness wants to see you. He said, please hurry. Oh, thank you, Moffat, right away. Oh, good morning, Black. Come in, come in. Sit down. Uh, thank you. Sergeant Moffat made it sound very urgent, sir. Did he? May or may not be. I want your opinion on it. On what, sir? In this note. Came this morning's mail. It's made up of letters clipped from a newspaper. The thing was addressed to me, and it says, A man, Melville Rogers, will be found dead today with a knife in him. He will be dead. May I see it, sir? Well, of course. Have we found a man with a knife in him today, Black? Not yet, sir. We've had many notes of this type before, and nothing has come of them. Uh, however, Black, will you look into it? Of course, sir. Excuse me, Black. Darkness here. What? Yes? Now give me that address again. Gruber's Tea Shop, 12 Buxton Lane. I have it, thank you. Well, Black? Yes, sir? They have found a man with a knife in him. A man named Melville Rogers. You'll look into it, won't you? Keep moving about your business. Stand back, please. This way, Inspector. In here, sir. Uh, thank you, Mark. That one's Mrs. Gruber, the proprietor of the restaurant. I see. I shall want to talk to her in a few minutes. The deceased, sir. He was stabbed to death as you see him sitting at this table, looking out of the window. You've established his identification. Yes, sir. Name's Melville Rogers, lived in Kensington, known to Mrs. Gruber over there. Had his meals here every day. I see. And uh, who are these other people? Those three? Customers, sir. Dining at the time Mr. Rogers was discovered dead. Mm. Uh, tell me, Moffat, who noticed that he was dead? Mrs. Gruber, one of the customers? This one. Oh, I did, sir. Oh, I did all right. And who are you? Uh, Charles Bennett, sir. Two N's in one T. I live in Quimby Street nearby. Uh, did you get the name, sir? Charles Bennett. Yes, yes, Charles Bennett. Uh, tell me, Mr. Bennett, how did you happen to discover this man was dead? Well, I'm not a physician, sir, but that knife sticking in his side, and he wasn't breathing, yes. sir. Yes. 
No, I'm not a physician, but there are ways to tell when a man's dead. Naturally. You noticed this as soon as you came into the restaurant? Oh, no, sir. When I came in, the place was crowded. Not a table. So I waited. Even when there was a place to sit, I waited. You might wonder why I did that, sir. Yes, I might. Well, you've noticed I have a withered arm. Yes, I have. I don't hide it very well, do I? Oh, it's not that I'm ashamed. It's not that at all, but... You were waiting for this particular table. Why? Because, uh, well, it's obvious. It's the only table near the window. So I might sit and none of the other customers would notice me. My arm, sir. What do you do for a living, Mr. Bennett? Not much I can do. Our jobs, pedal newspapers, puttering, you might say, for a wage. But sometimes I do a painting job on a house. But you see, sir, it's my arm. It's withered. There's not much a man can do with an arm. Such as and so it went. The routine questions and answers. The peering in upon a handful of lives which had been thrown hard against violence. The important and impersonal data which would head a new file at Scotland Yard labeled Melville Rogers, Death by Murder. Melville Rogers, a recluse, a bachelor, a man who drove a bus from Battersea to Kingston. Not an enemy in the world, his friends said, which of course is ridiculous. Telephone for you, sir. Oh, thank you, Sergeant. Who is it? The caller won't say. A matter of urgency, though, it seems. Right. Inspector Black here. Really, now? Who is this? Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Who is this? <laughs> You're looking for me. Who are you? It's difficult to hear. I know. I've arranged it that way. <laughs> Man, Inspector, did you find Melville Rogers? I killed him. Sergeant Moffat, trace this call. Very well, sir. Did you ask someone to trace this call, Inspector? I'll save you the trouble. I'll tell you where I am. Where are you? On Lyle Street, in a pub, the green dot. Yeah, but, but I won't wait. Listen, Inspector, there's a man here. His name is James Campbell. He's looking at me now, and he's smiling. I'm going to stop talking with you. Then I'm going to take a walk with James Campbell. Then I'm going to stick a knife in him. <laughs> Hello? 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 <laughs> Lyle Street lies across the face of London like an open wound. It is a street that's well known to Scotland Yard. The brownstone buildings that line it present a facade of drab respectability, but within them is all that is depraved and vicious and corrupt. On Lyle Street, the essence of a man is measured in terms of his brutality. Here are the delicate refinements of crime. The long fingernails with razor blades beneath them for the slitting of pockets or of throats. The smirk of death painted on the lips of women. The green dot was no different from other basement pubs on Lyle Street. It had a massive door with a peephole through which a face peered out at you. And then you were permitted to enter because you were known. And because you were known, you are greeted with a bitter silence. Anything we can do for you, Inspector? I'm looking for a man named James Campbell. Do you know him? Now, there's a proper question, Inspector. And I'll give you a proper answer. No, I don't know James Campbell. Is any one of you James Campbell? It would be well to tell me if you are, because a man named James Campbell is going to be murdered. Oh. Now, there's an interesting bit of news, Inspector, and I'm sure all of us here appreciate it. Someone here telephoned me at Scotland Yard. Who was it, Arnold? Here. Yeah. Now, you know better than to ask me that, Inspector. All sorts of people phone to all sorts of places. There's no accounting for tastes, you know. 
How long is it since you've been in prison, Arnold? A year, two. I don't rightly care to remember unpleasant things of that sort. It could be unpleasant again, Arnold, easily, quite easily. Beg your pardon, Inspector. Yes? There's a phone call for you. For me? Yes, in the, in the booth over there. Oh, thank you. And like I say, Inspector, all sorts of people come to all sorts of places. Black here. Hello, Black Hardness. Uh, yes, sir. I understand you're down there looking for a man named James Campbell. That's right, sir. Well, I had a telephone call just now. A person with a peculiar kind of voice. He said that James Campbell can be found at 12 Clover Crossing West. That's in Soho. Get over there at once. Right, sir. Here it is, sir. Here it is, room. Mr. Campbell. James Campbell. Door's locked, sir. Yes. Sergeant. Here, sir. Here in the sitting room. Ah, no. Well, there's some more rooms, sir. Uh, look in that one. And Sergeant. Yes, sir. Look in the closets. In any place that might be big enough to hold a man's body. Yes, sir. I'll search the dead room. The steam boiled through the bathroom door, obscuring everything. The whole place was a miasma of white enamel, hazy, drenched with birds of sweat. And in the shower stall, a man, face downward, fully clothed. Blood seeped from a wound in his neck, and mixing with the water washed away. And then I saw it. A wilted piece of paper tacked to the door. A paper on which was glued words cut from a newspaper. Mr. Campbell is dead, Inspector, it said. There have been two. Tomorrow night at eight, there will be a third, it said. The second act of Pursuit will follow in just a moment. But first... The shortest marathon in the world. That's the Arthur Godfrey daytime show on CBS. Every weekday, Monday through Friday, your man Godfrey entertains for 75 whole minutes, an hour and a quarter... And the time speeds by and nothing flat. Give a listen to Arthur Godfrey's daytime show every weekday on most of these same CBS stations. And now, back to the second act of Pursuit. Murder is an ultimate, and Pursuit is a variation on the theme. But it so happened that this pursuit was in my domain, because all of London is Scotland Yard's domain. And in the morning when the papers brought the news to London, it was a city which slackened its pace to allow the horror to settle. Horror and fascination. It resolved itself into simple terms. A manhunt. Man the hunted, man the hunter. And it was the hunted who absorbed the city's imagination. The hunted who had taken special pains to make it known that some obscure lust for violence possessed him and he would kill again this evening at eight. Scotland Yard's part in it was not nearly so spectacular. All we had to do was find a man or a woman. Well, Black, you can't say this murderer hasn't given us fair warning. If you call 24 hours notice fair... And more than 12 hours of that already run out. I tell you, all of London's aroused about this thing. I know it, sir, but frankly, I don't know how we can stop him. And if we don't, someone who's walking about alive in the noonday sun will be dead by 8 o'clock. Well, you'd better get busy then, man. Oh, good day, Sergeant. Good day, sir. You haven't much time. Get busy, he says. Haven't much time, he says. Huh. Well, what do you have, Moffat? you better have a look for yourself, sir. Yeah. The life histories of the two murdered men. That is, from what information we've been able to obtain. I see. Yes, the first man who was murdered, Melville Rogers, born in Chichester. The second, James Campbell, born in Guernsey. Mm -hmm. You see, Inspector, their paths never crossed until 1939. And it's the part that's important. 
both joined the RAF as ground crewmen in 39. On the same day, trained in the same camp. I haven't had time to get their war record yet, if that's necessary. However, there's this. They were both discharged from the Sheffield barracks near Huntington. Yes, according to this, on the same day. Good work, Sergeant. Thank you, sir. You say Sheffield barracks near Huntington. On the main road, sir, as you approach it from the south. Call them. Tell them I'm on my way. Good afternoon, sir. I was told to expect you. Good afternoon, Private. I want to see the service records of two men. Melville Rogers... Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. Service records. Two men. Oh, I'm afraid that's impossible. Did they tell you I'm from Scotland Yard? Hey, but I'm not allowed in those files, sir. Well, who is? Is that trouble, Private? Uh, Corporal, this gentleman's from Scotland Yard. Oh, interesting, Walt. I'm in a great hurry, Corporal. I need some information. A man's life may depend on it. A man's life, you say? What man? Who is the officer in charge here? I'm in charge temporarily, sir. What do you want? The service records of two men, Melville Rogers and James Campbell. Oh, are they serving in this barracks? Not now. They Then we wouldn't have such records, sir. I'm sorry. They received their discharge after the war from this barracks. I see. You see what? Look, you now. You'll have to see the personnel officer through that door, sir. It's Flight Lieutenant Mordier you want to see. Thank you. Yes? Lieutenant Mordier? Yes? I'm Inspector Peter Black, Scotland Yard. Yes? I must see the service records of two men who were discharged from this barracks. Yes? Melville Rogers and James Campbell. It's urgent. Oh, no, really? It's a matter of life and death. A man's life may depend upon your getting up from that chair, walking over to wherever you have such records on file, pulling them out and handing them to I you. say. Do it. Do it fast. Well, it's quite impossible, you know. I don't know anything of the kind. Well, I was saying such matters must be cleared. S2 must clear it. Intelligence, you know. Files are confidential. Who is the intelligence officer? Major Browning, right down the corridor. The last office on the left, all the way down. Thank you. <laughs> I say, that, 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 that's a good one. <laughs> Just a minute. Uh, uh, the chap standing there wants to see me, I suppose. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. The yes. same to you, Bertie. <laughs> Yes, what can I do for you, old man? I'm Peter Black, Inspector, Scotland Yard. Uh, have a chair. I, I could ring for tea a little early. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or is it? What do you say? Uh, no tea, thank you. This is very urgent, Major. Oh, urgent, you say? Good, good. Very good indeed. Uh, What's urgent? A man's life is desperately close to drawing to an end, Major. Violently. A man will be murdered if you don't help him. What man, indeed? Huh? Major, hmm? there isn't that much time. I must have the files on two ex-members of the RAF ground crew. Two men who got their discharge here. James Campbell and Melville Rogers. Mm, uh, familiar names, both of them familiar. How familiar? Well, for, for familiar. Huh? How? Hmm? Say something. How are these names familiar? Oh, should be. I court-martialed them myself. Huh? Campbell and Rogers and... Uh, yes, and... What the devil was that uh, other fellow's name? I uh, can't think of it, can't I? Well, think of it. You must think of it. Name, name, name. T -t 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 Timothy. Uh, Timothy Hearn. N N M I. No middle initial. Timothy Hearn. That's what I want. I won't need the files if you can tell me why you remember them. Oh, uh, easy. On, on V E Day, these three rascals stole a plane. Mm -hmm. Swift, swift, absolutely. Celebrating, loaded to the aileron. Stole a Lancaster. Flew around. Didn't fly badly for for ground crew men. Ran out of gas. Bailed out. Plane crashed into a house. Killed a woman. Mrs. Edward Stanley. So that's it. Motive, revenge. You say a Mrs. Stanley was killed? Uh, how about her husband? Can't tell you a thing about her husband. Edward, uh, Edward, his name was, Edward Stanley. I tried to find him, make an adjustment, tried everything to find him. Fellow seems to have vanished from the face of the earth. Uncanny, what? Not it? really uncanny, Major. Uh, do you mind if I use your telephone? I can tell you this, though. If you want Timothy Hearn... Look in Cobb Garden. He, a busker there. Can't miss him. Oh, colorful chap. Uh, wears a red polka dot muffler. A colorful chap, yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, do you mind if I use your telephone? Yours, old boy. Uh, operator, this is Inspector Black. Put me through to Scotland Yard. I want to talk with Sergeant Moffat. Hurry. 
I say, oh, boy, why are you waiting? Would you like to hear the other one? Bertie just told me it's funny, you know. Uh, Hello, Moffat. <laughs> Inspector Black speaking. Two things I want you to do. Trace a man named Edward Stanley whose wife was killed in an airplane accident on VE Day. Do you have that? Good. And I want you to keep your eye on a busker named Timothy Hearn. Covent Garden. I'll meet you there. Sergeant Moffat. Hello, sir. Did you find anything on Edward Stanley? Not a thing, sir. There's no trace of him. The busker, Timothy Hearn. He's right over there, sir, entertaining the crowd. A clown dances and sings on a sunlit street. And the grotesque shadows that mimic him are dead. I watched Timothy Hearn, the busker, perform for the queue waiting outside the theater. He was a little man with a clown's radiant face. He wore a silk polka dot muffler and tied natalie around his throat. His clothes were frayed, but somehow he managed a kind of regal elegance. Then he passed through the crowd rattling a tambourine. Some dropped coins into it, some didn't. And then he was standing in front of me. Did you like my pantomime, sir? Always aim to please, I do. And you know, I perform for the best I am. It was fine. Here, Timothy. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. I say, may I ask how you knew my name? It's not often we buskers are given any kind of billing from our beloved public. <laughs> Is there somewhere we could talk? Oh, I'll go on again in a few minutes, sir. Acrobatic dance. Uh, perhaps we could have a nice talk some other time. Good day, sir. I'm Inspector Black, Scotland Yard, Timothy. Oh. <laughs> uh, fellow professional, you might say. Well, that sort of puts a different light on it. We can talk over here by the vegetable stall, Inspector. Very well. Well, sir, it's true I don't have a performer's permit, but I think a chap's got to do something, you know. Uh, what's the fine, Inspector? You once knew two men named Melville Rogers and John Campbell. That was a long time ago, Inspector. I've already done penance for that. Rogers and Campbell were murdered. Did you know that? Yes, I did. How did it affect you that day? After our court martial, we never spoke to each other again. I guess it was the ugly shame of it. Of all of it. Their death, how did it affect you, Timothy? I try not to think about it, sir. Timothy, this is a hard thing to tell a man, but I must. The murderer has established a pattern. I believe you are part of that pattern. Do you mean he wants to kill me, too? But why? I've never harmed anyone. Except... Except... Exactly. Except the woman who was killed in that unfortunate airplane incident. And someone who loved her very much is the man we're looking for. Before he murdered, he sent us a note. Each time there was a note announcing his victim's death. He announced yours would take place at eight tonight. What? And that doesn't give us much time, me or you. What shall I do, Inspector? Actually, there's nothing for you to do. You're to act as you always act. One of our men will be with you all the time. You won't see him, and you're not to look for him. But I want you in your own home before eight tonight. Before eight? Right, Inspector. I say, you catch him before... before we'll I'm... do our best, Timothy. I promise you, we'll do our best. <laughs> There was no turning back now. I had made a choice and accepted a responsibility. And if I were wrong, I was offering up a frightened busker named Timothy Ahern as a sacrifice to a madman. It was a setting for murder. The background was precise. A dismal corner where Marleybone Road crosses Oxford Street, damp beneath an early evening drizzle where the wetness had spread the reflection from the street lamps into a yellow film. A corner where Timothy Hearn lived. A corner of shadows and silence. At seven, a police cordon was lined around the block. A few minutes before eight, I was standing in the doorway next door to Timothy's, waiting. Inspector. Yes, yes, Sergeant. Everything's ready. Good. All the intersections covered? Yes, sir. 
No one can possibly get through. Except the busker, except Timothy Hearn and whoever might be following him, if it's a stranger. Exactly, sir. All right, off the street now, Sergeant, in this doorway with me. Yes, sir. Sergeant. Sir? The underground entrance. Look at it. Oh, I think so, sir. The busker. Yes, on time. Right on time. Why, he seems to be drunk, sir. He's not drunk. Let's go. Timothy! Timothy Hearn! Tim... Oh, Inspector. Dead. Timothy Hearn, busker, dead. And it was my fault. But how on the underground, the one place in the world where he would be with thousands of other people and still be alone. Inspector, I... Oh, what's happened? Who are you? He's the officer detailed to follow Timothy Hearn. Then why didn't he follow Hearn? Why didn't he... Inspector, I... Why didn't you, man? If you'd done your job, this fellow would still be alive. I followed my instructions, sir. He was only out of my sight for five seconds the whole afternoon. When was that? When he got off the underground train. He was walking towards the stairs when he turned suddenly, dodged through some people and bought a newspaper. Newspaper? Yes, sir. The very one that's in his coat pocket. And certainly he wasn't wounded until he got off the train. Else he wouldn't have stopped for a paper. Sergeant, come with me. You think we'll find him, sir? What? What's it, do you think? Uh, wait here, Sergeant. Cover this exit. Are there any others? No, sir. Did you just spot him, sir? You're sure there are no other exits? Only the emergency ones inside the tube. We'll not let him get that far, will we, Sergeant? And be careful. Our man is insane. I want no innocent people killed. Yes, sir. Uh, Inspector. Yes, Sergeant. You'll take care, won't you? Oh, thank you, Marvin. Now I'm going to see a man about a newspaper. Evening paper, sir. Evening standard latest edition. Paper, sir. Uh, how long have you been selling papers here, Mr. Stanley? Oh, you've made a mistake. You have. My name's Charles Bennett. So you remember me, Mr. Stanley? Mr. Edward Stanley? Your face does have a familiar look, but you're very wrong about who I am. It's Bennett that I'm called. Everyone knows that. Bennett, the one with the withered arm. That's how they called me. Man of all work, that's me. And uh, how is Mrs. Stanley, Mr. Stanley? Don't speak her name. Perhaps I can tell you. Your wife was killed, wasn't she, Mr. Stanley? By an airplane that cr crashed into your house. By three tragic men who were celebrating V.E. Day. Isn't that how it was, Mr. Stanley? I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Her name's not to be used by scum like you. They were all that to you, weren't they? Rogers, Campbell, and now Hearn, dead. As you wanted them, dead. The circle is complete, isn't it, Mr. Stanley? No. No, not quite. Not quite. Put away that gun. There are innocent people here. Innocent? You're all guilty. Guilty. Sergeant Moffat, head him off. Come on, Inspector. Come and get me. Inspector, there he goes. He's on the truck. Stanley. Stanley, come back here. Ah! that underground tube was a substance. A substance that pressed itself into my brain and down into my lungs. The body of a madman lay crushed and broken under the wheels of a train. And so, in a tragic shriek, was ended the life of a man. A man is hunted. A man is stalked through a city's crowd, through shadows, through a thousand places. And finally, a man is caught. Pursuit, and the pursuit is ended. Pursuit is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Tonight's story was written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. Featured in the cast were Raymond Lawrence as Sergeant Moffat, Bill Johnstone as Chief Inspector Harkness, and Jay Novello as Timothy Hearn. Also heard were Ian Wolfe, Eleanor Audley, Ramsey Hill, and Alec Harford. Special music was arranged and conducted by Leith Stevens. <laughs> Next week, Pursuit will bring you another dramatic story of the man from Scotland Yard, 
relentlessly hunting down those whose disordered passions breed violence and murder. With Ted DeCorsia starring as Inspector Peter Black, next week, same time, we will present another gripping story of man hunting man when we bring you Pursuit. program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Welcome to police calling on all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 150. Investigate a fire at 2124 Brandon Street. And that's all. Rolls and says. Blooded listeners everywhere, thrilled to these true exploits of crime detection reenacted for you on Rio Grande's radio program, Calling All Cars. You are able to feel that you are a part of this relentless war on crime. Every time you hear a siren shriek, every time you hear a police motor roar, your heart beats a little faster. And while you cannot actually take part in police activities, you can experience every day at least a part of their thrill. You can use in your car exactly the same Rio Grande cracked gasoline that starts police cars so quickly. The same even burning gasoline that speeds them so swiftly through dense city traffic. The same powerful gasoline that lifts them so easily up steep hills without motor ping or shifting of gear. In other words, you can have police car performance. Just drive into any Rio Grande independent service station tomorrow and say, fill her up with cracked gasoline. Before night... You'll know why so many city and county police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment specify Rio Grande cracked gasoline in preference to any other brand. We guarantee you'll get as great a thrill out of using Rio Grande cracked gasoline as you get out of listening to calling all cars. Use 10 gallons of police car performance, and you will never again be satisfied with ordinary sluggish gasoline. Remember... Only Rio Grande gives you gasoline refined by the patented Sinclair cracking process. Try a tank full tomorrow at any independent service station displaying the big Rio Grande sign. Tonight, in commemoration of the National Fire Prevention Period, we have as guest in our studio Chief Ralph J. Scott of the Los Angeles Fire Department, who will speak to you. Chief Scott. Good evening. I should like to thank the sponsors of Calling All Cars, for their cooperation in helping to make this yearly function of the fire department the success it is sure to be. Through the medium of radio, it is possible for us to show you how terrible a thing fire really is when it is out of control, and particularly as in the case you will hear tonight, in which we are dealing with a pyromaniac, a person who sets fires because of some mental derangement. We have in this department a division whose entire duty it is to scourge and prevent such crimes. This is the Arson Bureau, in charge of Captain Paul Wolf. It is his job to try to prevent incendiary fires, and when such crimes are committed, to discover and prosecute the individual responsible. A hard job, inasmuch as these pyromaniacs, or firebugs as we call them, are usually as sane and as intelligent appearing as any normal human being. There is no mark of the killer stamp upon them. Often there is no past record to help identify them. They work completely alone, and yet they are potentially the most dangerous of criminals. We of the fire department need the help of the public. You people who are listening may at any time have the opportunity to help your fire department solve this type of crime. And now on with the story. It is 8 o'clock in the evening, July 19, 1928. Summer night school classes are in session at one of the larger Los Angeles high schools. 
Suddenly, one of the students, chanting to glance out of the window, notices a faint red glow and wisps of black smoke issuing from an upper window of the nearby administration building. Miss Merrill! Miss Merrill! Yes? What is it? Miss Merrill, look, it's on fire. The administration building. Fire? Why? Oh, 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 my goodness! How dreadful! It is on fire! Here, clap! Clap! Stop all that noise! Hey, Miss Merrill, shall I turn on the fire alarm? It's right down at the end of the hall. Yes, James, and hurry! It's blazing something terrible! Okay, Miss Merrill. Oh, break glass and pull lever. Finally succeed in extinguishing the stubborn blaze, but not until it destroyed the scenery dock and part of the stage of the school auditorium, with a property loss amounting to eight thousand dollars. The cause of the fire is a mystery. It appears to be more than an accident. And on the following day, July twentieth, nineteen twenty-eight, Captain Paul Wolf of the Los Angeles Arson Bureau receives a telephone call from Fire Chief Bertinos, telling him to go to the school and make a complete investigation. Captain Wolf hurries to the scene of the previous night's fire. But a thorough inspection of the charred building fails to disclose a single piece of material evidence that the fire was of incendiary origin. However, while questioning one of the witnesses who were at the scene of the fire, he unearthed a startling bit of information. Yes, Captain, I saw the fire last night. I had a class in English history. My classroom's right across from the administration building. Tell me, do they think this fire was started by whoever set all those other fires here? Huh? Other fires? Well, what other fires? There was a fire in the gym last month, and the one in... Well, matter of fact, I don't really know. I shouldn't have... Go ahead, Mr. Pritchard. Let's have it. Well, I shouldn't have said anything. I really don't know much about yes, it. Yes, but you do know that there were other fires. You said so. Now, what about them? I'm sorry, Captain Wolf. I, I can't tell you anything further. Mr. Reynolds of the Board of Education knows about the fires and can undoubtedly give you the information you wish. I suggest you talk to him. I know nothing more about it. <laughs> Realizing that something is very much wrong at the school, Captain Wolf makes an appointment to see Mr. Reynolds, superintendent of maintenance of the Board of Education, at the latter's office. Well, yes, Captain Wolf, there have been other fires at the school. As a matter of fact, during the past 18 months, there have been eight fires, three very bad ones. Last night's well, was the most serious yet. Well, good heavens, man, why in the world wasn't the fire department called and the arson squad notified? Why do you realize, Mr. Oh, Reynolds? yes, of course, Captain Wolf, of course, but that's just the point. We're in a terrible position. You see, there have been threatening notes, warning that the school would be bombed if we notified the police or other authorities of the disturbances. Yeah, I can well appreciate your position, Mr. Reynolds. That's a tough spot to be in. But you can't just let a thing like this go on without making some attempt to check it. Oh, no, of course not, Captain. While we've tried to keep the whole thing quiet, at the same time, we've been carrying on a private investigation into the matter with absolutely no results. Fires have been started under our very noses and all sorts of acts of vandalism perpetrated and the threatening notes continue. It's apparently the work of some secret terrorist organization within the student body. But as to whom it is, we haven't the slightest idea. Now, what makes you think it's an organization within the student body? Well, in the first place, the signature on the notes. They're all signed Holy 21 Society. The contents of many of the notes demanding certain changes in faculty personnel and management of the school and the subsequent depredation against school property. Now, according to Dr. Frederick's report, oh, Dr. Frederick's the school principal, of course, the notes started appearing about uh, 18 months ago. The majority demanded all manner of changes in the school and threats of violence if the demands were not carried out or if the police were notified. Yeah, that sounds pretty serious, all right. Yes, I'm afraid it is. 
At the same time, all sorts of acts of vandalism began to occur in the school. Washrooms were flooded, desks torn up, and fires mysteriously started in various sections of the school. Meanwhile, those infernal notes keep appearing in every conceivable place, and the destruction of school property continues. The faculty is living under a virtual reign of terror out there. I'd like to take a look at some of the notes, Mr. Reynolds, if you got them. Well, no, as a matter of fact, I haven't, Captain Wolf. I believe Dr. Fredericks, the principal, has most of them. Dr. Fredericks, sir? Yes. Then he's the man I want to talk to next. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. From Dr. Fredericks, Captain Wolf receives affirmation of all Reynolds has told him. Takes the notes to his office. A careful examination of the hundred or more threatening missives, however, yields not a single meager clue as to the possible identity of the writers. But the fact that the notes are written in three distinctly different handwritings lends support to the theory that more than one person is behind the sinister disturbances. The following day, Captain Wolfe returns to the office of the principal, Dr. Fredericks. Now tell me, Dr. Fredericks, how many students have you in the school? The 3,200, Captain Wolfe. Can you get me samples of their handwriting? All of them? Yes, Dr. Fredericks, every single one of them. Well, it'll be a little difficult. It may take a little time, but I guess I can manage it. Good, and when you get them, send them all to my office, if you please. And, uh, yes, these square sheets of scratch paper that the threatening notes are written on. Is this regular school scratch paper? Why, no, Captain Wolf, it isn't. I supposed it was at first, but I found it doesn't match up with any we use here. That's odd. I'll have to make a check on that. And... Uh, yes? Who is it? Price, sir, the uh, pardon me, Captain Wolf. Come in, Price. <laughs> what is it? I'm very busy right now. You'd better... Excuse me, Dr. Fredericks, but I think you ought to know. It may have some bearing on the fire the other night. Yeah. Let him come in. Uh, come in, Price. Now, what is it? Well, I've been waiting for you to come in, sir. I didn't know you were here until a few minutes ago. I thought you ought to know right away, sir. It's about last night. At about nine o'clock, I was on my way to my room. I'd been down to the corner to eat. Well, as I came around the corner of the chemistry building, I saw a couple of figures drop to the ground from one of the windows. They saw me just as I saw them, and they beat it. I chased them and hollered for them to stop, but they got away. Did you see what they looked like? Uh, Price, this is Captain Wolf. Uh, he's investigating the fire. I'm glad to know you, Captain Wolf. Why, yes. They were young fellows. Uh, one was a colored boy, the other white. The colored boy... Well, he looked about like most colored boys. The white boy had dark hair and sort of slant eyes. Uh, you didn't recognize either of these boys as students here, did you? Why, no, sir. Does that mean that they couldn't be students here? Do you know all the students by sight? Oh, no, sir, I don't. You see, there are over 3,000. I know a lot of them by sight, but nowhere near all of them. Well, would you recognize these boys if you saw them again? I think so. At least the white boy. I might not recognize the colored boy. But the other, I think I'd know. Good. Now, I may need your help. Are you here every day? I'm here all the time, just about. I have a room in the basement in the north end of the building. You see, I'm the janitor here. I've been kept on as caretaker and watchman for the summer. And maybe I can help you some in your investigation, Captain Wolf. I've been sort of working on the case on my own hook. I haven't run down anything definite as yet, but I may at any time. If I do, I'll get right in touch with you. Well, that's fine, Price, and I won't hesitate to call on you if I need you. Armed with this meager bit of information, Wolf returns to his office, sets the machinery of the arson bureau into motion. In rapid succession, he uncovers the following bits of information. Samples of school paper, handwritings of each of the 3,200 students enrolled at school, fail to show any similarity with any of the mysterious Holy 21 notes. Fingerprint samples of all 40 members of the faculty board, after being carefully checked by the Department of Identification, failed to bring to light any indications that might serve to point a suspicious finger in that direction. Yes, sir, I discovered the first fire. No, sir, I didn't call the apparatus. I didn't think it was necessary at the time to bother the fire department. Well, of course, I realize my mistake now, sir. Every attempt to locate samples of the scratch paper upon which the notes are written ends in failure. Each school, stationery store, paper house in Los Angeles County is searched, but the answer remains the same. And it is this that finally leads Captain Wolf and an assistant to make a bold move. 
That don't make any sense of this journey, Paul. What are you going to gain by prying into the cellars of this school? Looking for boogeymen? No, not boogeymen. Swill buckets. Swill buckets? Exactly. You know what they are, the things you throw swill into? Sure, I know what they are, all right. But would you mind telling me what swill buckets have got to do with this particular case? And it'll be easier to show you. Here's the spot now. See, now, three nice big cans just loaded with refuse. Now we're going to play sabotage. What? Come on, now, give me a hand. Yeah. <coughs> what the name of all this holy has got into you, Paul? You're making an awful mess. Sure, that's the main idea. Come on, give me a hand with this other one. Here, right. there we go. Over on the side, out comes the gun. Yeah. You know, I've always wondered what made these birds like to bust things up. Now I'm beginning to understand. Hey, bust it up. Well, here we are. I hope you're happy. Yeah. Certainly made a lovely sight out of this place. Now what do we do? Set fire to it? Burn the place down? Well, I don't blame you for being a little skeptical, Art, but it's really on the up and up. I think you'll understand more clearly in a couple of minutes. Come on. <laughs> Leaving the filth-smeared north cellar, Wolf, closely followed by the bewildered aide, proceeds to janitor Price's quarters. Finds him in. Well, I'm sorry to bother you, Price, but I'm afraid our friends have been at work again down in the north cellar. How's that, sir? Well, I just came from there. The swill buckets are all knocked about, and everything is dumped all over the floor. It's not a pretty sight. The swill buckets? Yeah, the swill buckets. Anything unusual in that? Seems to me it's the sort of thing that's been happening around here lately. Oh, why, yes. Of course, Captain. It was just that I was a bit surprised, I yeah. guess. You'd better get down there and clean it up before it begins to smell. The sanitation board would like nothing better than to find something like that in the pool, you know. Oh, yes, of course. I'll go down immediately. If you gentlemen will excuse me. Yeah, of course. Well, what do we do now? Well, we wait here until Mr. Price gets busy with that swill down there, and then we're going through his room. What? You heard me. We're going through his room with a fine tooth comb. I don't just know what to look for, but for some reason or other, I've got a niche to see him. Come on. <laughs> of Janitor Price's room uncovers very little at first. But Wolf, killed in the art of investigating without leaving telltale traces, leaves nothing unturned. And at last, in the bottom drawer of Price's dresser, he finds the first real clue. Several pieces of scratch paper identical with that of the notes. Convinced that Price is the guilty man, but faced with the problem of proving it not only to himself but to the district attorney's office, Wolf tries various methods of approach. He sets a stake out of the school in which he himself plays one of the watchers. But night after night, as he lies in bushes watching the suspect, nothing happens. Yet in the morning, inevitably some further act of sabotage has occurred within the school. And then one day, as he sits in his office examining the meager facts at hand, he receives a call from Fire Chief Eno, instructing him to investigate an accident between a piece of fire apparatus and a delivery truck at an address on Brandon Street. At the scene of the accident, Wolf makes a routine investigation, finds the driver of the grocery truck to have been at fault, tells his driver to take him back to the office. And as the car speeds on to its destination, his mood is not of the pleasant. Well, all the way out to this forsaken spot to do something that anyone in the department could do instead. Say, what am I? Assistant bottle washer of the force or something? Well, maybe the chief wanted you to come out because you know you do the job right, Captain Wolf. Hey, don't try to solve something. I've been in this department long enough to recognize it when I hear it, and it won't help. That's it. You know, I was meaning to. Yeah, I know. Let me see that you don't do it. Say, Eddie. Isn't that the school over there? Yes, sir. You know, I've got half a mind to do something drastic at this point. I'm just about sore enough to get away with it. What's that, Captain? Say, pull up at the first firebox, you see, will Eddie? Sure thing. One here in the corner. Hey, hand me that fire phone out of the pocket. Yes, sir. Here you are. Right. I'll be back in a minute. Fire department. This is Captain Wolf. Let me talk to Chief Enos, will you? Right away, Captain. You know, I have a feeling Enos isn't going to like this. But I know how to take care of all that. Hello, Paul. What's up? Hey, listen, Chief. I'm out here by the school, and I'm going to bring Price in. What's that? I said I'm going to bring Price in for questioning. Oh, listen, Paul. You're taking a terrible chance. You haven't anything on him. If you do this and we can't crack him, you'll be wise. 
And we're whipped. Huh? I can't hear you very well, Chief. But I'll be in soon, and then you can tell me. I'm telling you not to do it. Can you hear me? Don't do it. Okay, Chief, I hear you. That's fine. I'll have him in there in a jiffy. Goodbye. How'd you make out? Oh, fine. Just fine. The Chief was delighted. And now drive me over to that school and don't waste any time. At the school, Wolf finds Senator Price busy at his duties explaining that there are a few points that he would like cleared up, but giving no clue that he suspects Price, Wolf guides him to his office, offers him a chair, a cigarette. Then, in a conversational tone of voice, he carefully baits his suspect. You know, Price, you're an amazing sort of a fellow. Well, thanks, Captain Wolf, but I don't quite understand what you mean. Well, here you are, a janitor, and working at a school in a menial sort of a job, and yet it's easy enough to see that you're an intelligent man. You've had an education. Circumstances and... sometimes alter one's plans, Captain Wolf. Sure, I, I guess they do. But you're not a very good janitor, are you, Price? I feel that I am. Yet you let all these things happen right under your nose and you don't stop them. How do you explain that if you're such a good janitor? You know as well as I do, Captain Wolf, that those things are unexplainable. No, you're wrong there, I know, but not as well as you do. Isn't that right, Price? I, I don't see where all this is leading to. Oh, yes, you do, only too well. Now, look here, Price. Why don't you stop all this fooling around and settle down and tell me the truth about this mess? Are you insinuating that I know who's doing all this? More than that, Price. I'm saying that you're doing it. And I've got certain facts to prove my statement. Why, this is mad. You're mad. The whole idea is mad. Mad, huh? You seem to like that word, Price. Maybe it has some bearing on all that. What do you mean? Don't you have moments when you go a little mad yourself? How do you know? Who, who have you been talking to? I know. I know that man on the car. That man that knew me. Yeah, sure, that's the one, Price. That's the one. Now, come on. Take it easy. Spill it. All right. All right, Captain Wolf. I'll do my best. There are some things I'm not just clear on, but I'll do my best. Say, that's fine. I'll just tell you the whole story and everything will be all right. Well... Well, I have headache. Bad headache. Had them for a long time. Ever since that day in Brookline. Yeah, well, tell me about that day, Price. What happened? It was before they sent me to the Westboro Asylum. I was working as a linesman for a power company. One day in the rain, I was up repairing a transformer. Working on a line outside the second story of the powerhouse. Mac was down below... How's she going, friend? Okay, Mac. Won't be long now. I uh, hope not. I'm getting waterlogged. Man, sounds like that thunder's getting lots closer, eh? Huh? Hey, did you see that flash of lightning? Yeah. When it's close, too. Oh! Oh, good Lord, it's hitting. It's knocking down like a fly. Hey, give me a hand here, somebody. Give me a hand. Knocked to the ground when the lightning struck the powerhouse. Fractured my skull. At least that's what they thought, but I guess my head was damaged more than that. After I got out of the hospital, I began to have spells. I'd kind of wander around. Then when I'd come to, I'd usually be near some burning house or barn. You know, Captain Wolf, I don't know myself if I set those fires to the barns and things back there. I'm not sure at all. Well, it's more than likely that you did, Price. Go on. Well, they finally picked me up and stuck me in the asylum. I was there a year when on Christmas Eve, I was trimming a Christmas tree, and I fell off a ladder. Yeah, I had another fall, huh? Yes, landed on my head again. But apparently the fall removed a blood clot that had been pressing on my brain and restored my sanity. They decided I was all right and released me. What did you do then? Came to California. Everything was smooth sailing for quite a while. I felt fine. Never had any more dizzy spells or anything. And one day, when I was riding in a streetcar, I felt as though someone was looking at me. I looked up and recognized a man I used to know back at the Westboro Asylum. He was staring at me, and his eyes seemed to get bigger and bigger and closer to me until they were almost touching me. Those huge, big eyes. I got dizzy and my head hurt. I got off the streetcar at the next corner, feeling pretty badly. Well, after that, I began getting terrible headaches again. About that time, I got the janitor job at the school. The spells and headaches kept getting worse. Then one night, while I was lying in bed in my room in the basement with my head feeling like it was going to burst, I thought I heard a voice. Frederick Price. Frederick Price, my son. Who is it? Who are you? Who are you? 
It is I, your father, Moloch, the god of fire and flame. Mighty Moloch, god of fire. Do you know me, my son? Don't you know your father, Moloch, god of fire? Yes. Yes, I know you, father. I know you. There is work to do, my son. Work to do. Work. Work. Yes, father. Yes, I know. Work to do. Work. You must burn. Destroy. Yes. Burn. Yes. Destroy. Yes. Burn. Destroy. Burn. I guess I must have gotten out of bed and gone out and started a fire, Captain Wolf. Because I suddenly came to and found myself in one of the upper halls of the school, near a flaming coat closet. I put it off myself and reported it to the head janitor next morning. It's been like that ever since. Oh, I guess I'm crazy, Captain Wolf. But I swear I can't help it. I can't stop when I hear that voice. I want you to lock me up somewhere where I can't do any more damage. That's the only thing to do with me. Maybe sometime you'll kill me. But for now, lock me up. Put me away. Please put me away. Pleasure now in presenting Judge Thomas C. Gould of the Superior Court, Los Angeles County. Judge Gould. Frederick Price was bound over to the Superior Court of Los Angeles County, and his trial there upon the charge of arson followed. It was evident at all times that the man was suffering from some mental disease which turned him at moments into a true pyromaniac, causing him to set fires of which he had no knowledge later. This court found him not guilty by reason of insanity and sent him to the state insane asylum at Patton, where he spent some time. Later, at the request of a large organization of which he was a member, he was released to be transferred to a private sanitarium in the East, where he is now confined. Thank you, Judge Gould. Ladies and gentlemen, would you like to bring pleasure to some boy or girl of your acquaintance without extra cost or inconvenience to yourself? Then listen to this. Every youngster who follows this program and there are thousands of them, longs to be a detective, a policeman, a G-man. Rio Grande has brought reality to this dream for thousands of boys and girls by giving junior G-man and detective outfits absolutely free. You can make this dream come true for your boy or girl, just by a little cooperation. Drive to your nearest Rio Grande independent service station for your next tank full of gasoline. Ask for a free copy of Calling All Cars News. Besides interesting detective and movie news, it tells all about police badges, G-man, flash guns, Sam Brown belts, and other gifts that will delight the heart of any youngster. You could get 14 different gifts just by using a few gallons of Rio Grande cracked gasoline. And if you happen to be the youngster, pass this information on to the proper party. Your very first tank full of Rio Grande cracked gasoline will show you why police and fire departments of Los Angeles, Oakland, Maricopa County, Arizona, and many, many other cities and counties buy it in preference to any other brand. Your Rio Grande independent dealer will also recommend Sinclair Motor Oil as enthusiastically as he endorses Rio Grande cracked gasoline. He knows Sinclair Oil will stand up under the most grueling use. In fact, he guarantees it to stand up. Sinclair Motor Oils are recommended by independent dealers from coast to coast. Sinclair Eyes for safety. Attention all cars. A cancellation broadcast 150. Suspects in this case are now in custody. And that's all. Rolls and Rolls. Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now by transcription behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup.
work, Ben. Uh, Kendall picked up two good prints at the jewelry store and checked right out. They fit Hennessy. Well, how about the mug? Bertram Goldberg and Carlisle made him right away. Murph went through Hennessy's room, found most of the stuff from the McClure Hall. The rest of us bound to turn up. Fellow show up yet? Well, Corden said he might be a little late. I told Pete to run Hennessy on the last batch. Got the 48 coming through tonight. Oh? Yeah. Hennessy fell from Colorado Springs four years ago. The same stuff? Jewelry store? Uh, cattle rustling. Huh? Yeah. Oh, this boy's been around. He still owes him five for breaking parole in Cannon City. <laughs> I'll be done. Well, I'll grab one over here. I want fellows come in and show him over, will you? Right, please. Hey, I have your attention. You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and chart. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. Please be prompt with your questions or identifications. When the prisoners leave here, they're sent to the washroom and dressed back into their jail clothes. It makes it quite difficult to bring them back after they leave here. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. All right, bring on the line. Keep it moving, boys. Right over here to the end of the stage. Spread out, stand facing the screen. Look straight ahead, no talking. Okay, number one, Saul Greenberg, Grand Theft Auto. Get your hands out of your pockets, Saul. Yes, sir. Where do you live? Uh, Omaha, Nebraska. The last place you slept, Saul. Oh, uh, Yorkshire Arms Departments. It's in the Riverside District. I don't know the address. Any weapons when you were picked up? Yeah. What? Well, I had a gun and knife. Well, let's start with the gun. What kind? What make? A little twenty-two pistol, single-shot Smith. How big was the knife? Oh, about this long. Ten inches? Eight inches? About ten inches. How long you been in town, Saul? Since last Thursday. Don't look at me. Look out there through the screen. Were you alone when you were arrested? Yeah, I was alone. What kind of work you do? I don't work exactly. You mean you've never worked in your life? Oh, sure, but I mean not on a job, you know. No, I don't know. What do you mean? What do you do to make a living? I steal cars. Thank you, Saul. Next, number two, James Shanks. Burglary. Up to the circle. Yeah. Living any particular place these days, Jimmy? Oh, nah. Now, you know me, Sergeant. Uh, Carger, huh? Yeah. I ain't so good no more. Uh, how, how you been? Fine, fine. Where'd you sleep last night, Jim? L- last night? Yeah, last night. Over on Glenview in a parked car. How about the night before? Oh, same street and a different car. <laughs> Ever think about getting a job, Jimmy? Oh, sure, sure. I, I thought about it a lot. That all? I had a job once, Carger. I like to kill I'm me. I'm Sergeant Carger, Jimmy. Oh, no, no offense. Anybody with you when you were arrested? Uh, I was going to tell you about when I worked. Answer, Answer the questions. Anybody with you when you were arrested? Well, yeah. A guy named Donald. You don't know the rest of his name? Oh. Just Donald. I, I don't know him very long, an hour or two. Donald Rhodes? Well, he's in the next room. I saw him here just before I come out here. He's a nice kid. You know how old he is? No. He's 17, Jim. This is his first lineup. No, honest. Honest? His first, huh? Well, what do you know about that? I know he won't like it very much, Jim. Number three, Rudolph Tate, open chart. Where do you live, Rudolph? Uh... 43, 356 North 107th Street. What do you do? I'm a butcher. Where do you work? Uh, Lands down market. When were you arrested? This morning at the market. Anyone else arrested with you? Yeah. Him. 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 And him. You know these men? Sure. George Zimonetti, right there. Frank and Paul Dorsey, the other two fellas. And Vic Spade. How long you known them? Which one? Zimonetti. Well, all of my life. How about the Dorsey brothers? All I'm see is about, oh, I guess about five years, maybe six. And Spade? Just a couple of weeks. It's his fault. What's his fault? It was all his mm-hmm. idea. He come in Captain and asked Waldo us to do it. Captain Waldo wants you in his office. Make yeah. you do it, Rudolph? I'm telling you, he had the idea in the first place. The whole thing was his I'm idea. Quiet. But did he make oh, you do okay. it? That's uh, what uh, I want Take care of fellows when he comes in. I'll well, be with Rudy, Waldo. Uh, Here's the sheet. All right. Oh, his idea. Okay, Asher. We'll see That's all I can say. All right, slide on down. Number four, George Demonetti. Ooh, it's hot in there. Air conditioning went out. Again? Ah, it's a mess. I want to pull the whole system out and start over. Oh, you said it. Maybe someday. Maybe. <laughs> Bill? Keep working on them and check with me later. Ben's starting from this end. Come in, Ben. Answer. Yeah, that's right. He just came in. Okay. Bye. Ben, Ed Drinkler's been snatched. The restaurant man? Yeah. 
His wife got this telegram at 8 o'clock tonight. Western Union people notified us. Mm -hmm. I have your husband. I want 10,000 in 10s, 20s, 50s. i let you know where you can pick him up. If you call him the police, he'll be dead. Stand by. It was phoned into the office from a pay booth in Arveda. No way to track it down. Let's see that, Ben. Yeah, here. Now, this is the story. Drinker called his wife from his office last night about six and said he had some work to get out. Mrs. Drinkler called him back there about nine, and he said he'd be home by midnight. Mrs. Drinkler went on to bed. When she got up this morning, she assumed he'd left the house already, but when he didn't show up for dinner tonight, she got worried and phoned the office. They told her he hadn't been in all day long. Mrs. Drinkler was phoning friends around town looking for him when the wire came in. Small got there about half an hour after the messenger boy. He's still there. Any leads? I sent a detail down to Drinkler's office. Murph and Crockett talked to his secretary and office manager. They weren't much help. People who work in the building, night watchman and scrub lady, said Drinkler had a visitor about 10 o'clock last night. Tall man, well-dressed. Gave a pretty hazy description. Could have been anyone. We're checking it out. That all? That's about it. Drinkler's car is still parked in the rear of the building. Something may turn up later on. Right now, we're going to have to play along. Well, what happened? Well, Mrs. Drinkler didn't have any trouble getting the money. It's being marked right now. Boys are working on it. You know what we're up against, Ben. Can't spend too much time. We'll have to figure it out as we go along. Yeah. Here's the address. 313 Cherry Drive, straight out York. Till you get to the parkway, then right. Two blocks beyond the golf course. Take uh, 17K. It's cleared with motor pool. Okay. Place might be watched. Park down the street and go in the alleyway. I've uh, got units here, 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 and here. Radio control's all set up. All right. A contact will be by phone or message again. It's the only way right now we can depend on getting any kind of lead. Small, Adler, Papish, and some men from the crime lab are out there. Federal man should be along pretty soon. I'll bring Carger and Quine out with me later on. Okay, that's it. All right. Now, uh, use anything, anyone. Do anything that occurs to you, Ben. I'll be right with you all the way. Okay. Oh, uh, Bill. Huh? Now, how is Mrs. Drinkler taking it? She wants her husband back. Hi, Small. Hi, Ben. Asher. Hi. This way. Mrs. Drinkler's in the next room. She's scared silly. Uh, Can you blame her? No, but we're going to need her if they happen to call. Yeah. Lab put in another line here and three extensions on the original line. This one in here, one on the floor below us in the kitchen, and one in the hallway. All right. Asher, take the extra line and check the telephone company. And uh, keep all the lights out except in the living room. Right, Ben. They tricked up a tape recorder. Any call comes in will go on the tape automatically the minute the connection's made. Circuit's wide open? Yeah. What do you think, Ben? Well, she got the wire three hours ago. I don't think they'd take any chance of staking the place out to see what she did. Looks too good right now. Holding him a whole day before contacting her. Well, there's a chance they'll call in tonight sometime, if they cased it at all. You got a smoke, Ben? Uh, here. Thanks. Anybody else in the house? Boys in Europe this summer. The cook left two days ago on a week's vacation. Mrs. Drinkler's been holding it down. Well, I guess I better... Oh? Uh, feeling a little better, Mrs. Drinkler? Why don't you all go away, Sergeant? Why don't you leave my home, please? We want to help you, ma'am. This is Lieutenant Guthrie. How do you do? Will How you do you please do? Please take these men away. Uh, Mrs. Drinkler, we're going to do everything humanly possible to bring your husband back here safely and to get the people responsible for taking him. I, we should try to see it our way. He's my husband. I want him back. I'll pay them the money they want. I just want my husband, don't you understand? Yes, ma'am. I, we want him back, too. He's our first concern. Please, Mrs. None Drinkler. None of you understand. None of you. They'll get frightened when they know you're here. They'll kill him. They'll kill Ed. There's nothing to stop them. There's everything to stop them. They know that the police and federal people would never stop looking for him if they did that. You don't really believe that, Lieutenant. I know you don't. I've been sitting in my room thinking about it. They'd kill him because there's no reason to keep him alive. Get no, Dr. Gerson out no here. No right. reason at all. 
Now you people are here and they'll kill him because you're here. Uh, wouldn't you like to go because in the bedroom? Because you're here. Why are you here? To get your husband back alive, no. Mrs. Franklin. No, that isn't true. He's been missing a whole day. You think Ed's already dead, don't you? Please, if you just try You know to... he's already dead, don't you? You know it. We only know that he's got to be found, Mrs. Get Franklin. out! Get out of my house! Get out! Get out! Get out! You're making me feel it! Gerson wants to take her down to the hospital. Is she out of it? Yeah. Well, this is Officer Grace Hanley, Ben. Uh, hello, Grace. How do you do, Lieutenant? You know the setup? Yes, sir. Everything may depend on the way you answer that phone if the kidnapper calls in. I know, Lieutenant. I try to stall him, do anything, so we'll stay on the wire long enough to trace it. I understand. You can take it in here. I'll be downstairs. Make yourself comfortable. Thank you. We'll keep you. Oh, uh, don't jump it if he rings. I want to hear his voice, so we'll uh, have to pick it up together. I know. Anything more on that description? Well, Quine took a crew and went to work on it. The man who runs an all-night diner remembered a black caddy sedan out in front of the building. Thinks he saw a drinkler and another man get into it about 10 o'clock. Time checks with the others? Yeah. Fits with a tall angle, too. But that's about all. No license? Nothing. Waldo put out an APB on drinkler and what we have on the other man. Car's not much help. Yeah. Well, long night coming up. Yeah. Pete... Yeah. As near as we can make it, he was taken around ten last night. Yeah. Think he might still be alive? I'm afraid to think, Ben. Two still awake? Trying to be. I think I'll see if our policewoman's still alive. Well, she's had night duty for three months. She's used to it. Mm. Hi. Hello. Your house full of policemen. It's sure quiet around here. We have a quiet time. Asher. Yeah. Hold it, Grace. You say when? We'll both pick up on the count of three. Asher. One, two, three. Hello? Hello. I want to speak with Mrs. Drinkler. This is Mrs. Drinkler. Are you the man... Did you get the money? Yes. In ten, twenties, fifties? Yes, just as you asked. It's all... What do you want me to do? Get ten thousand more. What? You heard me ten thousand more in tens, twenties, and fifties. I can't get that much money. It took everything I... I'm not going to argue with you, Mrs. Drinkler. If you want to see your husband again, get another ten thousand. But... And remember, no police... I'll kill him if you call on the police. Please, listen to me. 10000 is all I can get together. I know that isn't true, Mrs. Drinkler. I want $20,000, and I want it at 9 o'clock tonight. Well, where? What do you want me to do? Drive over to the Museum of Natural History in City Park. Park your car there by the fountain. Have the money in a bag. Just wait by the fountain. Please. Okay, Grace. Good job. He's off. Okay, okay. Thanks a lot. Sorry, Ben. He wasn't on long enough. We lost him. Almost 300 specialists, reporters, writers, technicians, and engineers are on the job for CBS Radio at the Democratic Convention. That's one reason why CBS Radio convention coverage is complete bringing you not only the meetings on the floor, but also the highlights and news breaks all around Chicago at convention time. Another reason why CBS radio coverage is best is because of its famous reporters, Edward R. Murrow, Lowell Thomas, Don Hollenbeck, and many more. Stay tuned to CBS radio for the whole story of the Democratic Convention.
set, Ben. Everybody's here. City engineer's office sent up that map? Yeah, it's marked already. Good. Okay, boys, the lieutenant's here. Let's get it down. <laughs> All you men have your sheets on this? <laughs> it's pretty scanty. We haven't got much to go on, but we're going to have to use what we have. Tall man who drives a black 46 Cadillac sedan. That's all we know about him. We want to know a lot more. Pete? Yeah. All right, come on up a little closer here. This is City Park. Covered on the east by Federal Boulevard, west by Franklin Street. 33rd runs to the south, parkway to the north. 16 road entrances to the park. Now, here's the way it'll work. Two men to a car, one car to every entrance. We start numbering them from the Federal Boulevard entrance. One, and then here's two, and three, and so on. Your men will be in cars covering the entrances. There'll be other units working Federal, Franklin, 33rd, and Parkway. Well, what about the museum itself, then? Yeah. Well, I can't take a chance. We'd like to have some men in there because it's nearest to the fountain meeting place, but someone in the museum might be connected with it. There's no way to station or hide a police officer around that fountain. The Park Commissioner's going to help us all he can. The whole thing's pretty much up to us. We hope the kidnapper shows up to get his money. We hope he'll drive the black Cadillac. We hope he's a tall man and that we recognize him. How's the other part of it going to work? Officer Grace Hanley's going to fill in again. She'll wear one of Mrs. Drinkler's coats and she'll drive Mrs. Drinkler's car over to the park tonight. Anybody hidden in the car? She'll be alone. Communications will make up a new code signal for tonight. You'll get it in your radios. Any questions? Yeah, when, when do we start? Well, I'm staggering him. First car goes in at 4 o'clock. Anything else? I guess that does it, Pete. Okay. Right, Ben. Israel and Pollard, 16K on gate 1. 4 o'clock. How's it look, Ben? Well, seems like the best thing we can do. Try to sucker him into a trap. Uh, I don't like it. Well, neither do I, Bill. This bird's really done a slick job. Not one lead. Nothing we can get hold of. Yeah. Anything new in the car? Not even a possible. Benny's got us. The whole force has been alerted. Drinkler's description's been broadcast every half hour since 9 o'clock last night. The kidnapper and the car's on the wire all over the country, and still he's got us. I don't want anybody taking a break until we get him. Right, Bill. Waldo. Uh, hold it, Ben. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's check it out. Bye. Small. Man at the diner picked one. Mm hmm? A guy named Charles Newton. Says he looks like the man who was with Drinkler. Here it is, Ben. The whole package. Oh. And where's the make sheet? Oh. Charles Edward Newton, male Caucasian, age 31, height 6 feet 2 inches, weight 162 pounds, dark brown hair, blue eyes, last known address, 5768 Gilpin Avenue. Previous arrest, narcotics, August 3, 1949. <laughs> there's a mama sheet here. Yeah, there's not much on it. He's from Topeka, Kansas. Okay. Let me see that. Mm-hmm. Doesn't look much like a kidnapper, does he, Ben? I don't know. What's a kidnapper supposed to look like? Hey, here it is, Pete. 5768. Yeah. Well, at least the dog's at home. Yeah. Yeah, what is it? Uh, police officers, we'd like to ask you a few questions. Police, you say? Yeah. Would you like to come in? Well, thank you very much. What is it? What's wrong? We'd like to know your name. Julie Newton, Ms. Newton, why? What's your husband's name? Thad Newton. I'd like to know why you're here. We're trying to locate a man named Charles Edward Newton. We understand he lived here once. Oh, no, you're mistaken. Charlie never lived with us. Oh? Well, then you know him. Well, Charlie's Thad's brother. But he just had his mail sent here. He never lived here. Well, do you know where he's living now? He in trouble? I just want to talk to him, ma'am. You know his address? Oh, yeah. I have it written down. I have it somewhere here. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Here it is. It's 35, 35 Columbine Street. 
Columbine? Yes, 3535 Columbine Street, Kansas City, Missouri. Well, how long has he lived there, Mrs. Newton? Oh, a month, I guess. Last time we saw him, he said he's on his way, and that's five weeks ago, anyhow. Uh-huh. You know where he actually lived here in town? No. Thad told me Charlie wasn't... Well, he got in trouble now and then. Charlie only came here twice. Now and then he'd call us if he had any mail or phone calls, but he never let us know where he lived. Did he have any mail or phone calls? Once, a girl called up. I think she was from a used car lot in town, but that's all. Charlie called up later, and I told him about it. Now, when was this? Just before he left. Did Charlie have a car? No, I think he bought one from that lot. Do you remember the name of the used car deal? Empire Motors, I think it's called. I'm not sure. You know what kind of a car he bought? Well, it's the one he drove by, and it's a real nice one. Hmm? He came by to give us this address just before he left. He was driving a real nice car. When I asked him if he was going to buy it, he said he thought he would. It was a used one, but it was very nice. Cadillac, big black sedan. car was purchased the fifth of last month. Man at the used car lot identified the mug, but sales slip showed Newton used the name Raymond Atlas. Same address on Gilpin. Yeah. Put out a supplementary APB. Turns out a lot better now. Had a complete description on Newton and the car. Well, he's somewhere in town. At least he was yesterday. Anything from Kansas City? Yeah, it just came in. No Columbine Street there. Yeah. Well, 3.30. You going out to the park pretty soon? I hope we don't have to. Get anything out of Newton's brother? He said he didn't have much to do with Charles. Thought he might have worked as a cook in one of Drinkler's restaurants once. Didn't know. Checking it now. He set it up all right. Yeah, he sure did. Hi, Ben Quine. Hi. I talked to the bartender and owner of the Curtis Bar. He remember Newton coming in there off and on for a year. Says he came in about a month ago and told everybody he was leaving town. Haven't seen him since. Mm. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, that's about the only place we had listed on his mama sheet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right. he's covered up ben. everything... Yeah? Uh, Pete's waiting for you in the garage. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, did Small check in? Yeah, Mrs. Drinkler had a stroke. Ben? She's paralyzed on one side. Can't recognize anybody. Aircraft plant must be letting out. Yeah, they take the boulevard up to Colfax. There are a lot of cars. Yeah. <laughs> that guy. Huh? Ticket. What'd he do? Cut out. Hit the radio, will you, Pete? Hmm. Oh, it'll be dark in another half hour. Paper said the sun is set at 732 today. Hmm? 33. At 211. 2345 Kirk. See the man. 99. A 415, number 312, Eldon Plate. See the man. Should be all set up now. Yeah, I'll check. 17K to unit 304R. Come in. 304R to unit 17K. This is Waldo. Go ahead, Ben. Everybody set? Stand by. Roger. Want to take Parkway for a while, Ben? Yeah, won't hurt. You see that follow-up on Newton? Why? 1946, passed civil service examination for the department. Huh? Yeah. He was going to be a cop once. <laughs> 304R to unit 17K. Go ahead, 304R. Everyone's posted here, Ben. Nothing so far. Okay, Bill. Hey, ben. Huh? Up there. Hold on, Bill. 34 early, 678? Yeah, that's the car. 17K to 304R, spotted suspect. License number 34 early, 678. Black Cadillac sedan, headed east on Parkway. Roger. 304R to control 4. 304R to control 4. Suspect traveling east on Parkway. He turned off, Ben. Yeah. 17K, suspect turned right at 27th Street, now traveling north. We are following. 304R to control 4. All units stand by. You've seen us, Ben. We'll have to run him, Pete. Let her go. Unit 66, 68, 53 cover intersections at Randall Boulevard and 27th. Unit 35 and 22 move in on the nearest crossing to Randall and 27th. 105A, 116K, 118K, yeah. calls in on intersections of the highway and Two federal. police cars. Uh, he's seen them. Yeah, right against that signboard. Yeah. Ah, there he goes, Ben. Newton! Look out, Pete! You all right? Yeah. Come on. 
Which way? Toward those houses. Uh, no. He's doubling back for the street. Yeah. He's over there. Yeah. He wouldn't stop, Ben. He began firing at everybody in sight. Yeah. Better get an ambulance. Yeah. Come on. Sure smashed up the front of it. Yeah. Ben, over here. Find something? Sprinkler. Stuffed in the trunk. Yeah. He was going to deliver him. Yeah. Before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you The Lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you are sure or not too sure, the The lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie, with Jack Moyles as Sergeant Pete Carger, was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were High Everback, Raymond Burr, Joe Duval. Howard McNear, Peter Leeds, Virginia Gregg, and Gene Bates. The lineup was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. Many people may not have enough money to contribute to our national campaigns, but the men. Today, the Amir at the battle lines of Korea is pitifully thin. American men may be suffering, perhaps dying, because of a lack of that life-giving plasma. Make your blood contribution now. Give to America's bloodline a lifeline to Korea. Tune in history. Hear the Democratic Convention on the CBS radio network. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to auto theft detail. In three months, more than 250 cars have been broken into property mounting well into thousands of dollars has been stolen. Two youthful members of the gang have been apprehended. The all-important brains of the criminal ring, the leaders, are still at large. Your job? Get them. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, March 2nd. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the night shift out of auto theft. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the interrogation room, and it was 10.58 p.m. when I got to room 26, chief of detectives' office. Real tough kids, aren't they? Yeah, they won't admit a thing. Now, sit down. Thanks. When'd you pick him up? About 8.30 tonight in the parking lot behind the Star Theater out on Sunset. 
He was lifting the radio out of a 48 convertible. He's had lots of experience. The report says you picked up a 19-year-old girl with him. She was waiting for the guy in a parked car across the street from the theater. The car was full of loot. Uh, the first real break we've had on those auto burglaries in three months, and it's no good to us. Well, neither one of them will talk. They won't even admit they know each other. You run makes on them? Just did. We've been questioning the boy for an hour, getting nowhere. Uh, what's his name again? Freeman. Stanley Freeman. Ah, uh, yeah. Age 20. Address? Butte, Montana. Down here for a vacation. Uh, he doesn't lie very well, Ed. He's never been to Butte, Montana in his life. Knows less about the town than I do. Well, get to him. Right, Ed. Where'd you put the girl? We had a policewoman take her to our office. We can talk to her when we finish with the boy. Well, what's her story? Hasn't any. She won't even open her mouth. Nineteen years old. Probably needs a good spanking. Now get him to talk. Right. Did you run a make, Joe? Yeah, he's clean. Get wise, huh, Flatfoot? Look, you're in a bad spot, son. That kind of talk isn't going to help. Says you. We caught you red-handed trying to steal a radio that didn't belong to you from a car it didn't belong to you. Is that right? That's enough to send you to San Quentin, boy. You better give us the story. Shut up. We've got all the evidence we need for him. Maybe you don't realize how serious this is. We've had more than 250 car burglaries in this city in the past three months. Over $200,000 worth of the property has been stolen. That's a lot of money. So what? So you're the number one suspect, young fellow. Your method of operation in breaking into that car tonight is the same used in most of the other burglaries. That means you're not going to be tried just for this job tonight. What are you getting at, Flatfoot? Listen, son. In the state of California, breaking into a locked car is a felony. You can go to state penitentiary for that. And we're going to file a complaint of burglary with the district attorney in the morning. You say you're from Butte, Montana. All right, I don't believe you, but we'll make sure. Ben, go down to our office and call the news photographers. Stanley here is going to have his picture on the front page of every newspaper in Los Angeles tomorrow. Right, Joe. No, you can't. I won't let you. I got my rights. What's the matter, youngster? Everybody wants his picture in the paper. Yeah, well, I don't. I won't let him. We got your picture already for him, remember? They took it when they fingerprinted you. You can't use it. You can't. I'll get a lawyer. Reporters will be over in a couple of minutes. We have to give them your story and your picture, too. Uh, this one. You won't! You won't! Give all it to right, me! All right, all right. Give it to all me! All right, Freeman, get your hands off him. Now sit down. All right. Now let's have it straight. Uh, don't let him use the picture. Don't let him. You can't. You can't. We gotta have the truth, son. Now look, you're 20 years old. You know right from wrong. You'll have to take your medicine. If you cooperate, we'll do all we can to help. I... I live out in the Wilshire district. All I wanted was a little extra money. We didn't take much. We didn't think it was so wrong. It was stealing, Freeman. You know that's wrong. Where do you live out there? Piper Avenue. 821 Piper. Oh, you won't give him my picture. You live there with your family? Yeah, my mother. Father's dead. Uh, promise me you won't give him the picture. My mother, she'd see it. Oh, uh, promise me. You're working with a gang on those auto burglaries. We know that. Now, who are they? Where are they? And what's the setup? I can't. They get me for it. Who'd get you? I can't tell you. I can't. Who's your girlfriend, Stanley? The one you were with tonight. Joanne. Joanne Miller. Where does she live? Piper Avenue, same as me. Lives on the same block, 866. Is that her home? She live there with her folk? Yeah. Mother and father. They work. And you got her into this. Isn't that the story she gave us, Ben? I did not. I didn't. It was her. She said a bunch of kids were doing it. It was quick money, something to do at night. She started it. All right, Romero. I'll go see the girl. You stay here with Freeman. All right, Joe. Just stay put in that chair, Freeman. Hi, Marge. Hello, Joe. You and Romero handling this case? Yeah. I'd like to talk to the girl a few minutes, Marge. Would you stand by? Right. I'll sit over here. Thanks. All right.
right, miss. What's your name, age, and address? I told this lady cop 15 minutes ago I'm not saying anything. All right, then we'll tell you. Your name's Joanne Miller. You live at 866 Piper Avenue. You live with your father and mother. Both of them work. You're a liar. That's not me. You're 19 years old. You live on the same block as your boyfriend, Stanley Freeman, and you're the one who got him mixed up in this gang. Isn't that right? No, it's not right. It's not. I didn't do anything. Well, that's only half the story. Freeman told us everything. You want to hear the rest? No. Stan wouldn't tell you. He wouldn't. He told us how you got him mixed up in it. Quick money. That's what you told him, didn't you? No, it was him. I can prove it. The rest of the kids will tell you. He got me in this. Ask them, they'll tell you. It was Stanley and Fred Milford and George Jansen. They started it, all three of them. All right. Will you tell the story to a police stenographer? I'll tell him everything. He's not blaming this on me. Marge, will you go get the stenographer? Right. Now, how many persons in this gang of yours? Oh, about ten or twelve. And it's not my gang, either. He got me into this, and now he's trying to lie his way out, blaming me. How long have you been doing this, burglarizing cars? Me? Oh, only about two weeks. It was supposed to be fun, something to do at night. The rest of them have been at it a couple of months. Who's the head of the gang? I told you, it's him, Stanley, and Fred Milford and Jansen, all three. I only started going out with him two weeks ago, maybe less. All right, Joanne. Tell it to the stenographer the same way. The stenographer will be in a minute, Joe. Okay, Marge, thanks. Stay with her. Right, Joe. Just about a closed case, Ben. Girl gave us a full confession. She didn't. Oh, you're not tricking me again. She didn't. She told us you're one of the leaders of the gang, Stanley. Said you got her into all this. The other two are George Jansen and Fred Milford. About a dozen kids in the gang, all of them about your age. Isn't that right? She's lying, can't you tell? She's lying. She got me into the gang. Well, she did. She's Milford's girlfriend. Ask her. Oh, she can't lie out of that one. She got me into it. I can prove it. Who's the real leader of the gang? Milford. He, he started it. He organized the whole thing. He collects the stuff we get and he delivers it. Jansen helps him do it. What do you mean he delivers the stuff? Where does he deliver it? Oh, somewhere in Dogtown, I think. Down around South Main, near the railroad yards. Who's it delivered to? Oh, I don't know exactly. I heard Jansen mention the name once. Myra, he said, it's, it's supposed to be a big secret. Myra, that's, that's all I remember. Where does Jansen and Milford live? Oh, Jansen rooms down on East Flower. 1042, I think, it's, it's a rooming house. And Milford lives two blocks over from me on Quincy. 234 Quincy. He lives with his grandmother. Got that, Ben? Right. All right, let's pick up Milford and Jansen. It was ten minutes past one when Ben and I returned to headquarters with George Jansen and Fred Milford in our custody. In Jansen's room at 1042 East Flower Street, we found two fur coats, a box full of new car accessories, an S&W 38 revolver, and a 45 automatic. When we picked up Fred Milford at his home, we discovered five deluxe car radios hidden in the garage, plus a valuable assortment of cameras, cigarette lighters, and clothing. Both Jansen and Milford refused to talk, but when we got them to headquarters and showed them the signed statements of Stanley Freeman and the girl, Joanne Miller, they broke. Milford, um, where else did you and your gang operate besides the Wilshire district? No place, only out there, that's all. Same type of car burglars have been committed all over the city. You telling us your gang didn't have a hand in them? It's the truth. Our territory was Wilshire District. We didn't go outside. You mean some other gang's responsible? I don't know. All I know is we didn't have any part of them. Is there another gang, Milford? Maybe. I don't know. You find out. It's none of my business. It is your business, Milford. You admit you and your gang committed 55 jobs in the past three and a half months. That leaves about 200 jobs to be accounted for. That's right. You figure it out. We have figured it out. I think you and your gang of young thieves pulled every one of those 250 jobs. There isn't any other gang. That's the story the district attorney's going to get. You're crazy. There is. I know there is. And then give us the information and save yourself a lot of trouble. Well, we're not the only ones. That's all I know. Milford, do you know how many years you get for auto burglary? I told you, we're not the only ones. There must be a couple of others besides us. Vince Mahoney, he's got a gang. Where does Mahoney operate? West Hollywood and Beverly. Where does he live? I don't know. Honest, I, I only met him a couple of times. Where'd you meet him? I don't remember. Where'd you meet him, Milford? Delivery. I met him down at the delivery place a couple of nights. When you delivered the property you stole from cars, is that right? Yeah. Where was then? Down by the railroad yards. Where? Chavez Street. It's a little alley off East Main. Who'd you deliver the stuff to? I told you our name's Myra. That's all I know. 
We meet her and some guy on Tuesday nights. We give them the stuff and they pay us off. Mahoney delivers the same night I do. Do you meet her every Tuesday night? Yeah. You're going to meet her this Tuesday, tomorrow night? I don't know. I guess so. Same place? Yeah. Are you the only one she deals with? Sometimes Joanne. Me or Joanne. I know what you're thinking. You want to use me to trap Myra. Well, what's it worth? You know better than that. How about it, Milford? Oh, what else can I do? Give me another cigarette. By 3.30 that morning, the signed statements and confessions were piling up fast. Milford gave us a list of the names and addresses of each member in his gang, and within an hour, they were all under questioning at headquarters. Most of the suspects, about one-third of them girls, ranged in age from 18 to 21. As they told their individual stories, the scope of the case grew until it covered most of the city. By late afternoon of the next day, Tuesday, March 3rd, three more gangs operating in Venice, Bel Air, and North Hollywood had been apprehended. They confessed to more than 175 burglaries from locked cars during the past three and a half months. At five o'clock that afternoon, Ben and I met with Chief Backstrand in his office. How many admissions you have now? Over 50, Ed. Here are the gang leader's statements. Uh-huh. What's their story? Yeah, it's pretty much the same. They all say this woman, Myra, set up the operation. You mean she got the kids and put them to work burglarizing cars? Well, not exactly. She picked the leaders, contacted them in bars or on the street, asked them if they wanted to pick up some spare money getting auto parts for it. Then she didn't tell them to go out and burglarize cars? Well, not in so many words, Ed, No. After they brought in auto parts for a couple of weeks, she told them to bring her everything they could find, outside the car or inside. Those are the words she used. Five of the kids dictated those words into their signed confession. Oh, that should hold in court. What else did you get on this woman? Oh, she taught them how to work, told them to wear gloves, all the angles. Uh, well, we got most of the small fry. Now, where do we find this Myra woman? Any description on her? Yeah. Kids say she's about 33, 34. Good-looking redhead. Five feet five, about 120. Well dressed. No description on the guy she runs with. You run a make on her yet? Yeah, no previous record. We set up a stakeout for her tonight. Two of the gang leaders have volunteered to go along, this Milford and Vince Mahoney. Uh, good. Down on uh, Chavez, where she usually meets them? Yeah, that's right. When? 11.15. That's the regular time for the meet, according to the kid. All right, I'll be at home. Call me. I don't want to miss out on this one. <laughs> When Ben and I left Ed Backstrand's office, we went home for dinner and a few hours sleep. At 9.30 p.m., we were back at the office. We met the men in the special detail, which Backstrand had assigned for the stakeout that night. We briefed them on their duties, and then we got Fred Milford and Vince Mahoney out of their cells. To avoid any possible suspicion of the presence of a trap, we had Milford's permission to use his car in the stakeout. The car, which he had said he had driven to the delivery meetings with the woman, Myra, at least a dozen times before. We arrived at the stakeout area, Chavez Alley in East Main, at 9.58. The meeting was scheduled for 11.15. The moon was out, but the sky was overcast, and there was a cold wind blowing from the east. Hey, what time you got, Sergeant? Hmm, about 10. Why, Milford? You getting nervous? No, just wonder. How are you cops going to rig this thing? In just a couple of minutes, we're going to plant you two in Milford's car parked up there in the alley. Now, you stay there until Myra shows up. We'll do the rest. Yeah, I know, but what'll we say? Suppose she asks for some stuff. We ain't got any. You won't need any. You won't have much time for talking. Suppose she wises up. Maybe she'll pull a gun. Maybe. Does she carry one? No. Never saw her with one. Don't worry, Milford. We'll make sure you're not in danger. She's got an awful temper, that redhead. Got mad at me once when I squawked at the prices she was paying us for radios. What was she paying you, Mahoney? Oh, an eight tube radio, good shape, seven bucks. <laughs> she got all the gravy and you got all the grief. You're yeah, not kidding. Joe, hmm? are you? Yeah, Steve. What do you got? Well, the men are all staked out, Joe. Got the area covered from every angle. All right. You got an extra man to stay in Milford's car? Oh, I'll handle that myself. Fine, thanks. Okay. All set, Joe? Yeah. Now, Milford and Mahoney, we're going to put you two in your car now. There's going to be an officer with you, so there's no need to be nervous or afraid. You just sit in the car and act natural. When this Myra drives up, don't leave the car. Have her come to you. You got it? Sure. Okay. All right, Joe, let's go. Sure is cold out. I don't even have a heater in my car. You stole enough of them. 
Okay, Steve, here they are. All right, boys. Milford, get in first behind the wheel. Okay. Mahoney in the middle. Now I'll sit in the back. And we'll be parked in that garage across the street, Steve. Got a perfect view of the alley. Okay, Ben. Check with you later. All right. Mean night, Joe. Yeah. Come on. It's cold here in the garage, isn't it? Yeah. That might be a long wait. What time you got? Six minutes past ten. Thank you. Hey, Joe. What is it? Uh, it's nothing. Thought that passing car was turning in the alley. Relax. It's early. Lonely place. Dark. Gets on your nerves. That's it, Ben. Half past eleven. Nothing yet. Somebody might have tipped her off. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Well, let's wait it out anyway. Joe, that blue coupe. Yeah, he just turned in the alley. Let's go. Come on, run, Ben. Behind you. All right, all right. Wait, you fella. Quit your fight. Who'd you get, Steve? Yeah, here he is. Just drove up in the coupe. Got out and called Milford Mahoney by the first names. He's in on it. What about the girl? No sign. Kid was the only one in the car. All right. Tell them in the stakeout's offered and I'd have them report back in. We'll take the kid with us. Okay. All right, young fellow, this way. What do you cops think you're doing? I ain't done nothing. Look, sport, we heard that from 54 different kids yesterday. We're tired of that line. Come on. When we got back to the office, we took the boy to the interrogation room and questioned him. He gave his name as Matthew Leiter, age 21. He wouldn't break until Vince Mahoney definitely identified him as a member of his car burglary gang and a special favorite of the red-headed woman they called Myra. Then Leiter copped out and told Ben and I that he had talked with Myra as late as 10 o'clock tonight. He told us that she had heard that the police had picked up some of the gang members and she asked Leiter to drive down to the Chavez Alley meeting place. He was supposed to tell Milford and Mahoney that the weekly delivery date was off until further notice. We questioned Matthew Leiter for an hour and a half. Uh, you told us a little while ago that you talked with this woman, Myra, late tonight. Yeah. Where'd you talk to her? At her home? Her home? Don't be stupid. Nobody knows where she lives. I met her at a bar. Which bar? Julia's. Out in Santa Monica. How did she contact you? Called me at home. She's not such a bad dame. She treats you right. Sure, that's why you're in jail. Did you ever call her on the phone? I don't know her number. None of the kids do. She's smart. She taught me all I know about the racket. You'll have a rough time getting her. Maybe, but we'll get her. Ben and I left the office at 2 a.m. and went home to bed. We reported in at 8 that morning to Ed Backstrand. The three of us went down the street to Koken's restaurant for a cup of coffee. Nobody was in a good mood. We had most or all the small fry in the citywide burglary ring, but it seemed we were still a long way from cracking the inner circle. The latter kid said that none of them knows where she lives, what her phone number is, nothing. Pass the sugar in. Mm. I think we still have a few angles to study on that score. Right now, I've got some more bad news for you. What's that? You been through your mail this morning? No, not yet. We haven't had a chance. I saw the overnight reports. There were 32 car burglaries last night. 32. All the way from Wilmington to North Hollywood. How you figure it? I can't. This girl, Myra, must have an army of kids working for her. How much did they get, Ed? Any idea? Uh, rough estimate, about $3,000. Usual stuff people are foolish enough to leave in their cars. Watches, cameras, furs, expensive clothes. M.O.'s the same? And uh, like the others. If the car happens to have a rigid handle lock, they slip a piece of pipe over the handle for a lever and break it. If that doesn't work, they pry open the wing window. Some of the windows were smashed out. Sounds like you're in an awful hurry, Joe. Yeah, maybe this Myra wants a few big nights before she peddles the stuff and gets out. Uh, if we're going to get her, we can't waste time. Any suspects picked up last night, Skipper? None. Well, where did they hit most of the car? Outside the Pan Pacific, the parking lot. Hockey game going on. Must have been 4,000 cars for them to pick over. They picked the best. As usual. And well, you better get on it. There's one way to handle it. What's that? She works fast. 
You work a little faster. We got back to the office and we went over the reports one by one. Then we called the young gang members to the interrogation room and questioned them separately and re-questioned them. We got nowhere. Many of them had met Myra on the street, in a bar, but not one of them had any idea where she lived. At least that's what they told us. Ben had a hunch that Matthew Leiter knew more than he was telling. We had him brought to the interrogation room, and all that afternoon until 10 o'clock that night, with interruptions for his meal periods, we talked with Leiter. He would admit nothing more than what he'd already told us. Yeah, it's got me beat, Joe. Yeah. Well, let's check with Ed. Good morning, Joe. Ben? Hi, Mike. Skipper in? Just went down the hall for a minute. Be right back. Hold it a minute, will you? Yeah. Chief of Detectives always handing. Yeah. For you, Joe. Oh, thanks. Well, yeah. He does? We'll be right over. That was Sergeant Hopkins over at the jail. Yeah? Matthew Leiter's got something to tell us. Says it's important. Have a chair here, Leiter. Yeah, thanks. All right, you wanted to see us. I'm getting even with that dame Myra. I'm squaring with you. Yeah? She told me if I was picked up, she'd have me out in a couple of hours. She promised me a lawyer if anything happened. Said she'd get me bail. All right, where can we find her? I don't know if she's there now, but you can find out at Francisco Motors. Big used car lot. Garage, too. It's out on Melrose, past La Cienica. What's the tie up? That's where she fenced most of the stuff we stole. Some old guy she buddies with runs the place. Big shop in the back. Store a lot of hot stuff there. Barney. Yes, yeah, Sergeant. We're through with them. Take them back. <laughs> We checked with Chief Backstrand, and then we drove out to the Francisco Motor Company. We located it on the corner of Melrose and Geneva Avenue. It was a big layout. It consisted of a large used car lot sign bannering the slogan, Deluxe Auto Accessories, lowest prices in town. Along the back end of the lot, there was a large L-shaped garage. We found the man in charge, and he gave his name as Paul Hackett, the owner of the car lot. In the garage, we found the entrance to a large back storeroom was loaded with thousands of dollars worth of auto radios, spotlights, cratefuls of assorted car accessories. Special closets built into the walls of the garage contain racks of fur coats, suits, dresses. Below that, smaller boxes containing watches and cameras, all wrapped in tissue paper. You can save all of us a lot of time and trouble by talking to us now, Mr. Hackett. Where is Myra? I don't know who you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. Can you explain what we just found in your garage? I didn't know it was there. I didn't know it was stolen. Well, which is it, Mr. Hackett? Make up your mind. I bought it. But I didn't know it was stolen. You can't prove I did know. I think we can prove it, Mr. Hackett. Some of those stolen car radios stored back there, the serial numbers are filed off, and this workbench here is full of filings. I... I didn't know... You'll have to do better than that. How does Myra figure in? I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. It's all right with us, Hackett. We found the stuff and we got you. If we don't find Myra, you'll be doing time for two people. Stand still. You can't. You can't do this to me. I, I don't know anything about it. Come on, Hackett. We're taking you in. All right, get in the car. Come on, in the car. Am I going to jail? You're going to jail. All right. I'll take you to Myra. Hackett told us that Myra lived at 1345 Munich Drive in Beverly Hills He said that he was Myra's husband He told us that he'd been in a legitimate garage business for 10 years before he married Myra She talked him into the ragged He identified 1345 Munich Drive as their home When we got there, we found stores of stolen property similar to those found in the garage Myra was not there Hackett had no idea where she might be We sat down in the living room and waited One hour, two hours, three hours. After five hours of waiting, the monotony started to wear on everybody's nerves, especially Hackett's. Yeah, the whole thing, it was her idea. I should have known, all hers. She did this to me. I won't take it alone. Where is she? You tell us, Hackett. I told you, I don't know. She couldn't have gone. She didn't know. Well, I'm not going to take right, this quiet alone. quiet down, quiet down. That you, Paul? Thought I heard you talking to some. Who's he? The police, Myra. The police. 
Your smart kids told them the whole story. What are you talking about, my smart kids? What are these cops All doing right, here in the living room? that's enough. Get your dirty hands off me. Get away. These kids are right, Joe. She got a get away. Yeah. Get... Who do you think you're... There, that ought to hold you for a while. All right, come on, you two. Let's go. All right, copper. You win. Stupid husbands. How many times did I tell you? Don't trust those kids. Don't store their stuff in the garage. Don't open it for anybody. Get a lawyer. No, you knew better. Dumb jerk. The idea of having those cops camping in the living room waiting for me. Why didn't you warn me? I'm going to divorce you. That's what I'm going to do. I'll stick you for plenty. Jerk. All right, inside you two. You got a smoke, Ben? Hmm. Yeah. Right here. Thanks. I'm just thinking. What? Those kids were right. She's a pretty nice-looking woman. Yeah. Nice face. Beautiful figure. Mm-hmm. Sure talks a lot, though, doesn't she? Yeah. Hey, Joe, remind me to take home some flowers to my wife tonight, will you? The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Paul and Myra Hackett were tried and convicted on seven separate counts of receiving stolen property. They are now serving out their sentences in the state penitentiary. Realizing that most of the young persons involved in the case were influenced by the strong personality of Paul and Myra Hackett, a separate investigation was made into the backgrounds and home life of the young offenders. In most cases, they were found to be basically good, and they were placed on probation and returned to their homes. You have just heard the 13th in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of W.A. Wharton, acting chief of police, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Detective Harry William Vosper of the Seattle, Washington Police Department, who on the night of July 21st, 1949, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. And now, an important announcement. Starting this Saturday, September 3rd, Dragnet will be heard at a new time over your NBC station. Consult your local newspaper for the new listening time. And now, speaking in behalf of the producers and the entire cast of Dragnet, we would like to take this opportunity to thank you for your many kind letters of encouragement and approval. Remember, next Saturday for Dragnet, this is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Squat cars. General Motors and their dealer organization throughout Southern Africa proudly bring you the drama, the danger, the thrills, and the facts when the long arm of the law travels in squad cars. The story you're about to hear is true. Details are supplied from the official case files by the South African police. Only names and places have been changed to protect innocent people involved. Thirty-five p.m. on the 25th of March, Station Street, Port Elizabeth. A police patrol vehicle driven by Warrant Officer Haman pulls up in front of a parked taxi. The Warrant Officer and Lieutenant Stain alight from the vehicle. Are you sure about the registration number? Yes, sir. CB19229. The name of the driver? Gardner, sir. All right. Let's have a word with Mr. Gardner. Hmm. Seen us coming. But he's staying put. Good evening. Yeah? We'd like to ask you some questions about the death of a man called Van Hastien. Look out, sir. He's off. Just a minute. Stop. Mister, if that's the way you want to play, let's go and get him, Mr. Harmon. Thirty 
8.36 p.m. The taxi, which was facing northwest, suddenly prescribes a half circle in the road, skidding violently. Then the driver swings the vehicle to the right into Jetty Street. The two policemen run to their car and jump in. He's not wasting any time. No, sir. He turned right here. Can you see him, sir? Yes, there he is, going up White's Road. He seems to be implicated, sir, judging from the way he took off. Yes, I thought it was perhaps another wild goose chase, some crank or other. How did you come by the information, sir? I should think it was about five to eight when the phone rang in my desk. Lieutenant Stain. Constable Langer, a call for you, sir. Who is it? The caller wouldn't say, sir. He says he has vital information about a murder and wanted to speak to the officer in charge. All right, put him through. Very good, sir. You're through now. Speak up, please. Hello? What's your name? Never mind that. Three weeks ago, a man called Chick von Eistian died. They say he died of pneumonia. Well, he didn't. He was murdered. Is this for real, or are you wasting my time? It's for real, all right. Did this happen here in Port Elizabeth? Yes. How do you know? That's something else best left unsaid. Talk to a taxi driver called Gardner. He drives a cab with a registration number CB19229. He can tell you everything you need to know. You'll find him in Station Street. Hello. Hello, hello. Warrant Officer Hammond. Sir? Bring a car around. We're going downtown. He's doubled back on himself, sir. He's going down Military Road. Crazy fool. Stick with him. Hold tight, sir. p.m. The speeding taxi careers along South Union Street and swerves violently into Warmer Road. The police vehicle follows in hot pursuit. At the junction of Hill Road, Warrant Officer Haman is confronted with the sight of an articulated petrol tanker emerging to cross their path and come down the hill towards town. Watch your face, sir. I'm throwing out the anchors. Get this thing out of the way, man. Uh, I'm stuck here. I misjudged the turn. That's all we needed. Back up and go around the block. Right, sir. But by the time the two policemen regain the warmer road, there's no sight of their quarry. Last. Sorry, sir. Not your fault. It was that clown with the petrol lorry. Anyway, drive as far as the airport. We may be lucky. I'll alert control. This is Special Duties Vehicle Number 2, calling control. Over. Go ahead, number two. Over. Put out a general alert for a cream Detroit. Model unknown. Registration number CB19229. The driver, a man believed to be called Gardner, is wanted for questioning in regard to an investigation set in motion by an anonymous informer earlier this evening. We ourselves are proceeding as far as the airport. Over and out. Lieutenant Stain and Warrant Officer Haman actually drive 30 miles beyond their objective without seeing any sign of the vehicle they're pursuing. Disconsolately, they drive back to Port Elizabeth, where the investigation is resumed early the next day. Oh, come on, come on. Registrar, births, marriages and deaths, can I help you? Morning, Lieutenant Stain, CID. What details have you of a man called, thought to be called, Chick Van Hastien? I have reason to believe that he died some three weeks ago. Just hang on. I'll look it up for you. Thank you. Any news of that taxi, Mr. Hummer? No, sir. But I've managed to get Gardner's address from the licensing office. The name's correct, sir. Henry Gardner, Russell Heights, Main Street. I've got the car out in the front if you want to go down there. Good, when I'm through here. Right, sir. Hello? Yes, yeah, still here. The only Van Heistian who died around that time was called Cedric. He was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital... On the evening of the 2nd of March. He was of no fixed address and was buried in a pauper's grave. Have you got the death certificate in front of you? Yes. What was the cause of death? It says here, low bar pneumonia. Was there an autopsy? Uh, no. Any next of kin quoted? No. What's the grave number? Uh, 145 East 25. 145 East 25. Good, thank you very much. Pleasure. Right, Mr. Harmon, let's go to Russell Heights, Main Street. What 
connections did your husband have with a man called Cedric Van Hastien? Van Hastien? Uh, I don't think I ever heard him mention anybody by that name. Why? Well, what's going on? Who are your husband's friends and associates? Well, I don't think he has any. Keeps himself very much to himself, but... But what's all this about? Well, I'm not quite sure yet, Mrs. Gardner. But your husband's wanted for questioning, and it's my duty to inform you of the law and the penalties involved regarding the harboring of criminals. Criminals? You mean Henry? We tried to talk to him last night, and he behaved in a most suspicious manner. He was last seen driving in the direction of the airport. If he comes back here, you'd be advised to contact me. My name is Lieutenant Stain. At the CID. But, but what's it all about? I don't know. But your husband's afraid of something. Lieutenant Stain places the facts that he's uncovered at the disposal of the brigadier in charge of the CID, along with a request for an exhumation order. The brigadier is sufficiently impressed to channel the request to the right quarter. The order is granted. And the next day, the 27th of March, sees Lieutenant Stain and Warrant Officer Haman at the graveside in company with the district surgeon. What's it all about, anyway? I haven't the foggiest idea, but there's something not right here. Gently, no. Back that vehicle a bit closer. You want a post-mortem? Yes, please, Doctor. What are you looking for? Or should I say, what do you want me to look for? I don't know. One of those, eh? Well, it might take a little time. I'm in no hurry. Sorry to have kept you waiting, gentlemen. That's all right, Doctor. Was it as difficult as you feared? Very interesting. This is the way the official autopsy report will read. Thank you. This is the body of a well-developed, well-nourished white male, six feet in height and weighing 170 pounds. There is evidence that the deceased suffered grave injuries recently, with fractures of the skull, arms, legs and ribs. Uh, there were also multiple internal injuries. And those injuries should have been enough to kill him, but they didn't. And neither did Loeb and pneumonia. Read on. In death, the body developed the characteristic cherry red color of carbon monoxide poisoning with a concentration of 34.3%. Carbon monoxide poisoning. You sure? You want a second opinion? No, 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 no. I just find it strange that some member of the medical profession um, could have been so obliging as to write on the death certificate pneumonia as the cause of death. Well, anyone can make a mistake. Doctors aren't infallible, you know. Carbon monoxide. A car's exhaust fumes? No. How can you speak with such certainty? When fuel is burned in an engine, there's a residue of carbon. There were no deposits of carbon in Van Hastien's lungs whatsoever. So? I'd plump for coal gas, ordinary household gas that you cook with. Is it suicide, then? Lieutenant, it's up to you to discover that. Hmm. If it wasn't for Gardner's suspicious behavior, I'd plump for suicide. Gardner? Local taxi driver. He's on the run somewhere. That sounds intriguing. Oh, it is. What's the next move, then, sir? Just a minute, Mr. Hammond. Doctor, these other injuries you mentioned, these fractures and so on, you said they indicated recent injuries. How recent? Well, judging from the calcium secreted by the body to repair the fractures, I'd say that these injuries occurred within the last six months. I see. All right, Doctor, thank you. I'd be grateful for a typed copy of the PM report as soon as it's available. Of course. I'll be seeing you again, I suppose. Yes, sure. Uh, where are you off to now? The hospital. Come on, Mr. Harmon. Uh, you're very lucky. We don't normally keep things for this long, you know. Mm -hmm. and these are the clothes Van Hastine was wearing when he was brought in on the 2nd of March. That's right. Pretty shabby, aren't they? Yeah, typical of a hobo, though. Mm. Well, I've met well-nourished hobos. Um, um, this envelope. Uh, a few things he had on him. Comb, matches, cigarettes, uh, nine cents, uh, empty half-jack. Mm. Uh, Not much of a legacy, is it? Mm. I'm going to take him with me. You want a receipt? 
No, no, no. No good to us. Shouldn't think they're any dependents. Shouldn't think they'd be worth more than a bob or two. They might be worth a great deal to me. We'll see what they look like under a microscope. Mortuary. Is Lieutenant Stan with you? Um, hang on. For you. Thanks. Lieutenant Stan? Constable Longer here, sir. Message for you. Henry Gardner has been picked up in Cape Town. Western Cape request instructions. Has he got his car with him? Apparently, sir. Get the brigadier to issue a request to the effect that he be brought here with the car. Under escort. <laughs> request to the police in the Western Cape is complied with, and within 24 hours, Henry Gardner is being interrogated by Lieutenant Stan. Why did you run away? Uh, I was scared. Why? I got fright. Well, so did anyone. Policeman suddenly pitching up at your car door like that. Oh, come on, Gardner. You might get a fright for a few seconds or so, but a policeman at the door of your car shouldn't be enough to send you scurrying across country to Cape Town. What's the game? It's no crime to run away from the police. I ordered you to stop. I didn't hear you. All right, let's try another tack. Who was Cedric van Hastings? I don't know. Or did you know him better as Chick? I don't know the name. It was enough to send you off in a blue funk. <laughs> I've got nothing more to say to you. Somebody phoned me, a man, to tell me that van Hastings had been murdered. He said that you could help us with our investigations. Now then, Gardner, you may find this interesting. This no. is an analysis report on the few belongings that Van Hastien had when he... when he died. Huh? Traces of blood of the A1 MNRH group were found. A carbon test determined that the blood was 115 days old. It was present on the shirt, jacket, trousers, socks and shoes. So? Well, there seems to be a lengthy report on the various kinds of dust which were found in the clothing. I'm not concerned with that. I'm attracted to this bit, though. Listen. Yes? A minute sample, a trace, of cellulose paint of the type used in the spraying of cars was discovered. Microscopic examination revealed that the pigments used to color the paint were conducive to producing the color cream. What have you got to say to that? Oh, what do you expect me to say? What does that prove? The color of your taxi is cream. Hey, what are you getting at? Now, look, Gardner, you could save us a lot of time and trouble if you tell me what happened. I don't know what happened. I have nothing to do with this man. Well, we'll see. Just to keep you in the picture, I'd better tell you that I'm going to uh, scrape a sample of paint off your car and send it to the government laboratories for comparison. Meanwhile, you stay here. Here's the address, sir, where they collected Van Hastien that night. I'll go to boarding house, Strand Street. I made inquiries about it, sir. Boarding house is very grandiose. It's a place where you can buy a bed for the night for 15 cents. <laughs> Not exactly the rich, eh? No, sir. <laughs> uh, it's just on the left here, sir. It's apparently run by Mrs. Kombrunk. Omar Kombrunk. Quite a character. And where's the entrance? Up the wooden steps here, sir. Up on the first floor. Enough. I don't smell you enough. Who's there? Police. What do you want? I run a respectable place here. Never any trouble. A little more than three weeks ago, a man died here. Ah, that's right. Oh, Chick. What of it? Where did he die? In his bed. We didn't know he was so sick. He went in the night like the snuffing of a candle. He was a regular customer of mine, man and boy, for 15 years. Who was with him when he died? Nobody. It's a rule of the house, one person per bed. Do you uh, have gas here? Oh, that's right. It's permitted by the health authorities. I've got a license to prove it. You use it for light? Yeah, they made me put in electricity. Got a packet, too. You use it for cooking? That's it, cooking. Wholesome food, nice, clean bed. So where's the kitchen? Just along here. First on the right. Oh, mind your head. I see. And where are the dormitories? The sleeping area? Oh, uh, up the passage on the left. Is it possible to get into the kitchen at night? Oh, yeah. Everything's locked away. They can't steal nothing. See, who actually found Van Hastien? 
Now let me see. Oh, yeah, it was Jeffy. They sometimes worked on the road together. You know, they, they follow the sun, these boys. Hitchhike and walk all over the country. Is uh, Jeffy a uh, nickname? Yeah, that's right. His real name's Finch. He'd been with Chick for some time before his death. He said they was caught in a storm down by George. Hmm, Chick caught his death. Pneumonia, you see. That's what Finch said, eh? That's right. Is Finch staying here at the moment? No, I haven't seen him since Monday night. Monday. Monday, Monday. That was the uh, 25th, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, he just popped in and collected his case and said he was off again. What does he look like? Why? What do you want him for? Just a routine matter. Mm, he's small, you know. He's got uh, jackal's features, very sharp. Well, of course, he's brown and lined. Uh, he's skinny, too. Well, but ask any gentleman of the road. I'll tell you where to find him. Mr. Harmon, get on to control for a general alert. I'm going to see Dr. Meyerowitz. Dr. Meyerowitz, did you sign this death certificate? Uh, he, he, yes. Why? What appears to be the trouble? You say that cause of death was pneumonia. Did you treat the man prior to his death? Uh, no. What, what appears to be the trouble? Cedric Van Heistin died of carbon monoxide poisoning. He was gassed. C- good heavens, no, not really. What led you to the conclusion that he died of pneumonia? It, it was his friend said so. He said he'd been ill for some time with, with a cough, t- temperature and so on. He told of how they'd been caught in a storm. It, it seemed very conclusive. I... Uh, I'm in semi-retirement, you know. To tell you the truth, I, I was rather anxious to get away from the place. I don't have the practice that I had. I took the man's word in good faith. I, I hope it's not going to lead to any unpleasantness. The man who gave you the information about Van Hastings' state of health, what did he look like? He's a, a little man with a foxy face. <laughs> Come and sit down, Gardner. You you can't hold me here like this? Yes, I can. And I'm going to hold you until I'm satisfied about the circumstances surrounding Van Hastings' death. I've never heard of that man. How many more times must I tell you? Here's another lab report that I'd like you to hear. Also an analysis. You remember we took a sample of paint from your car? Well, the labs say that it matches the paint found on Van Hastings' clothing. <laughs> it's impossible. I'm afraid not. You've got forensic science against you, Gardner. This report is properly certified. It's legal evidence. And if I add this evidence to other things which were discovered during a post-mortem examination of Van Hastings' body, I get something which seems to add up to a nasty accident involving your taxi and Van Hastings. That's logic. You, you examined the body? That's right. The body was exhumed. What have you got to say to that? I want to talk to a lawyer. Yes, certainly. You have that right. Why don't you tell me what happened? Now, I want to talk to a lawyer. I'm not saying another word until I do. Any news of Finch the hobo? Well, I want him found. He's vital in the case. Please, yes, I don't care if he's gone to Southwest Africa. I want him here in P.E. Jeffy? No, I haven't seen him since uh, Durban last year. Three years since I shed a drone for them boiler room of him, I can show that. Yeah, we rubbed the rails together across the border. There was a mistake on my part. They kicked me out of Botswana and told me not to come there. Yeah? My name's Finch. You're under arrest. What for? You're wanted in South Africa. You can't make me go there. I'm afraid we can. You're being extradited. But I haven't, I haven't done anything. They think differently in Port Elizabeth. You'll be taken there under escort on tonight's train. You're such a VIP, they're having a reception committee laid on to meet you. A Lieutenant Stain. Now then, Finch, was it you who phoned me on the 25th of March? Phoned you? Where? Why? I've had the whole story from Gardner. You what? Hey, 
Has he blabbed a lot, then? I'm afraid so. You're very seriously implicated in the death of Cedric Van Hastien. Is that what he told you? Yes. Well, let me put the record straight. You're not going to stretch my neck. So let me tell you the way it really happened. I'm listening. Gardner, I want to tell you a story. There was once a taxi driver. It was quite late one night. The way I figure it, it was the 6th, 7th or 8th of November. This taxi driver had had more to drink than was good for him. He collected a pedestrian on his front fender. He panicked. He drove away from the scene of the accident without reporting it to anyone. He thought at first he'd killed the pedestrian, but he hadn't. Uh, but... The pedestrian lived. Not only that, he remembered the make and registration number of the car that hit him. He didn't say anything to the police because he had nearly four months free hospitalization. That meant he had bed and board at the provincial administration's expense. Yes, but... Wait a minute. But while he was in hospital, he got to thinking. And when he came out, the first thing he did was to contact the man who'd knocked him down and left him for dead. He began to blackmail him. And the taxi driver, realizing that he was in danger of losing his license and therefore his means of livelihood decided that it would be best to do away with the pedestrian. Listen. He even went to the lengths of procuring an accomplice. Together, the taxi driver and his accomplice plied the pedestrian would drink until he was insensible. Then they took him, in the taxi, ironically enough, to the Algoa boarding house in Strand Street. They pretended to put him to bed for the night. And during the night, on his own... The taxi driver dragged the poor, unfortunate pedestrian into the kitchen. It was there that he forced a rubber pipe down the pedestrian's throat. The other end was attached to a gas tap. He turned on the gas, and it wasn't very long before the pedestrian departed from this world. Oh, it's a lie. I never... Yes, you did. And I'm glad to say that I'm in a position to prove it. <laughs> as he vehemently denies Lieutenant Stain's accusations. Pitch is a liar. If that's what he says about me... That's mistake number two, Gardner. I only ever called him an accomplice in the story. How do you know his name was Finch? No, no, uh, please. I, I'm sorry. I, I was frightened. I, I stood to lose everything. He was only a bum man, I hope. He was also a human being. The other mistake you made... Oh, uh, please give a man a chance. It's a bit late for that, Gardner. What chance did you give Van Hastings? You murdered him like a dog. If you'd paid your accomplice the money you promised him, this would never have happened. You kept putting him off, and he got so fed up that he phoned me. That was the beginning of the end for you. If you'd only stopped after that accident in November. It was November, wasn't it? Yes. You'd have only lost your license. This way you stand to lose everything. Edward Finch turned state's evidence in the case and was sent to prison for ten years. Confronted with the overwhelming evidence of Finch and medical science, a judge and two assessors had no hesitation in sentencing Henry Gardner to die on the gallows. They prowl the empty streets at night, waiting, in fast cars, on foot, living with crime and violence. These men are on duty 24 hours out of every 24. They face dangers at every turn, expecting nothing less. They protect the people of South Africa. These are the men of Squad Cars. Listen again next Friday evening to another authentic story in our dramatic South African police series, Squad Cars. Brought to you by General Motors, makers of the biggest and most exciting range of cars, trucks and commercial vehicles in the world. Cadillac, Buick, Oldsmobile, Pontiac, Beaumont, Chevrolet, Opel, Holden, Vauxhall, Bedford, GMC, and Ranger, South Africa's own car. Presenting Joel McRae as Jace Pearson... In Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, authentic stories from their official files. 
Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Tonight's transcribed case, Candyman. It is 4 p.m. April 14th, 1947. A prisoner at the jail in Pentland County, Texas, is being returned to a cell as the visiting hour comes to an end. His name is Paul Abbott, serving out a six-month sentence for petty larceny. His cellmate, John Saygood, has not had a visitor. For Saygood is being held without bail, awaiting trial for murder. All right, Abbott. In. Your wife bring what I told you to get for me? Yeah. Yeah, I got it, Johnny. Candy and and the razor blades. You know we're not supposed to have razor blades. Yeah. If they find them on me, they might put me in jail. What are you so nervous about with your lousy six-month flat bit? I'm facing the chair. My nerves are still better than yours. Look, sake it. I only got a month and a half to go. I don't want to get in no trouble. Lay off, will you? Are you, you telling me what I should do, you cheap <laughs> heister? <laughs> Oh, Johnny, let go of my arm. You're hurting me. No kidding. Really? Oh. <clears throat> Gee, kid, I'm sorry. Maybe I play too rough and you're my pal. Model prisoner like you with only a few weeks to go never gets searched after a visit. And you're so good to me. Have a piece of candy, pal. I don't want any. Okay. You know, while you've been out visiting, I've been thinking... I'm going to let you and your wife do me another favor. A big favor. Look, i got to be careful what I ask her. I can't upset her now. You know that. Oh, that's right. The baby's due soon, ain't it, Papa? Wouldn't want the kid to start out without an old man, would you? What do you mean, Johnny? I wanted to see if your wife could get these razor blades in. Now, next time she comes, tell her to bring me a hacksaw and a gun. No. No, Johnny. You don't want to see me go to the chair, do you? Now, if you do, I could take one of these blades to your throat. No, no, Johnny. Keep your voice down. Yeah. All right, Johnny. All right. I'll do it. I'll you do it. You'll do it. Now, don't kid me. I can hear the wheels turning in that square head of yours. Next time the screw takes you out of here, you'll spill your guts. I won't, Johnny. I swear. I know you won't. And I'll tell you why. Because if you rat on me, somebody will slip a shiv into you. In jail or out. Now, remember that. Remember it if you ever want to see that kid. You don't realize what you're asking me to do. I ain't asking, I'm telling. If you decide to get brave with your own neck, remember I can have your wife taken care of, too. You wouldn't. You wouldn't do that. All right, Chuck. Here comes the screw. What's the yelping, Bell? What's going on in here? We was just arguing, that's all. Bell what? Baseball. How many games Gehrig played for the Yanks? Is that right, Abbott? Ain't that right, Evett? Yeah, that's right. Baseball. Frantic with fear, Paul Abbott yielded to Sigurd and, through his wife, obtained the gun and hacksaw. The blow-off came a week later when the Pentland County jailer was killed and Sigurd and Abbott escaped. While roadblocks were being quickly set up by ranger and highway patrol units... Ranger Jace Pearson contacted Sheriff Leonard Ginn at the county jail. Well, they were in this cell, Ranger. Yeah. Some of the lock has been hacksawed, Sheriff. Yeah, they must have waited in the passage until the jailer turned the corner here. Then shot him through the stomach and took his keys. Any idea where they got the gun? No, no, but Abbott's wife was allowed to visit. She could have slipped it in to him. You've got a pickup out for her? Mm Mm-hmm. Deputy's out after her now. Abbott made a big jump when they gunned the jailer. From petty larceny to 
jailbreak and murder. I don't know. A murderer like Saygood, he had a reason to crash out. But a first-timer like Abbott with only four weeks to go, he doesn't figure to make a break. Well, just the same, Abbott's gone with Saygood. We may find out why when we bring in his wife. Sometimes a man goes places he doesn't want to go with a gun in his back. What could I do, Sheriff? What else could I do? That man would have killed him. Yeah. Did you arrange anything else for them, Mrs. Abbott? Get clothing or an automobile? No, how could I? I even had to lie to my mother to get money. To, to buy the gun. Paul was in jail and I wasn't working. I was always borrowing money to bring them things. I understand. The one behind the bars doesn't do all the suffering. I'd have done anything for Paul. But I had to take the food out of my mouth to buy things for that other man. And isn't me alone. I'll be having my baby soon. Why did Paul go with him? Why? I don't think he went willingly, Mrs. Abbott. I'm afraid he went at the point of that gun you brought in. Oh. <laughs> I begin to agree with that, Ranger. You told us you brought Saygood a lot of candy. Yes. More than a dollar's worth every week. It's a real sweet, too, Jase. Always sitting up a yammer for sugar at mealtimes. Yeah. Mrs. Abbott, will you excuse us for a moment? Sheriff, I want to see you for a second. Oh, oh sure, sure. You got anybody watching our house in case Abbott and Sagan show up there? Yeah, it's covered. Good. Your office hasn't any report of a stolen car, huh? No, nothing yet. And they're probably on foot. Could be out of the county by now, though. We have other ranger units in the area. I'm going to call my headquarters and have one of them come with me so he can beat the countryside. Okay. Anything else you want me to handle? Yeah. They'll have to eat wherever they are. And even if they have money, they won't take a chance on being spotted buying anything for a while. Mm, that figures. I want you to make a careful check on any robbery report you get from food stores. Uh-huh. I'd like an itemized account of everything that's taken. I got a hunch, say good. will make a special effort to get his hands on some candy. day, nothing turned up in the roadblock. While Ranger Jim Leeds and I rode through the countryside without finding a trace of the man we were after. But on the following morning... Maybe we've been heading the wrong way, Jace. I don't think so, Leeds. Coming this way would have been the fastest trail out of the county. Other ways, all wilderness for more than 80 miles. Too much of them on foot without supplies. Still figuring they cut through toward U.S. 280, eh? They must have. They'll have to get to a car someplace unless they got a spot to hold up in real close. I don't think Sago to take that chance. He'll want distance. Yeah. Farmhouse head. Hmm. A rider coming, too. He's really pounding leather. He sees us. Coming right this way. Let's meet him. Uh, howdy, strangers. Boo, 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 boo. Hey, I didn't expect anybody so soon. Well, what do you mean? Well, I just called the sheriff less than half an hour ago. Ain't that why you're here? We didn't know about your call. What happened? Well, my dogs flushed a couple of prowlers during the night. I've been out all night hunting them, or I'd have put in a call before. Maybe you're boys. You know what they look like? No, all I saw was two shadows. Dogs woke me up like I told you. Men was prowling around. You better have a look at this place, Leeds. Yeah. We'll ride back with you. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. How long ago did it happen? Oh, reckon it was 2 a.m. about six hours ago. You say you chased him? Yeah, but I couldn't spot him in the dark. Just rode around all night. If I'd have had any sense, I'd have called right away, but he threw a couple of shots at me when I saw him and I got hot and went for my gun and lit out. I see. They get anything? So when I went back to the house this morning, my missus said a couple of shirts and jeans was missing. Be say good and have it all right. Getting rid of their jail clothes. They have horses? No, oh, I didn't hear any. Maybe they were going to take a couple of yours and didn't have time to get them. How come your dogs didn't stay after them? Dogs pinned up. Should have turned them loose, but like I said, I, I was too hot to do any thinking after they shot at me. If you had done any thinking, you'd have stayed home. One of the men you were chasing is a killer. And about as cold as they come. We 
picked up their trail near the farmhouse. About four miles out, we found the ashes of a fire and chicken bones and feathers. And in the brush near the same spot, a bundle of prison clothes. From there, the trail led straight to the U.S. Highway. See the road through the brush now, Jace? Yeah. Let's hope we spot a highway patrol car before we... Well, what's the matter? Something off the road in that patch of Douglas fir. Looks like the front of a truck pulled pretty far back. Come on. Get up, Char. Get up, boy. Oh, oh, oh boy. Oh. All truck. Stacked with new cars. Uh-huh. That's what they are. Well screened from the road, all right. Yeah. Uh, driver doesn't seem to be around. Unloading ramps down, Jace. Tire tracks on the ground. <laughs> They've got a car now, all right. Wonder what happened to the driver of the truck. Blood on the cab seat. And more on the running board in the ground. Goes this way. There he is. Dead, Jace. Probably tried to go for help and couldn't make it. Yeah. Wound looks like Sagood's trademark. Shot through the stomach. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Now we continue with tonight's case, Candyman. An authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. I left the horses with Leeds at the nearest town. He did some checking while I got a lift back to Pentland to pick up the car and horse trailer. Then I drove back to meet Leeds where I'd left him. Come on, boy. Get in the trailer. Ooh, good boy. Ready to roll, Jace. Roll as soon as we can figure out which way. You check on those gas stations? Highway patrol went all the way down the line. No station service to car we're looking for. No pump locks were broken during the night. They must have driven as far as they wanted to go and ditched the car. Somewhere within about 100 miles from here. How do you figure that? Well, new cars coming off the assembly line only get a few gallons of gas put in them. They didn't take on more gas. They got as far as they could on what was in the tank. That makes sense. West. Sagan's had trouble in Oklahoma and Louisiana, according to his record, and so he'd go to New Mexico, where he's clean. He left the state. Yeah? Guess it's our best shot. KTXA to Unit 10. KTXA to Unit 10. Unit 10 to KTXA. Go ahead, KTXA. Have report for Unit 10 on subject John Saygood. Only known associate of Saygood's was woman known as Marcella Roberts. Present whereabouts unknown. Last location was place of business, beauty salon in Abilene, Texas. Left there two months ago. Unit 10 request check of cosmetic distributors and supply houses. Check recent orders as possible source of new address on subject Marcella Roberts. Will do, Unit 10. Uh, moment, Unit 10. I have another message coming in for Unit 10, stand by. Unit 10, standing by. Maybe they found the car, Chief. A big help if they have. Here it is, Unit 10. General store at Pike Hill entered during early morning. Situated 30 miles west, your present location. Check of stolen merchandise includes candy. That fits subject say good. Proceeding to Pike Hill immediately, Unit 10, 10-4. KDXA, Austin. back at the store here, Ranger, when I hear this noise. I got up and lit the light and it was just before daybreak. Yeah. Mm. You see anybody? No, no. I opened the door into the store and then the dang cat popped into my room and started purring and rubbing against my leg. So I just figured she knocked something over, so I went on back to bed. I see. Didn't know anybody had broken in until I got up this morning and found the dog glass busted. Must have slept through that, though. <laughs> I sleep real sound. 
Guess I woke up when they knocked this stack of canned goods over. Got them up and got them all stacked again now. You call the sheriff right away? Yep, yep. As soon as I found a few dollars from the cash draw missing. Didn't think about the candy counter. Don't keep much, you know. Till a couple of kids come in later on wanting some peppermint lifesavers. Then I saw a whole box of them was gone and some chocolate bars. Guess that's when the sheriff got in touch with us then. Now we'll rope off this showcase and have somebody from our lab come in to check it for fingerprints so we can be sure it was the man we were after. Not much doubt about it, Jase. Nothing like being sure. <laughs> drove further west from Pike Hill past Virgo while we waited for the fingerprint check. We combed the brush along the highway looking for the car Saygood and Abbott had stolen, but there was no sign of it. If it was abandoned, it might stay hidden for weeks. Nothing in here, Jace. No. Would have been a good spot to ditch a car, though. Well, they couldn't have driven much further than this. So we may find it further on. Uh, maybe. Maybe we've already passed it. Call on your car radio, Jace. Yeah. I heard it. KTXA to Unit 10. Come in, Unit 10. Unit 10 to KTXA. Go ahead, KTXA. Report on subject Marcella Roberts. Cosmetic distributor check shows nail enamel ordered in subject's name two weeks ago. Delivery made to adorable beauty salon, Virgo, Texas. Units 10 and 7 continuing investigation. Unit 10, 10 4. KTXA, Austin. Highland leads. Virgo's about 50 miles back, Jay. Yeah, I had a hunch we came too far. Figure the woman's helping him hide out? Vega didn't head in this direction without a reason. If she isn't hiding him, she'll know where he's headed. Marcella Roberts wasn't at work. Nor was she at her home when we got there. But she came home about an hour later. We left her car out of sight. She didn't see us until she came up the steps to the private entrance on the porch. Miss Roberts? What? Oh. Oh, Ranger. I didn't see you. Thought you might be able to help us. You know a man named John Sagood? I used to know him. Long time ago. You seen him lately? Well, how could I? I heard that he was in jail. Paper boy must have been neglecting you lately. He's out. We're looking for him. All right, Ranger. I'll tell you what I know. He, uh, he probably headed for Oklahoma City. He told me once that he could always hide out there if he got in any trouble. He should have carried a compass because he headed the wrong way. He broke into a store at Pike Hill before sunup this morning, and he was still moving in this direction when he left there. Well, I haven't seen him. Good. And you won't mind if we take a look through your apartment. If you've got any objection, one of us can wait here while the other gets the warrant. All right, you can come in. I only hesitated because the place is a mess. Sure, but we won't tell the neighbors. Come on, let's go. Well, here you are. I couldn't hide a mouse in here. Leeds, check the bathroom and closets. I'll look in the kitchen. Right, Jay. Nobody here, Jay, that's for sure. No, nope, not now. But there was somebody here. What do you mean? I mean, if you were a better housekeeper, you might make a better liar. You could have swept up these candy wrappers on the floor. Is there a law against eating candy? I eat it all the time. So does Sagan. You happen to have a 30-day diet tacked up on your kitchen wall. Your figure says you've been following it pretty close. You can't prove anything with that. Maybe not. But there's something else. Two different brands of cigarettes in this ashtray. And one brand doesn't have any lipstick on them. I had a boyfriend visit me. I'm going to check every store in this town and find out if you bought a load of groceries today. And if you did, what? you better be able to show them or prove where they went. Ranger, wait. You're concealing and aiding a murderer. You can serve a lot of time for that, Marcella. <laughs> Enough to rub off those good looks before you get out. I don't want to go to jail. But you don't know Johnny. He killed me. Where is he? Well, I took him and the other fellow up the back road to the Sierra Diablo foothills. They didn't hide out there and come back in a week. After I raised some money for him to get out of the country. 
You lead us out to where you left him. And don't bother about raising that money. He isn't going to be needing it. <laughs> the place where Sagood and Abbott had been dropped, the base of the wild Sierra Diablo country, catching the last rays of the sun. Leeds and I took our horses out of the trailer and started after them. Getting pretty dark, Jase. Yeah. Have to leave the horses and go on foot soon or we'll lose this trail. I can hardly see anything now. Uh, hold up a minute. Whoa, whoa, Shark. Oh, what? Moist patch here. One of them slipped and fell. Yeah, the one making the heaviest tracks. Probably Sagood. No, Abbott. Sagood's bigger, but he's using Abbott for a pack mule to carry supplies. Look how the tracks spraddle out. Yeah. Sure must be carrying weight, all right. Headed right for that rocky ground ahead. We won't find any more prints as clear as these. Want to tie the horses off here? No. I think we better lead them. They can walk this ground, and we may need them coming out. Now let's keep going. <laughs> Awesome, Jace. Keep flashing your light around it. Keep it tucked. All right. I'll spread out a little. No, no, wait a minute. Come back. Huh? What'd you find? Earth is soft at the base of this rock. Yeah, but no prints in it, Jace. No, but look at those marks. Yeah. Rattlesnake track. Yeah, wasn't moving away from here, though. Then probably in under the rock. Was weaving back and forth. A rattler only does that when it's disturbed. You mean they scared it passing by? Uh, something scared it. Some loose rock fell around here not long ago either. You can see where it chipped as it fell. The chips are fresh. It haven't been weathered over. Then they must have knocked it loose climbing up around the rock. Yeah. Let's find out. <laughs> if they did come this way, they must have moved along this ledge. Here. Use your light again. Right, Jase. Look at this. Yeah. Piece of broken shoelace. Snapped while they were climbing. And they sat there and tied the rest of it. See where his back rubbed dirt off the rock behind him. Yeah. And they made straight for that plateau. Give Sagood a clear view of anything coming up by day. Gonna leave the horses here and go on? No. no. Climb down and get them. We'll circle the rocks and take the long way up. It'll give Sagood a chance to fall asleep. We may be able to take him alive. We reached the plateau, a broad, flat patch just under the final ascent of the high peaks of the range, and picked up the trail again. It led straight toward a clump of trees and brush, and through the trees we saw the glow of a fire. We moved toward it. The moon's pretty bright now, Chase. We're out here. They're in cover. Unless they move between us and that car. It's funny Sago to keep a fire going at night. Need it in the day for cooking, but it's a giveaway in the dark. He probably figures he's safe enough. He's got to keep an eye on Abbott. Unless we're wrong and Abbott's along because he wants to be. And we'll find that out when the showdown comes. No sign of any movement there yet, Jason. Mm. We'd better leave the horses now. And we'll stake them out here and split. Circle in on foot and... Drop now, please! Now I knew what was wrong with the fire. It was a decoy Sagan had set up. He was someplace in the rim of the brush behind us. I twisted around looking for a flash of his gun if he fired again. Let it up, Ranger. Let me get a good shot. I'll put one right for your belly. You didn't expect to get away, did you, say, good? You ain't got me yet. We can wait. You'll never get out of here unless we take you out. We got four guns. You're one, say, good. Don't forget the extra joker I dealt myself. Fuck up, Evan. Oh, oh, Daddy, my arm. I still got Evan, little papa. And if one of you got a bullet mark for me, remember it's got to go through him first. Keep him talking, Jace. Maybe I can crawl around. No, 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 no. He's trigger happy. If he heard a sound, he put a bullet in Abbott's back. What do you say, Rangers? You want to see this punk die? I remember, I got nothing to lose by gunning it. What do you want, Sagard? I'll make you a deal. We don't make deals. You'll make this one or Abbott's dead. He's not falling, Rangers. He'll kill me. 
I got a wife and a kid coming. Ain't that touching, Rangers? Now you gotta play ball with me. What's your deal? Back off. Way off so I can see you go. And leave us your horses. And remember, Abbott will be in front of me when we come out to get him. Jeez. We can let him come out and then we can... Sure, sure, I know. All right, say good. You got a deal. I loosened the cinch on charcoal. We backed away, ready in case they fired. Then they moved out into the moonlight. Sagard kept Abbott between us and got him up on Lee's horse. Then he started to mount charcoal. Hold on, Ranger! Oh, Take him, charcoal! Take him, boy! Come on, Lee! You won't be able to hit anything but the ground. There goes, Sagard! Watch him! You all right, Abbott? Yeah. Yeah, I'm all right. Get up, Sagard. Oh, my arm. Oh. Never borrow a ranger's horse when a ranger's around unless he wants you to have him. Oh. I'm glad I didn't have to kill you, Sagard. I want the rest of the prisoners at Pentland to see you back in that cell. Might help them make up their minds never to come back again. You can start that lesson with me, Ranger. Once I get out, you won't see me there again. Good, Abbott. No place for a wife and kid to go visiting. All right, say good. Get going. John Saygood was brought to trial and found guilty on three counts of murder. His sentence, death in the electric chair. This is Joel McRae. Many tales about the Texas Rangers have been repeated until they are legend. And here's one of my favorites. Many years ago, rioting broke out in a Texas town and the mayor appealed for aid from the Rangers. He was at the railroad depot to meet the expected help when a stranger got off the train and approached him. Are you the mayor, the stranger asked. The mayor, looking anxiously for the Ranger force, said, Yeah, but I have no time to talk to you now. I'm waiting for the Texas Rangers to stop this rioting. The stranger said, I'm the ranger. I was sent down to help you. The mayor's mouth dropped open in dismay. They only send one ranger? Puzzled by the question, the ranger said, yeah. You only got one riot, haven't you? Don't forget our date, same time next week, folks. See you then. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers... Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Saddle Tramp. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Frank Martin, Reed Hadley, Wilms Herbert, Dick Ryan, and Lorreen Tuttle. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents this is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. The dream of millions of Americans is to own their own home, and own it free and clear. Now, if you're buying your own home or planning to buy or build, you owe it to yourself to investigate the advantages of the equitable, assured home ownership plan. And you can get all the details just by picking up your telephone. Yes, simply call your local Equitable Society representative. Your future security, your peace of mind is his business and you'll be glad to do business with him. 
In about 13 minutes, I'd like to tell you more about this friendly, helpful neighbor of yours and how he may help you, too, enjoy the many advantages of membership in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight, the subject of our FBI file, Kidnapping. It's titled, Wide Open City. America has always been a growing land, an expanding nation pushing toward tomorrow. At this moment, new communities are springing up like gawky adolescents, full grown before they are hardly aware of it. A sudden oil strike, a giant engineering project, a rich mineral discovery, or a huge industrial development may produce a sudden flow of population and create an overnight metropolis. But too often criminals and racketeers lured by easy money and the instability of rapidly developing communities, are among the first arrivals at modern frontier towns. Your Federal Bureau of Investigation is always alert to this potential danger and always ready to cooperate with hard-pressed local authorities in matters of mutual interest. The case you are about to hear is a good example of the struggle which sometimes takes place at the 20th century frontier. Tonight's FBI file opens on a riverfront wharf near a recently discovered oil field. Two men are loading heavy crates onto a motor launch tied against the dock piling. In the shadows of a nearby warehouse, a third man silently watches them. That's the last one, Eddie. Okay, get ready to shove off. Hold up a minute, boys. Hmm? I want to talk to you. It's a cop. Yeah, I'll try to stop. What's the trouble? You own this launch? Sure. What about these crates you're moving? They belong to Brad Waterbury. We've been hired to move them. I'd like to see your bill of lading. Now, look, we can't sit here all night, John. This is a rush job. Just come up here and show me your bill of lading, then you can get underway. Okay, okay. Nothing but red tape every time a man turns around. Well, there have been several burglaries along the riverfront lately. I'm just... Stay where you are. Don't try to move that boat. Doesn't up. look like there's much you can do about it, mister. Well, maybe there's something I can do about you. Where's that bill of lading? You know, I just remembered. I left it on the launch. All right. You're under arrest. Well, what do you know? Come in. You wanted to see me, Chief? Oh, yes. Alderman Hendricks, this is Officer Wilton. How do you do, officer? How do you do, sir? Sit down, Jeff. Thanks. I'm sorry I haven't met you before, Wilton, but I've only been in Riverdale a short time. And what with running for election and organizing the new city government, well, you understand how it is. Yes, sir. Now, my boy, let's get right down to it. As you know, one of the reasons I accepted public office was because I felt we had to have some real law and order here. And that wasn't just campaign talk, I meant it. A boom town like this can get out of hand if somebody doesn't watch it right from the beginning. Well, I'd say Riverdale has already gotten out of hand, Mr. Hendricks. Oh, I know, but that doesn't give us any excuse to go overboard. Overboard? I'm talking about that man you arrested on the dock the other night. Eddie Williams? Yes, I believe that's his name. You should have used a little more discretion. Well, he's one of those wharf thieves who've been operating here for the last few months. I'm positive of it, sir. Well, I'm just as anxious to see those robberies stopped as you are, but Williams is employed by the River Freight Company. He was engaged in a legitimate shipping operation when you arrested him. Well, those crates contain stolen drilling equipment. Brad Waterbury identified them as his property, swore out a complaint. Did you have? Yes, Chief. Waterbury came in to see me this morning. He says he was mistaken. I'm going to have to turn Williams loose. And that means he could bring suit for false arrest? I'll have a talk with him. I hope I can persuade him to forget it, but you see how serious this could have been, Wilton. Yes, sir. Yes. 
Well, I've got to be going. I'm making a speech at the luncheon club. Nice to have met you, Wilton. So long, Chief. Well, there it is, Chief. I don't want your badge, Jeff. Put it back on. Do you believe I was wrong about that Williams guy? I don't know what to believe anymore. But I need you on the force. I've got eight men, eight cops in a city of 20,000. You were a cop before the oil strike. You know what's happened here. Sure. The whole town's gone rotten. It's wide open. Gambling in half the bars, eight or ten robberies a week. Every cheap hoodlum in the state has moved in on us. That's why you can't quit me now. What good am I to you? Or the other cops either. Every time we, we make an arrest, somebody puts up bail and the suspect skips town. Or if he should come to trial, he has a tight alibi and our witnesses get forgetful, like Brad Waterbury. I know it looks pretty hopeless, but sooner or later, we'll get things back to normal. How? Somebody's giving these crooks protection, fixing it so we can't lay a finger on them. Even our fancy new alderman seems to take orders. Hendricks just happened to be here when Waterbury came in to see me. Yeah. Quite a coincidence. Stick it out a little bit longer, Jeff. We'll get a break. We'll find out who's behind all this. Okay. You know I can't quit, Chief. I don't know how to do anything else except be a cop. But I'll tell you one thing. Hmm? I'm going to have a little talk with Brad Waterbury anyway. I made a mistake, that's all, Jeff. Anybody can make a mistake. You were pretty positive about those crates the other day, Brad. Well, they did look like my stuff, but well, one piece of drilling equipment isn't much different from another. I should have made certain before I opened my mouth. Then those weren't your tools, is that it? That's it, Jeff. Who convinced you? I don't know what you mean. You reported a couple of burglaries before this one. Now, what if I did? Listen, Brad, if somebody's been putting pressure on you, tell me who it is. Hey! Move those crates over there, fellas. All right. Jeff, why don't you take it easy? Look, I've lived here in Riverdale for over 20 years. Never made more than enough to keep my head above water. Now I'm making real money, selling everything I can get in stock. I like things the way they are. You like being robbed? I said I wasn't robbed. Not this time. But even if I was, what's a couple of crates of machinery, more or less? There's lots of other machinery, lots of customers waiting to buy it. I got no complaints. For the first time in my life, this town's doing me a good turn. Eight days later, at a nearby FBI field office, Officer Wilton is talking with Supervisor Dennis Logan and Special Agent Jim Taylor. That's the situation as I see it, Mr. Logan. I'm not sure who's behind these rackets in Riverdale, but somebody's getting a lot of protection. From what you tell me, Chief Douglas isn't involved. No, sir. I'd stake my life on the chief. He hates what's been going on as much as I do, but his hands are tied. We've always found that the vast majority of police officials are honest and efficient. How much do you know about this Alderman Hendricks? Not much. Came to Riverdale right after the first gusher was brought in. Made a lot of friends, got himself elected to office. Uh, Wilton, I wish we could help you. We've been getting reports on Riverdale for the last six months. But whoever is running things there has been smart enough to avoid federal law violations. I think I may have found an FBI angle. At least I hope so. Oh, no, what is it? Well, I've been spending my off-duty hours watching Eddie Williams since he was released from jail. He and an ex-convict named Steve Burgess are running a small river freight business. Could be a front for moving stolen property. That's what I figured, too. Well, anyway, I've seen them load stuff into boats and head down river. And they don't come back till the next day. And the state line's only a few miles downstream, is that what you're driving at? Yes, sir. you have any evidence that they carried stolen goods over the state line? Well, no, sir, not real evidence. Mm -hmm. This isn't enough to bring you into the case? No, I'm afraid not. We have to be certain that the matter's within our jurisdiction. I guess I was a little too anxious... Well, you were absolutely right in telling us what you found out, but until there's a definite federal violation... Yes, well... Well, maybe if I dog Williams a little harder, he'll get nervous and make a slip. 
I figure whoever has been protecting him is behind all the other rackets in Riverdale. Mm -hmm. Frequently works out that way. But don't take too many chances. Don't worry about me. Thanks for listening, Mr. Logan. Mr. Taylor. Alderman Hendricks speaking. This is Steve Burgess, Mr. Hendricks. I've got a little business problem I'd like to talk over if you've got a minute. Well, what is it? That fellow you had a little conversation with last Monday. The one who paid us a visit at the wharf. What about him? He's still devoting a lot of time to the neighborhood. Is he finding out any of our business procedures? I'm not sure. But by the way he keeps glued to us, he could. That mustn't happen, Burgess. What do you suggest? Can't you handle a little detail like this without coming to me... You say the person in question spends his evenings on the wharf? That's right. Well? Okay, Mr. Hendricks. I just wanted to get your business, business opinion before I did anything. We'll handle it. Is he still following us? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, here he comes. Anybody else on the pier? No, I don't see anybody. Okay, I'll I'll hide in this doorway. You lead him on until he comes up even with me. All right. Something I can do for you, officer? No. Well, I just like to come down by the river and sort of wander around. Do you have any objections? Why should I object? <laughs> You got him cold, Steve. Help me put him in the boat. He says he likes the river. Let's find out how well he likes it. We will return in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Fear about home ownership was a worry that hung over the head of Mr. Elliot Granger until he became a member of the Equitable Society. Wasn't it, Mr. Granger? Yes, it was. Until I heard you describe a plan that seemed to me to be just what the doctor ordered. And that's the Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan, the AHO plan. Yes. It seemed to be a plan that's tailor-made for people like me. And what did you do? Well, I took your advice and called my local Equitable representative. He explained how the AHO plan would help my wife own it free and clear without any more payments if something happened to me. In other words, it's a low-cost first mortgage plus life insurance protection, all covered by a single payment once a month. Now when my friends talk about buying or building, I tell them to look up my friend, the equitable man. Yes, your equitable man is a good man to know and a good man to do business with. He's a specialist, experienced in all kinds of life insurance. So... Whatever your insurance problem, if you want to own your own home free and clear years before you hoped, if you want to assure a college education for your youngsters, if you want to enjoy a carefree, independent life after 60, if you need financial protection for your wife and children, pick up your telephone. Talk it over with a friendly, helpful neighbor. Your equitable society man. There's no obligation. Consult your local telephone directory for the name of your local equitable representative. He listed in the yellow pages under equitable. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, Wide Open City. In numerous communities, law enforcement agencies are hopelessly understaffed. The case you are hearing clearly shows the demoralizing results of such a situation. But even in old and well-established cities and towns, police forces are sometimes not large enough to meet minimum requirements. There is no money saved by ineffective law enforcement. The price of crime is many times higher than the cost of the most effective police force. And you always pay the bill. Real crime prevention is the greatest economy any community can undertake. 
So don't wait until an outbreak of lawlessness or racketeering causes you to insist on greater protection. Insist on it now. All law enforcement agencies are working for you. See to it that they have the staff to do their job. Tonight's FBI file continues the next morning at the nearby FBI field office. Supervisor Logan is sitting at his desk when Special Agent Taylor enters. You wanted to see me, Mr. Logan? Oh, Jim. You're driving over to Riverdale this morning, aren't you? That's right, sir. I've got a tip. Some slot machines have been shipped in from back east. I'm going to try and run them down. Well, I may have to switch on to something else, at least temporarily. Oh? Just had a call from Chief Douglas. Officer Wilton has disappeared. He didn't come home last night. What? So far, we don't know what's happened to him, and until we do, we can't move in. But check with the chief anyway. Sure. Maybe Wilton just ran into something suspicious. Stayed on the job. Yeah. Well, keep in touch, Taylor. Gentlemen, I'm not going to waste my time telling you what a mess you've made of things. What's wrong, Mr. Hendricks? Wilton, that's what's wrong. You gave me the okay. I didn't think you'd be foolish enough to take him across the state line. What difference does it make where we bumped him off? He isn't dead. What? We put a couple of slugs in him and dumped him overboard. I tell you, he's still alive. They just found his body. He managed to get ashore. If he recovers consciousness, you're through. Fine. Oh, I can handle a small town hick like Chief Douglas, but I can't handle the FBI in a kidnapping case. What should we do? Get out of town as fast as you can. Take the launch. Go down to Harbor City. They'll find us there, same as they would here. Not if you can keep out of sight for a couple of days. The Rio Paula is due to dock on Friday. Yeah, that's right. If you had any brains, you'd have thought of that yourselves. Well, go on, go on, get moving. Calling Dr. Chanchamino. Dr. Chanchamino, report to the front office, please. Pardon me. Pardon me, I'm looking for Officer Wilton's room. Oh, he's still in surgery, sir. Oh? Well, is uh, Chief Douglas around then? They told me he was here. Yes, sir. He's in the waiting room, just around the corner there. Oh, thanks very much. Chief Douglas? Yes? My name is Taylor, FBI. How do you do? You've heard about Wilton, Mr. Taylor. Yes, sir. Your office informed me. I reported the details to our agent in charge. He assigned me to the case. Good. Tell me, how is he? It's a miracle he's alive at all. Well, he's not able to talk. The doctor says it may be hours, days. He doesn't know when. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, I'm afraid there's not much we can do. Well, he came to see us a couple of weeks ago about a man named Eddie Williams. He said he'd been following Williams and a friend of his trying to get some evidence on him. I, uh, I don't know whether he told you this or not. He didn't have to. I knew Wilton well enough to be pretty sure that he wasn't going to drop a lead just because somebody put a little pressure on him. Mm -hmm. Well, then maybe we ought to start with Williams. Sounds like he's our best bet so far. I already sent a man down to the freight office to bring him in for questioning. No. He and his partner have left town. Their boat's gone and there's no sign of them. I see. I put out an alarm, but I don't think it'll do much good. Mm -hmm. What was the uh, official name of their organization again? River Freight Company Incorporated. Well, thanks, Chief. I'll check with you later. Mr. Taylor, Mr. Logan. What's up, Jim? You remember Wilton telling us that Williams and his friend ran a freight service? Yeah. Well, I've been out of the bank going over the company accounts. Find out anything? Yeah, a couple of things. In the first place, the outfit doesn't show any income, just outgo. Oh. Yeah, it runs in the red about, oh, $1,500 a month. Sounds like somebody's doing some fancy bookkeeping. Mm hmm How do they keep making up the deficit? Mm -hmm. The company treasurer deposits a personal check about once a month. Treasurer? Yes, sir. Alderman Hendricks. I thought I might have a talk with the alderman before I come back to the office tonight. Well, use your own judgment. I'll be working late tonight myself. We want to get together. All right, right, sir. I'll bring the records and any information I can dig up. Won't you sit down, Mr. Taylor? Thank you. I'm frank to admit I don't know why an FBI agent would want to talk to me... But if there's anything I can do for well, you... I'm working on the Wilton case. Oh, a great tragedy, Mr. Taylor, but I suppose it's the price that has to be paid for law and order. Mr. Hendricks, do you know a man named Eddie Williams? Why, yes. As a matter of fact, I do. Oh, you don't think he's involved in this vicious attack on Wilton, do you? 
Is there any reason why I should? No, of course not. At least no reason I know of. Was Williams a friend of yours? Certainly not an intimate friend. Oh, I think I know what you're driving at, Mr. Taylor. I imagine someone has told you that I interceded for Mr. Williams when he had a little difficulty with Officer Wilton a couple of weeks ago. But I'm a politician, and politicians do have obligations to their constituents. Do you know where Williams is now? At his place of business, I imagine. The freight office is closed. Williams and his partner have apparently left town. That's odd. Well, perhaps they're delivering a shipment somewhere. I'm sure they'll be back in a day or two. If they were planning to be gone for any length of time, they would have notified me. Oh? Yes. You see, I own an interest in a little concern. It isn't common knowledge, but I suppose you'd find out sooner or later anyway. Probably. It's just one of my numerous investments in Riverdale. A town as new as this needs capital. I've tried to supply my share. I see. Is your uh, investment in the freight business profitable? Well, to be very honest, I haven't paid much attention. I suppose in the long run I make a few dollars, but in time I anticipate a very healthy profit. This city is growing, Mr. Taylor, by leaps and bounds. Well, thank you, Mr. Hendricks. I guess that's all for now. <laughs> And these are the monthly bank statements, Mr. Logan. Mm-hmm. Well, here's the canceled checks. Oh, yes, and these are Hendricks' bank statements. That's quite an account, huh? Uh, he also has a safety deposit box. I imagine it's bulging, too. Now, I've consolidated the company checks for the last six months on this ledger. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Except for local office expenses. Sorry to Williams and Burgess, the main items are payment for diesel oil to the Harbor City Fuel Company. Looks like they've been buying oil about three times a month. Yes, sir, yeah. Amount would have supplied fuel for an equal number of trips between Riverdale and Harbor City. Then we can be pretty sure that's where they've been getting rid of the stolen machinery. Well, I've called the Harbor City police and our field office there. They'll keep a lookout for Williams and Burgess. Good. They have any leads on stolen machine tools? No, sir, not a one. Suppose the tools have been shipped outside this country. They'd bring a bigger price somewhere else. That's right, sir, they would. Let's get over to the library. We have copies of the Harbor City Times. We can check ship movement reports. Here we are. When was the oil purchase last month? Well, the checks are dated the uh, 7th, mm-hmm. 19th, and the 30th. Oh, sorry. Let's see. In the week of the 7th. SSTL Jackman sailing for Hawaii. The Rio Paula for Central America. The Bessiel for Argentina. And the Phillips and Queen for Antwerp. 19th, you said? That's right, sir. And none of the same ships seem to be in port. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Hmm? The Rio Paula. And the Rio Paula sailed again on the 31st. There's a shortage of machine tools in Central America right now and an oil strike. Mm-hmm. They'd need the same kind of equipment that's being used in Riverdale. Where's the last issue of the Harbor City Times? Oh, uh, here you go, sir. Thanks. And the Rio Paul is in port now, due to sail tomorrow morning. Chief Douglas, this officer said you wanted to see me, that he was supposed to bring me in. That's right, Mr. Henry. If you have something you want to talk about, why don't you telephone me? I'm not accustomed to being treated like some kind of a criminal. Won't you sit down, Mr. Hendricks? Well, I might have expected some kind of nonsense from the chief, but I always heard the FBI was careful and efficient. We try to be. Now, if you don't mind answering a few questions... See here, both of you. I don't know what this is about, but let me remind you, Chief, that I'm a person of some influence in this town, and if I were you, I'd start planning on being retired in the very near future. There may be some changes in the city administration, Hendricks, but I don't think the Chief will be bothered. What are you talking about? There are two friends of yours in the next room making a statement. Friends of mine? Williams and Burgess. They were arrested last night aboard the Rio Paula. Oh. And the captain of the ship's been doing some talking, too. No, I, I wouldn't plan on running for re-election, Mr. Hendricks. You won't be able to do much campaigning. Eddie 
Kennedy and Steve were tried in federal court and found guilty of violations of the federal kidnapping statute. Each received a life sentence in a federal penitentiary. Hendricks was also convicted in federal court and was sentenced to a term of 20 years in a federal penitentiary. Tonight's case, based on the activities of a corrupt public official, shows how an entire community may sometimes fall under the control of a criminal in disguise. Fortunately, this is a rare occurrence. FBI files and investigations show that the vast majority of office holders, both elected and appointed, are honest, efficient, and loyal. They are men who devote their lives to the service of their fellow men. But the few exceptions to this rule are all the more despicable because they are a challenge to democratic government. Many people have the mistaken idea that in government there will always be graft and corruption. This is not true and need never be true. Exercise your privilege to vote. Vote wisely and then maintain a continuing interest in the public servants you have elected. Elections are held at infrequent intervals, but men hold office 365 days a year. If one of them should prove derelict in his duty, it's up to you to do something about it. If your dream is owning your own home, get acquainted with your local equitable representative. Ask him about the equitable assured home ownership plan. Now, He's a neighbor you can trust. Perhaps you're interested in independence in your 60s, or education for your children, or future financial security for your family. Well, just consult your local telephone directory for the name of your local equitable representative. You'll find it listed in the yellow pages under Equitable, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. <laughs> Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Its subject, Flight to Avoid Prosecution. Its title, The Swamp Killer. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of places or persons, living or dead, is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Burt. Your narrator was William Woodson. And Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Herb Butterfield, Tony Caruso, Eddie Firestone, Lou Merrill, Steve Pendleton, Barney Phillips, and Warren Stevens. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time.